those things come to uh, come to fruition. Um, so Shadi, I'm gonna I'm gonna hype you up right here. So um, Shadi got his uh, PhD from Georgetown in neuroscience. Um, and actually, I'm also a neuroimmunologist, Shadi. So we should we should talk science one of these days. But uh, he's he's also and and when I joined the decentralized science space about two years ago, um, he he was the founder of a project called Opsci, which is a nonprofit uh, to develop web native open science tools. Uh, but uh, more recently, and I think uh, what's really exciting is uh, he's co-founded a company called Holonym. Uh, and Holonym is a zero knowledge identity solution, uh, and it's it's gaining a lot of traction. People who are involved in Gitcoin will see that um, it's actually one of the Gitcoin stamps for the Gitcoin passport. And uh, I think announced just the other day was um, some uh, integration with uh, the L1 Phantom, uh, which is which is really exciting, Shadi. Um, and so uh, yeah, so Shadi, as the crypto people would say, um, is a gigabrain um in the space and and we're really lucky to have him as one of the core individuals that's pushing forward this space while trying to maintain the ethos um, that comes behind uh decentralization and web3 so shadi it's a real pleasure of ours to have you here to kickstart the event and uh yeah we're really excited to hear what you're up to with holonym uh decentralized identities zero knowledge proofs and all of that so take it away Incredible. Uh, before I get into it, and thank you so much for, for the really kind introduction. Uh, it's, you're, you're too, too kind. Uh, but before I take it away, can you please grant me share screen privileges? Yes. Ricardo, would you be able to do that? Yes. Give me a second. And um, yeah, well, while that's, yep, I see now. Okay, cool. All right, well, I get set up over here. Yeah, it, it's great to be to be back. Um, it's incredible to see all of the traction uh, you guys have had at Research Hub and beyond just within the overall wider DSI space. Uh, it's clear that we're onto something that isn't just another, you know, uh, throw away throw away hype cycle but rather there is a very simple and demonstrable pain point within the global culture of science that has been migrating over to digital science tools with really the advent of the momentum of the open science movement in the early 2000s so you know we can be doing science better and what is this ultimate vision that is starting to to, to formulate to coalesce around the different efforts that people are, are pushing forward, everything from open, open source publishing to online communities for crowdsourcing data, um, peer reviews, incentive mechanism design, uh, better ways to capture IP and return the value that it creates back to the creators, uh, better ways to think about uh, digital science overall. So, so today I want to talk a little bit about kind of this concept of, first off, I want to frame the conversation with why are we here? Because I think it's really important to just take a step back as frequently as possible while we're at this really early stage and remind each other and ourselves uh, why we, we are here and to constantly iteratively update that as we, as, as we both differentiate into different arms that are very much needed and required to, to push our, our mission forward of uh, global decentralized scientific practice, uh, but also to uh, really be able to uh, uh, eloquently put together a narrative that appeals not just to our niche bubble, but to others that we want to loop in and have uh, participate in the upside or the benefits of, of this technology. So, you know, what are we really playing for, right? This, this kind of idea of this infinite science machine, right? We're running these, uh, a lot of Decentralized science projects will say that Ethereum or blockchains are really important for their application or vision for science. But I think the vision here that I've heard, at least from the past couple of years of interviews, talking with scientists both in and outside of the movement as uh, properly defined. And what we're what I what I keep hearing time and time again is that 
we want to move towards a future of science that's open source, that's participatory, that's permissive, that allows for a pluralism of different ideas and thoughts and models to compete against each other and be able to push forward the kind of impact we want to see throughout the world. Uh, and a big part of that is decentralized web technology. And I'll get into a little bit about why that decentralization is important, uh, is a very important prefix for, for web technology and general to empower the next generation of scientific tooling um, and, and coordination. So one question I like to try to bring up uh, over and over again is what does success really look like for DSI, right? So if we go out and look at the world today and see examples of successful movements or technological trends. We can look, we can put dollar signs behind things. We can take a look and say, hey, look at this. The content create the total digital content creator market capitalization is a hundred billion dollars. Right. So these are people from all over the world that are posting uh, pictures about cats, about travel blogs, about uh, do-it-yourself videos. And the structure of the internet has allowed people to uh, actually be able to generate some, maybe even potentially living income from just creating content, right? If we compare that, for example, against the content that comes strictly from top tier scientific production outlets, like let's say Harvard, uh, Harvard Research, which, which is at the top of global lists, depending on how you look at it, still remains at the top. Uh, you have about 100x, which is kind of an interesting comparison, 100x, uh, um, difference there between how much funding is being, is being driven into these ecosystems. And again, this is per annum. So the comparison isn't direct, but it, it is kind of important to take a look at how money flows through our economy in different ways. And what does our future look like if some of that was diverted in other ways? And if we just take a moment of modesty to look at where DSI has, has come so far, relatively speaking, you know, we're still very nascent with less than $50 million total, um, unless I'm missing any <laughs> big ones out there, uh, raised by venture capitalists to fund innovative uh, and, and very compelling visions for a DSI future. And if we go one step down, right, uh, looking at more community-driven efforts through Gitcoin grants, which rely on community votes and uh, more decentralized processes for identifying projects that will have meaningful impact as ethereally defined, no pun intended, by the community, uh, we're looking at even smaller, tiny, 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 tiny drop in the bucket. There are other ways to look at success as well for DSI, right? It's not just dollar signs. We could also take a look at uh, artifacts produced. So again, comparing against the billions and billions of daily videos, posts, and articles about cats, about uh, <laughs> the best travel itinerary. Um, there's about 3,516 3, artifacts produced by Harvard researchers every year. And that puts them very, very close at the top of the list, just under uh, the Chinese uh, National University, which produces about four to five times more artifacts per year in uh, chemistry and physical sciences, whereas Harvard is really well known for health sciences and biology. And comparing DSI against that, you know, I think the most productive elements for our movement uh, we have a couple IP NFTs, a couple patient data DAOs, a handful of publications here and there, but the movement is still pretty nascent. Um, I think that's, you know, the impact is difficult to measure throughout DSI. Uh, in accumulation, there's a total, cumulatively, there's a total of about 100 DSI Gitcoin grants that have ever uh, been, been, been uh, applied for funding or been submitted to a Gitcoin grants round. And these cover a very wide area of everything from cat longevity to computational neuroscience models of uh, uh, cognition and uh, inference to marine biological preservation attempts. So it's early, the, the net is wide. It's been cast very, very wide. And I think we have a long ways to go where these billions of daily videos, posts and articles DSI captures some portion of the total output of the internet, of the content, of the information, to, to ground it and root it into basic observations about the universe, the world, the role of humanity in that, in, in that world, and, and the ability to move uh, our society forward. So, you know, this is just a few ways to think about success for, for DSI, right? Like, we could even put out examples and say, hey, like, the more people that are able to access data, the more people that are able to engage with scientific artifacts, that's success, 
right? And maybe that, that's what resonates with you. Um, you could also say, hey, well, if we could elevate the average information channel between any two people or any two uh, agents to include more complexity, more richness, more uh, computationally verifiable references to real data, to real um, um, to real to, to, to real information that's been generated through a scientific process, right? Where we're communicating with each other about verifiable information or verifiable knowledge about the world. Uh, others might say, hey, you know, we just need to look at the metrics. You know, what's the total productivity output? Uh, as long as is the average lifespan expectancy going up or cancer rates going down? Um, and then others might say, hey, look, we just need to look at the size and the extent of the total knowledge we've put out there, whatever that means. These are all these are all great ways to paint a vision, uh, but I think when it comes to putting rubber to the road, uh, it becomes very difficult to truly characterize these things. Now, bringing me back to, or bringing us rather back to uh, this idea of an infinite science machine, right? So one of the great benefits of decentralization and utilizing a public blockchain like Ethereum is that once you deploy a smart contract on this distributed network, you can't take it back, right? It's an act of almost birthing some sort of cybernetic life. And today, as we sit here and ask ourselves, why are we here? What does success look like for us? We have a, we have, we have a series of decisions that are laid out before us. And each decision that we make will take us between one of two paths, which I believe only one will actually materialize if we actually get to where we're going. One is a non-consensual consensual human con computer interaction future where there's one protocol out there that doesn't support a plurality of different perspectives or views, but a single protocol that tells us what the public good really is and enforces uh, our, ac our actions and uh, prompts us with instructions to participate in this pretty monolithic, dogmatic type of uh, world. Uh, the other path, I believe, is more humanistic and involves uh, a protocol that acts as a public service to humans, where agency is siloed within the individuals, the participants in the ecosystem. And there's a clear distinction between an autonomous process and an agent that's interacting with their own free will. So how do we co-opt this human-centric path? I think really key to this is uh, voluntary cooperation in these decentralized systems. So Ethereum comes out as a really great framework or platform, both for one dogmatic, uh, salute, uh, one do dogmatic, uh, let's say like end state to occur, but also for the ability to folks to cooperate around any group directed goal behavior with an embedded consent, where you can point to consent, revoke consent, be able to opt in or out of different systems where it's the norm to fork if a, if a particular protocol isn't working for you or isn't serving the interests of your community. There are tons of weaknesses with uh, these public blockchain systems, and one of them is the privacy conundrum, right? So you could imagine you might have an organization of patients that have elected to use Ethereum as their de facto method for organizing and coordinating their behavior, uh, such as contributing data, uh, participating in paid experiments, or uh, voting on who gets to access that corpus of data or not. The problem with this is on Ethereum as it is, or any uh, smart contract compatible platform, is a smart contract that's executable, say for a vote of uh, which data we should use or not, will have these agents that can participate almost blindly within these votes. And it's very difficult to know if these agents are real people or real patients, or if they are uh, perhaps bots or maybe they're the same person who's bribed other folks to vote uh, in the same way. So it's very difficult to, to detect collusion. It's really common for simple attacks or bot attacks to overwhelm governance in these types of systems. And privacy is either black or white, right? So you can either enforce a KYC process where everybody that's participating in this voting has to reveal themselves on chain, uh, but in effect, their identity is gonna be completely revealed for all time that those nodes are storing that past history of the blockchain and all the votes that have occurred before it. So it's a big problem. Reputation systems have been proposed as a key solution to this, but reputation is really, really hard. It's very difficult to verify behavior off chain, such as whether you've completed a clinical trial or whether you know it really is you with 
that's getting that's paying uh, getting paid for for the data that you're providing and not to somebody else that's perhaps has stolen your identity and is receiving your payments for data that you're that you provided. Uh, consent is very difficult to maintain uh, in these systems. So one major effort that our team has been focused on over the past year and a half now is building a solution to on-chain privacy. And what we've come to is an architecture that's not new, it's quite old. We think of it as a tornado cache of identities. It's a mixer where once you verify some fact about yourself on-chain, you can wrap it in a cryptographic uh, wrapper and put that on chain mixed with other identities such that it becomes incredibly computationally intractable to brute force or identify a particular person on chain as that same person who holds a passport or uh, a DMV issued driver's license. So the way that we think about it is that any user can um, interact with any third party issuer receive their signed cryptographic credential. And then once they're on chain, they're completely private and can produce true false statements about their identity, such as that they are a person and not a bot, that they've consented to a particular research process, that they have or haven't voted, that they're from a particular jurisdiction and so on. One of the major challenges, okay, great. We have a solution <laughs> for on-chain privacy, but there's still a major, major problem here. Okay, great. You're private on-chain, which means that once you've gated your application to an individual that has proven certain things, you kind of lose the ability to hold them accountable after that point because you don't know who they are in these systems. They could use different accounts and transfer proofs to those accounts as they renew their credentials. A really key solution to drive zero knowledge proofs for this sort of application is the importance of compliant backups for transparent accountability. What does this mean? Here we're thinking about privacy as a right, such as once you join a particular DAO or engage in commerce in, in a decentralized commerce with say a DAO or a DeFi organization, you're effectively, you would be effectively prompted with consent. And you would say, I consent to these rules. I consent not to behave in, in this way. I consent not to rug pull or uh, perform advers or adversarially or break any laws. Uh, that are part of me behaving in this organization. And what we've done is built a compliance module that codifies the consent of specific rules such that a user will be able to verifiably encrypt identifying information to a multi-party compute decentralized data store. And as long as they abide by the very rules, a smart contract will only gate access to their identifying information if they can verifiably be proven to have broken one of those rules. So here, privacy is a privilege, not a right. And you lose that privilege if you break the rules that you've consented to. It's a compromise, it's not perfect, but it helps us start thinking about systems where we can begin to have accountability with transparency and consent into these systems. And I think systems like this are gonna be very key. What's important is always considering where the role of, looking at time here, where the role of the individual is and the consent and where the third party, what are these rules that you're consenting into? I think those are gonna be the real devils in the details as, as we move towards uh, uh, decentralized permissionless layers with accountability embedded within them. This architecture can be flipped on its head. And this is the second problem that we've been focusing on this year to not only silo away identifying information for protocols that wanna make sure that all of their members don't defect or begin behaving adversarially once they've inherited privacy. Um, you can also use this to store uh, your own cryptographic keys in a decentralized network where you can only gain access to those keys if you're able to present a proof of selfhood with associated consent. Uh, this means now we can have truly non-custodial keys that belong to the user and are, and are tied to that user's identity. It's a very complex problem and I need a whole another 20 minutes to talk more details about this. But here we're effectively targeting the ability to prove, uh, to perform abstractions about who you are, identity proofs, to form identities that are portable, that can be avatars, associated with particular behavior in particular DAOs or particular organizations we could do this permissionlessly. And the last key missing ingredient is agency and self-sovereignty over keys to always be able to guarantee consent into these types of organizations or decentralized contract agreements. So 
definitely reach out to me if you want to learn more about how this all works. But where we really want to go, and I kind of already hinted at this, is for these decentralized science systems to accomplish the goals that they would like to with this pluralistic future in mind, where agency is one of the incompromisable or uncompromisable uh, attributes of any DSI system is we need private and self-sovereign identity. We need to have cryptographic tools that your grandma could use, that anybody could use, especially those who are participating in a clinical trial. And underlying all of this is going to be trust, uh, especially if we seek to deliver a solution to mainstream entrenched institutions, and that's tools for transparency and accountability. Um, I think I'm right at time here, so I'm just going to wrap it right up. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, the organizers for, for inviting me again today and uh, more than happy to take any questions if there's time. Yeah, actually, Shadi, there's a, we've got about 10 minutes left here, um, but yeah, we can have a little discussion. Um, so anyone who's in the audience, please like submit uh, questions into the Q&A um, and then we'll read them out loud over here. But uh, uh, yeah, I'll definitely, I can kickstart it and then I think Ricardo will hop in right after. Um, I wanted to, um, oh, by the way, great presentation, Shadi. Thank you for, um, especially the beginning where um, we're trying to help preserve a lot of the ethos that comes with, um, you know, decentralization and and keep keep that maintained. Let me switch my camera on and keep that maintained throughout DSI. Um, I had one question, and I think it became like, um, I guess, more publicly contentious um, after the whole uh, WorldCoin um, launched, which is like, what exactly are the drawbacks and the pros and cons of various types of ways of determining personhood? So, um, you know, things like uh, doing the biometric scanning um, and then also what goes in, maybe not goes into that, but a little bit tangential is um, what, um, and actually, well, I'll, ju I'll just leave it at that for now. Yeah, I might have lost the last bit of your question because of uh, my internet connection is a little unstable right now. But I'm assuming it's a question about WorldCoin and the controversy around proof of personhood. Is that right? Uh, yeah, proof of personhood and just like what what the best um, and, and the drawbacks of various mechanisms of doing that. So, like for example, at Research Hub, we have um, you know obviously people who come in uh, who are either bots or are um, trying to behave nefariously um, on the platform. And so what are like the best ways of identifying personhood um, in a civil, make sure to maintain civil resistance um, that's actually feasible to do and maybe a little UI UX friendly. And you're muted in case you're talking. Hey, sorry guys, just uh, having a bit of an issue with connection with uh, internet connection here. We can hear you. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I'll, I, I think I caught most of that. So yeah, so it's really interesting. If you go back to these discussions around identity, uh, specifically biometrics versus government identity versus more lighter forms, I think oh, since the early 2000s, there's been a push towards stronger and stronger forms of digital identity. Some of it was really pushed forward by the PCIIE, which is um, basically a, a regulation that, that was put into place for to combat anti-money laundering. It was first introduced uh, actually in the early 70s uh, under the Nixon administration to make it easier for consumers to request like uh, refunds on, on like unauthorized transfers and to basically have more control over over how transactions are performed more in the favor of, of the consumer so once the internet kind of came about governments had a really difficult time enforcing uh geopolitical i guess you know policy and none of this was like i think you know the hardest really i think some of the like companies like paypal right ebay uh, and eventually Google found themselves in this kind of quagmire where they were holding a ton of government data and they were starting to receive tons of audits. So are you guys still with me? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I'm just keep losing here. 
Um, but yeah, so you might recall actually, um, uh, like late two thousands when government rolled out, or I'm sorry, Google rolled out this really controversial eye tracking technology to, uh, basically, uh, be a better version of CAPTCHA in the early days of the web where bots were a huge, huge problem before you had serverless architecture um, and other more now mainstream ways of preventing bots. And the backlash to that was insane, right? So Google quickly uh, spun down that program, never mentioned it again. And it's quite a bit of a shame because uh, eyes actually have quite a bit of data that's associated with them and could have been used for many public health uh, you know, research or projects. Uh, but, you know, at the time, I think like nobody really trusted that Google who was complying with all of these audits or um, these, uh, what you call them, those warrants for, for data at the time. And this was pre GDPR. So consumers didn't really have any form of protection to point to. Uh, I guess this is all a really long winded way of saying that it's really fascinating now that eyes are now back in the equation. And it's a company like OpenAI, which is really pushing this forward because they know that this is one of the few ways to really achieve proof of personhood uh, in a relatively robust manner. It's not perfect, right? Your eyes do change over time. It doesn't include people with macular degeneration or eye injuries, et cetera. Uh, my main gripe with eye scanning is that the hash of your eye is not something you can take back. So WorldCoin, uh, knows this, and they implement something called uh, a session ID. So actually what you do when you get your uh, eye scan is you also create a session on your on your mobile phone when you perform the process, and that's appended uh, with some salt, uh, basically like a cryptographic way to prevent like a uh, um, to, to prevent somebody from just brute forcing the hash. They uh, add that to they add the session ID, append it with some salt. And this way, what they store on chain is not a direct link to the hash of your eye. However, you still have to trust that the hardware and the centralized registry that matches the salt, the session ID with the hash of the eye is somewhere safe and secure and that they'll never give it up. So that's that's difficult. I think that's like really difficult to accept. Uh, one of the strongest, I, I think, you know, I believe government ideas are, bet are better for this purpose because even though a government might revoke your ID, um, you can always change your ID, right? The hash that's generated from your government ID isn't fixed to you as an entity, as a person. So you can go to another country and get another document and you can have more flexibility in this way. Yeah, I guess all that to say, there's trade-offs even with some of these tools like that uh, in crypto and DeSci, we are offering a solutions and they're like incremental or stepwise improvements, really big improvements, but there's always going to be some trade-offs or like, um, I guess nothing is, is completely foolproof. Um, but yeah, Ricardo, I know we have some questions in the Q&A, but I don't know if you wanted to go next. Yeah, I, I'll just take one from the Q&A uh, just for the sake of time. So Michael asks, uh, does Holonime have plans to work with ERA commons like ID? I'm sold on the theory, but where are we logistically to actually onboard higher education researchers and administrators? Yeah, I think, so actually Hanum started off as a project to verify org IDs last year at ETH Amsterdam, we launched a, a prototype that allowed you to sign in to Ethereum with your org ID. So this means basically an Ethereum wallet or an address or access to some dApp would be gated by whether you had an org ID or not. So this was great because it proved that a particular Ethereum address owned a specific work ID, though there was tons of weaknesses with, with, with that particular solution. So uh, the first was you couldn't really guarantee that the person that controlled that work ID was that person and hadn't you know, falsified records unless you're using some sort of institutional um, SSO in conjunction with that. Uh, the second is that the work ID and the email address were all put publicly on chain. And that, that's a huge no-no. Uh, 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 because it, it enables all sorts of foul play and, and different types of phishing attacks. We would love to continue research along this road using ZK proofs on JWTs, which currently the only implementation that I've seen, uh, aside from what we've put in our white paper, is ZK login by SWE blockchain. But they use a, a centralized uh, ZK because the proof generation requires a ton of uh, computational power. It can't be done on consumer hardware like... Um, like uh, the current Holonym app allows basically all the ZK computation is done on your computer. 
for taking a, a really complex JWT, uh, a JSON web, web token, such as an ORCID authentication session, uh, that's very difficult to compute. So we'll have to see where the research takes us from here and what we can actually implement. Uh, Laura Hack, who's the founder of ORCID, is one of uh, our advisors. So we're constantly, this is a very hot topic uh, that we throw, throw back, uh, back and forth constantly. So it's something definitely on our radar. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for replying. And uh, I'll take, I know we're just on time. I'll take just like one last question. Um, so can you say more about how the privacy will be a privilege instead of a right in the initial instantiation of your identity protocol? So basically what you just thought, you know, talked about before, uh, saying a bit more about, you know, what is a, what it, why is, a, is that a privilege instead of a right? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so the compliance module is not live. It's uh, the code. The code for it is actually one of the very few things that's private on our on our uh, on our on our repository. Oops. Sorry, guys. Terrible connection today. We can still hear you. Guys you guys can hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, so the code it's it's been written up, and if it's something that you're interested in, please do reach out to us. I think you know the world, the, the, the Web3 world really isn't mature enough to, I think, you know, just release this out into the open. I think, you know, we really want to work closely with folks that are interested in this. So the the common example, the, the most like base level example would, for example, uh, be like a DeFi protocol that wants to ensure uh, FinCEN compliance with popular or mainstream AML laws across jurisdictions. And say, for example, uh, if anyone that in, that joins this permission DeFi pool interacts with a blacklisted address, like say a well-known hacker or san you know state-sanctioned entity, that you would revoke the permissions of that particular address uh, and basically prevent them from participating in the pool. So the way that would work is you would have an off-chain listener uh, that basically is looking for any interactions between uh, addresses or accounts that have consented into the permission protocol and looking to see if it interacts with any high risk or sanctioned uh, addresses. That listener would also be listening on the behalf of a particular auditor, such as say an AML compliance officer, um, by hosting, basically being authorized by the ML compliance officer. Um, and that listener would then request the MPC network once those conditions are, have been met by presenting it with those conditions and saying, hey, 0x123 interacted with this no known North Korean hacker address, 0x551. Uh, we're requesting a decryption of the PII to the public key of this auditor or uh, AML compliance officer. And then that AML compliance officer would review the information and then uh, file a suspicious activity report as they normally do, like whenever you interact with the bank. Um, so that would be the, the the actual applied use case for DeFi. I think there's other use cases for patient data DAOs, um, but I think they're all gonna be really different and a lot of thought needs to be taken into what the access uh, conditions are. All right. Awesome, thank you so much, Shadi. And uh, yeah, we're up to time now. Um, so we're gonna get the uh, next set of speakers uh, onboarded up here. But uh, yeah, I wanna uh, thank you again, Shadi, for your time and uh, for answering all of our questions. I know that civil resistance is a big problem um, across all of- uh, Thank you guys, you know, you're welcome. With crypto, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we'll uh, bring up the next round. Uh, so this is gonna be our first panelist. Um, and this is gonna be um, actually a panel uh, really targeting preprints and uh, peer review. And we have the uh, really the pleasure of having uh, two really great individuals, uh, John Inglis, uh, who is the uh, co-founder of BioArchive, and uh, Ludo, who is uh, Ludo Waltman, who is uh, part of ASAP Bio and also just uh, generally kind of an OG in the open science uh, field. So we'll bring up our, our panelists here and then also some of our hosts, uh, which will be Johnny and uh, Pat. Hey, Pat, I'll make you host so that you can uh, also give this privilege. You can also manage the 
the chat. Okay, great. Yeah, great to see everybody. This has been awesome so far. Thank you, Shadi. This is a great first talk, kicking things off. <clears throat> Jonathan, I, make, I think you might be muted. No. Yeah, perfect. Great. Hi. Nice to see you, everyone. And Ricardo, I believe, I think I see Dr. John Inglis and the, uh, the attendees as well here, too. Yeah, I tried to bring him on board. Yeah. As soon as we have John on board, I will go and give a little introduction um, of our panelists. Okay, just invited him to join us as a panelist. Here we are. Hello, John. Hi there. There I am. OK. So now that we are all together here, um, let me kick this off by first introducing each of the speakers. And then we go into the questions and explore the topics of preprints and peer review. So John, you were the last to come. So why don't we start with introducing you? Um, so yes, John English. Uh, he is the executive director of the Cold Spring Harbor Lab Laboratory Press. Um, and he started off his career as an editor at the Lancet, the famous medical journal. Um, and from there, he was recruited. Oh, no, actually, no, he first started another journal, but then he was recruited by James Watson, a legendary inventor of the DNA structure, and to, to like become this uh, founder of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press, which now has a long history. Patrick just told me that it was started before he was even born. And um, then he uh, built a team there of like 50 people. And later on in 2013, he started BioArchive and uh, the, let's say the sister of that or the, the brother of that bad archive in 2019. So we are very happy to have you here, John. Uh, yeah long history and publishing in different ways than physical and digital form. So uh, great set of expertise. Very glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Um, then let's move on to you, Ludo. Um, Ludo is a professor of quantitative science studies and the deputy director of the Center for Science and Technology Studies, by the way, in the, in the city of Leiden. That's also where I am right now in the library uh, of that same city where Ludo is the professor. Um, he is a meta scientist, as the name already gave away, uh, professor of quantitative uh, science. So he quantifies the scientific process itself. And he is known for uh, the VOS viewer, a software tool which kind of visualizes bibliometrics. So you can see the relationships between papers, who cited whom, and journals, and uh, many more things. It's quite complex uh, and Ludo manages to like visualize that. He is also uh, the founding editor in chief of a journal in the same domain and it's called Quantitative Science Studies. And as this, he also has a, so a large uh, background in publishing, knowing what that entails and uh, the peer review process that goes into that. And today, he is also known for his efforts in open peer review. He told me, for example, how he is publishing a lot of his reviews uh, openly, um, just on its own initiative. And we brought him in to speak about that. Um, ben, thank you. Thank you, Dudo, for being here. Uh, my pleasure, Donville. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. And then we have Patrick. Patrick fits. Uh, into this panel as the co-founder of uh, Research Hub, where we are also working on uh, new forms of publishing. Um, he is a medical student and a PhD student, but he dropped out to pursue his uh, career in uh, tech uh, together with 
Brian Armstrong from Coinbase. He founded Research Hub, and today he'll be here to represent the decentralized science side of this panel. Um, I'm really happy to be able to host this and speak to all of you guys, uh, a nice set of experts from different domains. And hopefully we can uh, enlighten our audience and each other to the different ways in which science can be published, will be published, and yeah, shape that together. So if, if anyone wants to say something, I'll give you a, a, a minute. Otherwise, I would just go and uh, ask the questions and direct them. I'd just like to say thank you, Jonathan, for putting this together. Um, uh, John, I've been like a gigantic fan of BioArchive pretty much since you all started, was when I was starting my PhD in molecular biology. So I just feel extremely lucky to be able to like have you here and like teach us about your experience. So thank you. And then Ludo, obviously your presentation last year was incredible. So, so thank you again for taking the time to join us. A pleasure. Nice. Yes. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so yeah, I think one thing to, to start, off, start us off with is like um, the early days of BioArchive would be a very interesting topic. Like what, what drove you to make it and how did it look like and what was maybe the watershed moment where it really uh, gained traction? Well, thank you. Uh, I, could, I could talk about that for an hour, but let me be, uh, let me be brief. Um, so I'm at, I'm based at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, which many of you may already know is a research institute that's 30 miles outside New York City on the North Shore of Long Island. It's 130 years old. And for really all of that time, it has been a place where people came physically to share science. The, the, the first group to congregate here on the banks of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory were students from the Brooklyn Academy of Arts and Sciences who came to learn Darwin's principles in the field. That was in 1890. And then gradually a research uh, staff was acquired and educational activities grew. And by the time I got here in 1987, it was really a very well established hub for the sharing of scientific information in a whole variety of different ways. So, we, of course, were aware um, once Archive started, Archive, of course, the, the preprint server for physics and, and mathematics primarily, once it got started, we were very aware of that and curious about what would happen if something similar were tried in biomedicine. And of course, given the entrepreneurial nature of biomedical publishers, it wasn't long before that was tried and it didn't work. Um, it was tried by Nature, it was tried by BMJ and others. But by the time 2013 rolled around, Richard and I, my, my colleague Richard Sever and I had the feeling that the Human Genome Project had changed everything. That was a community of scientists who actually came to Cold Spring Harbor every year, had a big meeting, shared everything, shared code, shared ideas, shared findings. And of course, they were, this was the mostly scientists who were involved in the public genome sequencing project. They were in a competitive race with private enterprise. And the fact that they shared so successfully seemed to us to be a hint that a preprint server, even if it was only for genomics, would be valuable. But we thought there was this very strong chance that it might be valuable across all of biomedical disciplines. So I went to the president of the laboratory, got his approval to start BioArchive with no argument or conversation at all, and of course, no extra investment. So we just started and it grew and grew and continued to grow. And we got buy-in from all kinds of areas of the biomedical community, from journal publishers, from prominent scientists who uh, lent us our support. And so it really has been a community-based enterprise right from the beginning, but it's rooted in the idea that Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory has always been a sharing hub for science throughout its history. And this was just doing it in the digital age. 
Right. Thank, thank you very much. So the the watershed moment, in a way, was when the G Human Genomes Project came together. You could really see that. Yes, I, I think so. I mean, it, it's hard to put your finger on, you know, a specific moment, but because if you look at the graph of uptake of and deposition of manuscripts, it's pretty, it's pretty smooth. You know, it, all of these things take a while to percolate and then so you suddenly get a sense you've reached some kind of critical mass where where the the growth level becomes much uh, more sort of exponential mm -hmm. and we certainly saw that in the growth of biomedicine uh, the growth of bio, bio archive med archive on the other hand had a very different history and was profoundly influenced by the pandemic but that's a, a whole other story okay um, maybe we can get back to that. For now, I would like to direct it to you, Lulu, because something that John mentioned here is like, it, it was tried and then it didn't work at first, right? So here we have this thing that it seems to be not so easy to share all the information openly. And that's really something that you have uh, investigated and have a lot of information on. So um, can you maybe talk a little bit about um, the, the challenges that still kind of seem to be in the way there. And one thing that comes to mind is also that some people feel maybe hesitant to share preprints and share their reviews openly. Um, maybe you could address these concerns and um, yeah, speak to, the, speak to those people. And Yeah, no, happy to do that, uh, Jonathan. But I first want to say that I, I really find it impressive what John has actually managed to do. I didn't know the full history that he just, uh, uh, shared with us. It's, it's, it's really fascinating and, and impressive. Um, this is, of course, really, really making a difference in kind of how, how at least in the, in the life sciences, how research is, is, is shared, is disseminated, it's hugely important. Um, so compared to that, I think my own contribution to all of this is modest. Uh, but anyway, I indeed, um, um, uh, being a researcher, being a researcher that is kind of interested in, in, in kind of understanding why uh, certain ideas that at least in theory seem to make a lot of sense, why they sometimes work, but sometimes don't work. Uh, that's indeed something that I'm trying to, to understand better. Um, one thing that I recently did and that I could perhaps briefly uh, um, um, share is um, looking at this whole preprint development that we have globally in some sense or to some extent, but also of course, of course across disciplines. What we see is a lot of progress and we can show all kinds of impressive graphs with, with, with uh, an annual increase each year in, in how many people there are. But actually, what we also see is that still, after so many years of, of, of having preprint service like archive and bio, bio archive, we are actually still at a, at a, at a very limited uh, share of all articles that are being preprinted. Um, and that indeed raises this question, like, why isn't this happening at, at, a, at a larger scale? Um, I did a, an, a survey, a global survey of, of researchers in all disciplines in all countries. Um, we got quite a lot of responses actually. So these researchers that we um, asked to kind of share their experiences with preprinting, these researchers are corresponding authors of, of articles in journals. Um, and some of these articles, of course, um, they, they also appeared as a preprint, others didn't. And we asked all these authors um, and um, what we in particular ask them to share with us is <clears throat> what are the obstacles for you? So why perhaps didn't you choose to preprint your work? And what we saw, what was very clear in this, in this survey is um, concerns that uh, researchers have about um, the um, reliability, the credibility of research that is shared through preprint. So the idea like this has not been peer reviewed yet. So there might be all kinds of mistakes or flaws in the research, and that might be risky. This was basically the most prominent um, concern that re uh, researchers shared, in particular, by the way, in the life and health sciences. Um, and also it was, it was mentioned in particular by US researchers, which I found interesting. This was the biggest, the biggest concern. Um, but I also found, by the way, is that in China, researchers have kind of a different perspective on this. For in China, researchers really told us systematically um, that they are concerned about the, the, the lack of recognition for, for preprints. So what seems to be the case is that in China, even more than in other parts of the world, um, uh, publishing is 
critical is crucial to kind of make progress in your career and, and publishing in the form of, of preprinting is apparently something that is not being uh, rewarded, uh, especially in China. So these were some of the highlights of what we uh, found in that study. Mm -hmm. Nice. The, the here, I, I see these two concerns being mentioned. Like the one is like the reliability of the information. So the value of that in itself and like being skeptical of this. And then the other, the recognition. So um, to a person who might consider writing a preprint and publishing it, uh, but might have some concerns, for example, about the recognition, what would you answer to them? Um, to, yeah, um, my suggestion would be, um, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge that indeed there are problems in the, the way researchers are being, being rewarded for the things they do and the whole uh, um, credit system, the way researchers are being evaluated, all of that, there are lots of problems or let's say challenges that we are facing um, and we need to change things. But of course, many researchers just face a system that they themselves cannot change. So for them, it just represents the way things are. And then I would basically say um, preprinting is essentially something that you can do for free. You can still publish your articles in journals. If you are expected to publish in high impact, prominent, reputable journals, you can still do all of that. Um, but in addition, you can preprint your work. That has changed over time. In the past, of course, there was quite a lot of journals that made clear that they didn't appreciate the whole idea of preprinting. And then, then there was a really major obstacle for, for researchers, but this has changed over time. Um, so now for most journals, preprinting is seen as something that is uh, considered acceptable or journals even, even encourage it, which is of course even better. Um, so partly I think that, that this whole recognition thing is, is um, it reflects indeed all kinds of problems we have in the system. But at the same time, it's also perhaps more a perception that researchers have than a reality. Yeah, I, I would very much endorse what Ludo said. Um, things are changing, um, but they're changing differentially. I mean, as far as we can see, um, there are still parts of the world where the idea of posting a preprint is perceived as um, not the correct thing to do. Um, and um, we have been quite used to intervening um, in individual cases with, uh, on behalf of authors who have posted a preprint on bioarchives, say, and then found that a journal in their particular part of the world is resistant to accepting it because there is a preprint version. This is um, a perception that's changing, I think, uh, but certainly closer to the beginning of bioarchive, it was not uncommon for us to have to intervene with journal editors to explain what we were trying to do. Um, but much less of a problem now. But there are still some pockets of resistance um, in certain parts of the world and in medicine in certain disciplines. Okay. This might be a little reductionist, but John, you mentioned like even sort of the motivation for the human genome product be or project being a little more open was competition with industry and potentially getting to the publication first. And like, it, you know, correct me if I'm wrong there, that's definitely an assumption on my part. Um, it reminds me though of like a really like big success story um, from like my own personal experience with BioArchive where I had a friend who's in their fifth year of a molecular biology PhD and um, they were trying to get published in a journal they couldn't get published, had a couple of rejections, were frustrated because they thought it was a good paper. They posted it on BioArchive, tweeted about it. Um, some of their colleagues like read it on BioArchive and was like, wow, this is great. This needs to be published. And so then eLife on recommendation from the colleagues published the paper. This person graduated and has a great job now. And so that was like very much due to BioArchive. And so, yeah, I, I think like something that like, I hope we can contribute to sort of the environment here is like, some some marketing efforts to help to like correct maybe some of the assumptions that exist around like preprints because yeah at least like tangibly what I've experienced in my own life they've been like a, a huge help to people who just want to get their work out there in a more transparent fashion so so thank you very much for for all of your work well thank thank you Patrick that that's um kind of you to mention that and we have ex we've had that um fortunate story uh, told to us many, many times. I mean, what, you know, we all know about the 
lengthy delays that can happen in the conventional publishing system. Um, the, the, the value of, of a preprint server is that it provides evidence of productivity that can be evaluated by uh, anyone who is moving along their career path. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it can be offered up by anyone who's moving along their career path to a prospective employer. And I mean, we feel very strongly that, that a preprint server is not by itself enough. It's not, you know, that the distribution of work is a great thing and should absolutely be done, but there is a very necessary evaluation and assessment step that goes into that afterwards. Um, but the, 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 the process of closed peer review where someone is prevented from sharing work for a lengthy period of time while peer review processes are conducted seems completely inappropriate to the age that we live in and the sociology of the enterprise that we're all collectively involved in. Could, could I join, John, could I ask you something about this? Because I think what you're saying is, is really interesting. You're, you're saying indeed preprints is very important, but it should not be the only thing. We still need that, that, that evaluation of the scientific work, peer review, etc. I wonder, when you say that, do you mean that all scientific work that at some point appears as a preprint should indeed subsequently go through some form of, of evaluation, peer review, etc.? Or could there be perhaps a distinction where some works indeed definitely need this, while other works that perhaps make different types of contributions might actually not need any immediate peer review? No, I, when I said peer review, Ludo, I meant, you know, conventional journalesque peer review. And, and a lot of that does go on with preprints that are posted on preprint servers. But no, I think the value of sharing uh, work openly in the way that preprint servers um, allow is that different forms of um, assessment and reaction can be uh, applied to a particular piece of work. And something, I mean, we are now finding out 10 years into bioarchive that there is a, a, a community of you know, confident PIs who basically say, posting a preprint is as much as I'm prepared to do because, um, you know, I, I'm, what I want to do is share my work and move on. And it's not as important to me to get yet another peer reviewed publication in the journal. Now that of course avoids the issue of the young people who may be associated with that real career uh, with that paper who are on a career path where peer review and journal publication is important. But um, my point is that um, one, can, one can derive from a preprint all kinds of information, whether or not it has been peer reviewed or otherwise. And as a professional in science, you look at the literature in your field and you may pick up the fact that you know, a, a change in a dosage or adjustment of uh, incubation conditions or something of that sort may make a difference to the work that you're doing. So there are all kinds of ways of, of um, digesting and, and um, learning from the scientific literature. Yeah, I think it's nice the way indeed, John, you now kind of, uh, uh, you present your perspective on this. I think in some sense, what you're saying is that Preprinting offers a way to have much more variety, much more heterogeneity in the way we kind of communicate about scientific work and we respond, evaluate each other's work. While the traditional journal peer review process is, of course, a one size fits all solution. We are kind of trying to do the same thing for all, all research produced globally in all disciplines. And, and I think, indeed, I, I can only agree, preprints really bring an important advantage here in offering much more flexibility in how we think about. Yeah communicating about scholarly knowledge. And of course, journals are also adapting, maybe not as fast as <laughs> we, we might like, but they are. And I suppose in the vanguard of that adaptation is eLife, which now uh, exists um, as a mechanism for um, concentrating, um, uh, acquiring and concentrating uh, community reaction to 
uh, to work that has been communicated uh, to the community. And they are moving away from accept, reject, conventional journal-like decisions. So far, they're, as far as I know anyway, the only group that is attempting to do that. But the rationale for that is that um, this process of acceptance and rejection is a sort of artificial um, distinction that doesn't reflect the way that science advances, that science advances, advances incrementally and the sharing of those that new knowledge and those advances has been done in many different contexts, um, informally at conferences and so on, um, and that a preprint server um, can represent in a digital world many of sort of human interactions that people um, have with corpuses of, of knowledge. And the you know journals, none, they don't get me wrong, they still have a very important critical role in the life and careers of scientists. And that's not going to change anytime very soon, but that the monolithic nature of journals is changing. And uh, eLife, as I say, is just one example of a journal that's trying to do things um, differently and with apparent success. Yeah, thank you for mentioning eLife. We also try to get uh, Michael actually, my uh, head of eLife to here because like you say, they are in the Vanguard. Um, fortunately, he didn't respond to my emails. But uh, this brings us to another issue because now if we have science completely out in the open uh, and we basically uh, distinguish it, like we, we change it live, then the question is one thing that a journal kind of used to do is distinguish between what, what is science and what is pseudoscience, or at least what is appreciated like this by the general public. Um, how do you see this issue and the, the, the role of peer review in that? Because it seems that to some degree, the scientific consensus between a group of scientists uh, is what is guiding the, like the distinction between science and pseudoscience. Um, so anyone here would like to speak to that? Ludo, you take that. You've heard enough from me. <laughs> well, I could say something about this. And I, essentially, because you don't think this relates to that concern that these people in my survey that they expressed, they said, I'm concerned about preprinting, or people around me are concerned about preprinting, because it's kind of unclear whether the, the research is sound, is 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 solid, um, and that is true, of course. So that 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 in that sense, factually, that objection is correct. Um, the way I look at it is that the same basically also applies to research in peer-reviewed journals. There, of course, we have a certain quality. Um, assurance process but first of all that quality assurance process is uh, non-transparent so we don't really know kind of what is happening or we need to kind of just trust or believe what a journal editor tells us they are doing um, and also we have now learned especially over the past five years or so we have learned that actually there are quite a lot of journals that um, let's say don't really fulfill the promises they make um, recently with all the retractions, for instance, at the Hindavi journals. Um, so the, you could perhaps reverse the the, um, uh, the concern that was expressed by these respondents in my survey. You could actually turn it around. You could say, shouldn't we be equally concerned or even more concerned about kind of selling research as if it has been gone through a rigorous quality uh, assurance process while that is actually not the case. I would probably argue that that is actually more dangerous than just being kind of uh, uh, clear about the fact that something is just a preprint and hasn't been, uh, hasn't gone through in that peer review. Now you're speaking like a, sort of out of, my, out of my heart, because I think the, the worst kind of pseudoscience is the one that you can, that actually looks a lot like a science that I, Richard Feynman had this nice word, cargo cult science, which is like, yeah, it has a form of science. It looks like science, especially if you're not able to replicate it because you don't have maybe the funds or the scientific knowledge. So uh, then it's actually quite dangerous to put a stamp of approval on something that is not actually qualitatively on the level. Maybe. Even, 
Yeah, like John and Udo mentioned, like there's all different kinds of evaluation, right? Like peer review is one kind, which is like, you know, two or three experts in a, a closed room sharing an opinion. A replication is another kind. And so like eLife is doing where they're aggregating sort of this community perspective. It can consist of like people's like expert opinions, you know, like layman opinions, and then like objective replications to help people like make sense out of whether something's science or pseudoscience. So yeah, I, I love kind of the transition towards like a more holistic review of like open access literature. And it feels like like less of a gatekeeper, more of a you have to prove it if it's true kind of situation. I think we also need um, better methods of conversation around scientific work. And um, we're limited, uh, and those things happen in the real world. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that has kept me at Cold Spring Harbor for uh, a rather unexpected 30 years were, is the fact that um, so the sense of, of the community of science um, gathering, you know, every week, different groups of four or 500 people coming here, in addition to the in-house scientific enterprise, but that sense of uh, collective investment in a particular topic or a particular field is, is a really very powerful one. And, um, you know, it, it's often been said that the bar at Cold Spring Harbor is, is where a lot of real scientific truth is, is exchanged because, you know, people are talking informally, um, not always on the record, um, and basically giving a very honest assessment of their own work as well as other people's. And so that kind of interaction, that kind of community engagement with, um, with the, the work that's done within the scientific enterprise, in a way is what we are trying to aim for with um, these not-for-profit community-based preprint servers. Now, we're a long way from achieving that goal and some of it is, is culture. So the reluctance of people to engage in that way, some of it is technology. We don't, you know, our platforms are not terribly adaptable or very uh, well geared to the kind of discourse that might take place around a given piece of, of uh, research. But we're sort of trying to head in that direction um, because there are different ways of evaluating work and then just, the last point is, and, and eLife actually, I think, has a handle on this, that um, how the community perceives work changes over the course of time. And with the current journal-based literature, there's a sense that it goes out there and that's it, it's done. It, it may be cited, but nobody ever goes back to it in any kind of live, engaged uh, way that has the capability of changing perception of that work that was reported. And I think we are now in a, an era with, a, with technologies that may allow more of that to happen um, and, and work to sort of live and evolve uh, in ways that, that we haven't had the opportunity to do before. And that's something I find very interesting. Nice. Thank you. This uh, we have now really explored the two concerns that Ludo raised in the beginning. And now you mentioned that uh, all, a lot of science actually happens at the bar. That's a good way to say it, it is in a conversation. It's not necessarily at the bar. I also read like a biography by Heisenberg where he just goes through all the significant conversations and they range from a taxi to like a four day trip with Niels Bohr uh, hitch, hiking, right? That's going to be in, a little bit more in depth than what happens in the text. Um, so, this, I think, is a, good, is a good bridge to like lead this over to Patrick. And maybe, Patrick, you can talk a little bit about uh, what you've been doing on Research Hub and um, how that ties into what John just said about like trying to convert, uh, enable conversation and through technology. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, even just that comment about like discussion at a bar, it, it makes me think it's like an interesting kind of combination of like anonymity, it's like trusted pseudonymity kind of, and like how can you replicate that in like an open way in like the internet? Um, you know, still lots to brainstorm on there. But yeah, I think with Research Hub, we're, we're trying to create like the UI that makes it easy for people to come in and share their opinion about scientific literature, you know, whether that's like a 
a layman who wants to share kind of their gut feeling or like an expert who has a lot of context or another scientist who wants to share a replication. Um, and then I think importantly too, like also making it like financially sustainable for this type of interaction to happen. So like in theory, like if you disagree, you know, with a certain finding that you see like on BioArchive, you can bring your community together to maybe crowdfund an experiment to test it, you know, to have a replication to see like, you know, or I guess add additional context to the original work itself. Um, so yeah, big picture. We're, we're very lucky at Research Hub to work with like a group of extremely talented engineers who can build up almost anything that we dream. So like, I feel very excited to to have this conversation to dig into like what that format actually looks like, because I don't think it's the easiest thing to replicate like a, a conversation in a bar with a trusted friend on the internet. But if we could do that, it would, I think, unlock a lot. So yeah, that's, that's sort of big picture what we're hoping to do. Yeah. Um, one thing that we have seen is, of course, uh, Twitter being like a platform here um, that, that kind of is a testament to the, the deep need that scientists feel to like discuss their work. Um, while it's not clear to me that Twitter is the ideal um, platform for this, um, I feel like the character limit is part of that. Um, but what I do like is of course the way that it spreads in your in your network. And that's sort of what you do want with the conversation. Um, maybe it would be interesting here to, to hear your um, your vision on this, like both of you, Ludo and um, John, because we had we heard Patrick to say that they are building a um, a software that allows that level of conversation. It would be really interesting to hear from a publisher with deep publishing expertise and from a scientist who's interested in this topic, how they would like this to look. And then maybe Patrick can feed that to his talented engineering team that can make dreams real. <laughs> <laughs> so who wants to go first? Well, you go first, John. <clears throat> There's always been uh, tension, hasn't there, within the research community between the way that we interact as individuals and what it takes to advance in our careers. And publishing in journals has become the touchstone for our career advancement. And um, contributions to discussions, uh, all of that are um, minor considerations. I, really, when in, in, most, uh, in most academic organizations anyway, uh, um, academic institutions, people get jobs based on what they published and where they published. Um, that remains pretty much true. Um, I, I think maybe the one of the few ways in which that has changed over the 10 years that bioarchives has been in existence is that um, people tell me now that they got their first academic job because they had a preprint on bioarchive and they might have been trying to get it published, but they had the interviews with the academic institution concerned based on their preprint and what could be perceived of the reactions to that preprint. Um, per perceptions being you know, colored by Twitter and other things. Um, so not really very much has changed. We're still, um, we're still very much bound up with publish it, with published work, less so with conversations that take place around published work, whether it's on Twitter or on any other medium. Um, and I, I think that in many ways, is um, still a challenge for us with the scientific community broad, more broadly. Um, you know, I happen to be lucky to be in a hub of scientific communication. I mean, you know, the, the bar conversation that Patrick referred to is that's alive and well. And it's one of the reasons why people go to meetings and they have those conversations um, because, you know, science is a human enterprise and we learn a lot more by communicating face-to-face -face than we do 
through uh, the either the written word or the electronic word. So we're we're sort of groping towards progress here, um, but we're not there yet. And for the moment, uh, published work remains the sort of talisman of um, of talent and achievement. And most jobs are based in part on those things. I mean, the, the real appointment to a job is based on who you are and how you interact with the individuals uh, on the ground. But getting to the point of being able to have that conversation is based very much on your output of knowledge and or, or output of science. And that typically means journals. Ludo, am I over, am I underestimating things here? Um, well, I happen to live in a country in the Netherlands where we are making the universities in, in, in the Netherlands are making a quite serious effort to actually move beyond the system that you're describing, John, with, I would say, kind of a, a mixed success. Some, some universities or some departments are indeed actually quite successful in moving away from that system where kind of the publication, the journal article is kind of the almost the only thing that counts. Uh, but at other places in the Netherlands, we see that this is more, more, more difficult. But looking at what is happening in the Netherlands, I'm actually uh, um, relatively positive that it is possible to move beyond that, 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 that type of system. Um, but, but in response to Patrick and his engineers, I, I think, um, so the way we, 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 we value science, the way we value or evaluate researchers, scholars, that is something that, of course, the engineers cannot really change. Um, but what I think is a big challenge for the engineers is basically um, um, coming up with ways to, to evaluate or, let's say, to interact with scholarly work that go beyond this, this traditional idea of what peer review is. So we have this whole movement towards open peer review, which I fully support, which I believe is important and, 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 and the way to go. But at the same time, we need to recognize that what is changing is the, 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 the openness, the openness of the review. So rather than the reviews being closed, they are open, that's good. But actually, there are many other things that don't change in that particular transition. So we still have that idea like that the reviewer is going to review the entire article. And apparently the reviewer is kind of knowledgeable on all aspects of the article. And the reviewer is supposed to be motivated to give feedback, not just on a few issues that he kind of um, is most familiar with, but he is supposed to give feedback on all of it. And this, I think, is all quite um, a quite unnatural way, actually, of, of, of interacting with each other about particular uh, scientific work. So when you are together at the bar, your conversation will converse towards the things where you kind of really have a shared interest. And, 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 and peer review, also open peer review, has not yet managed to kind of um, um, move in the same direction. So sometimes I have this feeling like we should probably really kind of forget about that whole term peer review because it has all these, all these ideas that actually, in some sense, are obstacles, obstacles to genuine interaction about scholarly work. And I think, John, when you mentioned the social media, I think that part of the answer is to be found there. The social media, with all their problems, they do provide something that apparently many of us feel is an, an, an attractive or an efficient way to interact with each other. And I think we need to learn from that. And perhaps we should even res resist the temptation of building all kinds of kind of communication channels for researchers um, next to what we already have on social media. Because I think no one likes to have too many different channels that you all need to pay attention to. So it's, we, we should find a way, that's for your engineers, Patrick, to integrate it all. Um, and I really don't know what that would actually entail, but, but it's something like that, I think. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It, it kind of reminds me, again, of what John was saying with uh, eLife, where they're just kind of like passively aggregating content that's existing in many places on the internet to provide context for the article. So like like one thing we actually like truly believe, like um, people should uh, earn rewards for publishing open science. So everyone who publishes on BioArchive has some rewards waiting for them on Research Hub just because they published like an open access, you know, piece of scientific content. And so it, that is, it's a challenging thing for the engineers for sure. We've tried to like crawl Twitter before, but you're absolutely right where we should be you shouldn't 
assessment doesn't have to be in one place for it to matter. Like we should be making an effort to try and bring in everything from across the internet. Um, and maybe even Google can turn on the microphones for us for those bar conversations, <laughs> but, but um, that's mostly a joke. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like taking into account opinions from all across the internet. One thing that I uh, would like to add here is like, when I heard you, John, talk about the traditional way that things are working right now, and if I translate that a little bit into a need, then I think what we, what I think uh, you're talking about is like a reputation mechanism. Like in a conversation, you start uh, trusting a person that has expertise, right? Like uh, you, 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 you want to talk to a certain person about a certain issue because you know that they might be able to help you. Like I go with a book to my mathematics friends. Like, can, you, can you translate this for me? I do, but I don't understand the science. And then they, they help me and I know they have reputation because they, they are doing a PhD in math. So I trust them, their ability. And maybe that's something that we, that, that why we had the journals in the first place, right? To like aggregate information of a certain type and be like, uh, it's a reliable source of getting high quality information. So we keep going back to that. Um, and now we are in this crisis sort of where we don't always know if it's really reliable and uh, that's a bit scary. And I think what we what we do need in the sense is like, uh, and we have been working on that as a reputation algorithm to like keep track of who has what reputation and, and, and for a decentralized system, that's actually something that in the whole DeSci space is kind of deep to, it goes back to already the crypto anarchist manifesto where the person writes that, um, Timothy T. May, like a cypherpunk writes that reputation is going to be really important once we have these crypto technologies, including currencies and including what is now the dark net, net. And there we see the same thing happen, that people need to trust complete strangers who are also criminals, but they still want to make place an order, and then they develop a reputation system to build it. Um, maybe, Patrick, you could talk a little bit about that and um, how you see that uh, as part of the mission and part of the vision of Research Hub. Yeah, so to me, one of the really exciting things about what we're building is that it's kind of an infrastructure for the community to set their mm -hmm. own rules. Like, um, you know, we have the situation today where bibliometrics kind of create these perverse incentives. And like if our team were to come up with like a reward and reputation structure, there's no doubt we would come up with similar perverse incentives, even with our like best efforts. And so I think it's important to have like um, modularity and the ability to iterate. So we actually have a computer scientist um, named Levy, who's um, kind of trying to come up with an algorithm in an open source fashion to convert real world scientific contributions, like, um, like standard peer reviewed publications, preprints, conference proceedings, um, peer reviews, basically anything that we can grab online and try and translate that into a reputation score on Research Hub. So when you see a peer review, maybe there can be an anonymous peer review, but there's some sort of context of who's the person giving this, you know, critique of the work. Um, but yeah, you know, a lot easier said than done. And again, I think it's very important for us to keep in mind that like it will be 100% wrong the first time. And the goal is like over time to make it more accurate and really like create incentives that um, like cause researchers to partake in good, healthy research behaviors that help us like get closer to the truth. And then maybe here, an interesting thing is that what we have seen is that in a way now, the reputation is always a dynamic system in a way, right? There's like bottom up sort of reputation because of where the people go, they, they give that reputation. But it right now it's sort of also a top down process because those people, those big journals, which have a name, they decide who also gets to wield that power, right? By including them in the in the system. And uh, in decentralized science, there's maybe a, a way to make that more bottom up. And you were now talking already quite high level, but I feel one thing that is already baked into Research Hub is like the up or down back mechanism, where the reader has some like, in, like some pushback against, or like some not, not that we need to always push back against authority, but that we have to some degree a counterbalance where there's also a bottom up movement that uh, gives reputation to the um, people who might already hold it and they can take it away by, by downloading them. And I think that is an important dynamic that we need to build 
so that we can actually more easily discern between the high quality and the low quality stuff uh, sooner. And it's sort of a way to like share reputation from scientist to scientist uh, in a more dynamic way than in a static way where uh, boards and diff like higher, higher organizational structures decide that. Jonathan, could I ask you other examples of communities where that process is at work? And if so, what have been the consequences? Yeah, I mean, one example that is that that is basically research, research hubs uh, model is very similar to that of Reddit. And if you look in Reddit, it's like the front page of, of science was not of science, that's what research hub is, but Reddit was the front page of the internet. That was their slogan. And when I started using it, Actually, the advantage was that because other people had went through the internet and I felt that something was share worthy and then it was up and down voted, I had much quicker access to high quality content through this um, sort of ranking algorithm that they had applied to the content. And I think another one is maybe uh, Google with their page rank algorithm by seeing the links between the different pages. They can at certain sort of the, they, they were looking at the users behavior through the through an approximation or like a, an assessment of that. And then they can see, ah, this is a relevant website because a lot of people want to see it. And um, in that way, they, the website builds reputation by having a lot of backlinks, right? And I think those would be examples of these systems. And I know Ludo has been citing research or like ex explaining research to me in one talk where he went into the page rank algorithm that has been applied also in science. But I, I think we are we don't have that um, one thing yet, or like the, the trusted model, let's say, which is like Google in, in search, right? And science, it doesn't seem to yet exist. Maybe somebody wants to say something here and then we can slowly go and answer some questions from the audience because we only have like 10 minutes left. But if one, one more thing is, now that we have talked about all these positive things, I also want to look into like, what are some of the concerns? What are some of the um, challenges and maybe responsibilities that we have in the process of like promoting preprints, promoting uh, open peer review? What should we maybe be careful uh, about and watch out? So just to, to add a tail end to your answer there, Jonathan, it kind of reminds me of something that I picked up from Wudo's talk last year, where like in the perfect situation, if everyone's publishing openly all the time, it's not realistic to expect that every piece of content would receive peer review, that we should probably be focusing limited peer review resources on the pieces of content that are most relevant to add context to. And so something that we're playing around with at Research Hub is uh, we have a, a bioarchive hub where we're having people vote on bioarchive preprints in order to like have some kind of additional context to like what are the preprints that people think deserve the most attention right now. And we're even um, going to automatically assign peer review bounties to these preprints with kind of like the big picture idea being if you come here mm -hmm. and you vote, you can help direct attention of limited peer review resources to the preprints that you think the world needs to have that context on. So early stage, like nothing, you know, to report that's exciting yet, but hopefully in a couple of months, we'll have like the ability to have scientists share like where they think attention should be spent. That's interesting, Patrick. And we'd certainly love to hear more about that when you're ready to, um, to, to share it. Um, yeah, we've been thinking about this, uh, which, which is, you know, I'm mindful of this may sound terribly arrogant because let's face it, bioarchive and meta-archive represent at best, well, 10% of the literature at this point. So <laughs> I shouldn't talk in terms of, of uh, you know, massive shifts in cultural um, awareness and, and behavior, but um, we obviously do talk a lot about whether every piece of scientific communication um, once shared, um, is that is that enough? Is it necessary for everything to be peer reviewed? I, I think we. Any, I mean, you know, I'm also a journal publisher, responsible for half a dozen journals, and and peer review is in trouble because 
um, it's hard, hard and harder and harder to get qualified peer reviewers to agree to do the job. Um, now you could say we're not asking the right people. We don't, you know, we're not broadly based enough in our peer review um, processes, which is a perfectly fair criticism. But there is a, a sense of weariness um, or resentment that if I'm a very, very busy scientist, then this is just another thing that I have to do with no obvious reward. Um, and there's a sense that, that particularly younger scientists are not happy with that equation any longer. Um, so I think we do have to rethink how peer review actually works. And um, you know, one benefit of preprint servers is that they provide equal opportunity for dissemination and then other things can be built on top of that. Um, and um, that's what you know, we're interested in various initiatives uh, that are that are happening that um, are based on that on that premise that you let everything out and then you filter you don't filter and then let everything out um, that goes through the filter. So I think uh, I, there are many reasons for why change is happening in the way that science communication is is going. But um, fatigue uh, and stress uh, is is what amongst the practitioners of science is one of those things. Now, you, you want to say something? Yeah, that's okay, Jonathan. Oh, sorry, Patrick, go ahead. I would have said, please say something. Then... Just to jump in, this is like one of my favorite quotes ever, and John just paraphrased it beautifully. It's from uh, Linus Pauling, who says, like, the best way to get good ideas is to take lots of ideas and throw away the bad ones. So, so yeah, just it's 100% the ethos that, you know, we think the world needs. I, I share all these ideas and uh, I also believe in this and at the same time I have a kind of a, a concern that I don't really know how to kind of how to deal with it. I think all these ideas make a lot of sense to improve the way in which researchers communicate um, uh, among each other. Um, we can make the system much, much better. But there's of course also the communication between researchers, the research system and society at large. And, and that's also where in my survey, where I think what, what is the reason why these people are so concerned about preprints not being reliable, all of that, um, because societal actors may also read these preprints. And um, I think we can come up with all kinds of better ways of organizing communication in science uh, between researchers. And this is really better ways of doing it. However, society is also kind of uh, um, seeing all of this. And they, of course, they, they don't have the um, societal actors, most societal actors don't have the, let's say, the level of understanding of the way in which communication between researchers is, 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 is organized to really kind of be able to properly assess what can be kind of trusted, what should be really taken with a grain of salt. And, and, and I wonder how we can also find a way to help societal actors to kind of properly make sense of what we are doing. And I don't have the answer. It, it makes me think just like of again going back to the ear life of or e life aggregating everyone's opinion like i think something that'd be very helpful because there are you know like um people who publish preprints and they're kind of trying to get to a certain answer you know it's not like the most objective all the time but that's just all science um it's really nice to have context so like if x researcher thinks this is great you know or x researcher thinks this is not great that also could be shared alongside the news article that's trying to you know elicit a certain opinion and yeah if we can you know somehow encourage researcher x and y to share their opinions i think that's that's a good way of going about it like kind of reputational association all right thank thank you all very much um, in order to also give the audience a little bit of stake of the, on this, I will shift to this. But first of all, thank you. I, I feel like I could talk to you for longer. This has been really fun. I like how you guys also had a dynamic between, uh, at one point, Duro was just asking you questions, John, and I, that's, I think, exactly what we need. That, like in science and in general, apparently, in human endeavors, the conversation and coming to one idea is very powerful. Um, uh, that does not always mean that we start that you have the same opinion, but talking about the same topic can be a powerful drive. 
and I really enjoy this. So now I want to uh, also let the other, the, the watch, the viewers participate because they probably also feel the same. Um, and maybe take one or two questions from the audience and maybe go a little bit over time. Yeah, it depends. So um, one question I find interesting is that, are there any plans to add some review capabilities on the preprint servers to help address some of the accuracy issues? For example, either some automatic or in-person reviews on the data analysis. Um, um, well, we have, we have many of those things happening now. Um, and um, it, it may be a testament to our failure to uh, make that obvious <laughs> that the questioner um, is unaware of that. And, and we, we, are, we are sort of rethinking our interface, but there is a dashboard on um, every bioarchive preprint and uh, it, uh, it, it uh, provides a, a focus uh, of uh, um, comment activity around that particular, various kinds of activities around that preprint and clicking on that um, uh, device underneath every abstract will open up a dashboard in which you can see in some detail different kinds of react community-based reaction uh, to that particular preprint. That may, that may include peer review, but it also includes all kinds of other forms of engagement with the work concerned. So that's not to say that every preprint attracts that kind of activity. And that's something else that we need to work on to try to engage the community more, more widely in, in thinking about and reacting to the existence of a preprint because that contribution is immensely valuable. But we have work to do on changing, um, uh, increasing enthusiasm for engagement in that way. Okay, um, then I have another one for you, Ludo, I guess. Ludo made such a great point about the assumption that any given peer review, the reviewer is an expert on an entire paper. Do you see a future in science where peer review can be more di discretized, where peer reviewers assess only individual aspects of the preprint that matches their expertise, e.g. specific techniques? Um, yeah, what do you have to say? Yeah, yeah I think this reminds me of, of and some of the participants may be familiar with these developments. There are now these platforms like um, uh, Research Equals, and, and in the UK there's Octopus. These platforms that actually um, or, uh, enable researchers to publish their work in, in smaller units. So rather than an entire article, you publish, for instance, a description of a method, a description of a data set, just a few results. Um, and then the peer review can also take place at the level of these smaller units. Um, Theoretically speaking, this to me sounds actually quite nice, but I must also admit that I finished myself in my own work. I have not yet kind of started to adopt these approaches. So it seems to be there's a big, big, big hurdle there. Um, the other thing is, I think actually in some sense, this, this thing of, of com commenting on individual aspects of a preprint, it's, it's actually happening a lot on social media. There people do it. So we have it. Um, but it's it's completely different from what we normally consider to be peer review. So perhaps we should actually we should uh, we should be happy actually with what the social media enable us to do because there's a lot of valuable discussion going on there. Yeah. I would add also that um, there is um, uh, an organization called Hypothesis which has developed annotation software. Um, which if you sign into Hypothesis and then look at say preprints on BioArchive or MedArchive, then you can see um, what people have added, uh, annotations essentially, not, not, rev not peer review as we understand it, but annotations at particular points in a, in a manuscript. That uptake I think has been faster in the social sciences than in the hard sciences. But um, it is an interesting technology, and we are working with the folks at Hypothesis on elaborations of that. Nice, thank you. Um, yeah, then I have one last question, um, and we can we can then wrap it up. So it says the White House will require all federally funded research to be released to the public for free by 2026. How do you think that changes the publishing scenario? Um, 
typically uh, that directive, if, if it's risen to the level of a directive yet, um, that is talked about in the context of open access journal publishing. It does not, as far as I'm aware, mean that we're going to get the US federal government telling everybody that they have to post preprints. We would like that. It doesn't seem to be the case. Um, but uh, hopefully that will, that will encourage this sense of sharing that we have seen grow in 10 years of bioarchive and will you know will make people feel more comfortable with the whole idea that they should publish in they should share their work in venues where which are open essentially whether it's a journal or whether it's a preprint server anyone else here has a comment on this I think it's interesting to see the, the kind of parallel developments in Europe. Um, so what's happening in the, in the US is, is um, important and, and interesting, at least if it indeed if it goes on. Um, but in Europe, we are going, and partly we have already gone through similar types of processes. And I think what we now see in Europe is um, we see that the, the, at the political level, we have the European countries and the EU Council, they make actually quite strong statements pushing for, for change in how we do publishing, actually stronger statements, I would say, than what's happening in the US. And um, there's now also, for instance, the funders, the Coalition S funders that are going to work on a new strategy, what they call responsible publishing, where I think we can also really expect to see some uh, interesting developments. Uh, Coalition S, the European Commission, Open Research Europe, it's kind of all moving in a direction that that are kind of preprinting open peer review are going to be key ingredients of how publishing is, is, is supposed to be done. So that's, I think, really exciting. Yeah, thank you all for this uh, amazing panel. I still, on my hat, I have some questions. I would like to know more about bioarchive and the specific disciplines, more about hypotheses. Where are they actually talking right now? Uh, and uh, You know where to find me, Jonathan, happy to. Yeah, yeah we, we have to continue this, like, honestly. Yeah. Um, good. And then maybe the, the, the other thing where there is some mind is like the financial aspect of it all, like with, with, just with the last question that came to mind, is also important. Um, yeah, so let's continue the conversation and thank you all for this deep sharing of information that actually made me uh, inspired and uh, yeah, kept the conversation going. So see you all uh, on another occasion. Maybe we can host again and another call. Thank, Thank you for the opportunity. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Jeff. Okay. You can, I guess, take it from here. Do you see Manvir in the... I don't, I don't see him in the audience just yet, but... Um... Yeah, that was that was a really special. Uh, it was amazing. Panel. That was amazing. Yeah, I think just uh, getting an hour with you know people like Ludo and John, who have you know years of insight around that, is just yeah really amazing. And it was a nice interaction between everybody. So yeah, that that was wonderful. And and you know we're gonna continue with like the theme of some of these things. So uh, it seems like Manvir is backstage right now. So. Um, yeah, Manvir is uh, definitely a young, a young, very passionate scientist, and, and he'll be talking to us about uh, replication. So we'll wait for him before I give him uh, his formal introduction. There he is. Hey, Manvir, how are you? Not too shabby. How about you? Very good, very good. Yeah, we just came off the... Uh, the back of uh, an amazing panel with uh, with John Inglis and uh, and Ludo Waltman. So uh, you got some big shoes to fill here. So uh, <laughs> the pressure is on. <laughs> get this kick started. So um, yeah, so I'm I'm really excited to um, present to you all uh, Manvir. So Manvir actually uh, self taught himself coding at the age of 13 um, and dropped out of university, uh, I believe, to start his project, Muller, um, which is up and live, and I'm sure he'll show you some demos of it today. And um, Manvir is really particularly passionate about the uh, replication crisis that's going on in academic science. Um, and 
from from a computer science background um, and coding background, he's building out some tools that will allow for the ability to vet how rep, uh, re reproducible uh, certain types of research might be or certain types of papers or code base or data on the back end. So um, yeah, I've like, I've gotten to interact with Ben here um, on Twitter and, and virtually. So we haven't met in person yet, but virtually on a few calls. Um, yeah, Ben is very, very passionate, very inquisitive. Um, and uh, what's I think most important is uh, pragmatism. And so um, you'll see it, I think, in kind of his discussion around reproducibility, you'll see it in kind of the presentation of some of the demos, but um, being able to um, identify a problem, but then also have a viable, uh, meaningful solution to try to tackle that problem is very important. And so, uh, yeah, with that, I'll pass it over to you, Manvir. Uh, so take it away. That was an awesome intro. Thank you, Jeffrey. I feel like uh, you hyped me up a lot and I have some big shoes to fill on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, here, let me just share my screen and then I'll get right into it. Hey, are you able to give me access to share screen? Yeah, Ricardo, can you uh, pass over the privileges for that? Okay, I think I got it now. All right, can you share? Can you see this window? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah. I mean, as as Jeff already alluded to, I'm the founder CEO of Scholar. Um, you can check out our website there, but we're basically trying to build tools to enable more reproducible and like rep replicable research publication. We're more uh, per se like focused on machine learning and computer science research for now, but we do want to expand this a little bit more broadly. And um, and so I think the, the presentation that I'm going to give today, um, I think the last presentation focused more on maybe perhaps like the, the regulatory standpoint and how like institutions are adapting to things. Um, but I'm going to put a more like probably like a technological focus on like where is probably the future of science going and what we can do to um, enable that future. And so, so the title of my talk is, or the title of my presentation is called How All Scientific Verification Becomes Replication. And I'm going to be talking about how there's some very large technological shifts on the horizon of AI, automation, and crypto that are kind of changing how scientific is communicated and verified. Um, and I think it will probably lead to an increase in the importance of replicability and reproducibility. So then how can we build and enable that future? Um, and also get into some demos later on too. Um, so yeah, so I'll first start with where potentially decentralized science is going in the face of these big technological changes um, and why that'll lead to a rise in replication and reproducibility as like this true test of scientific rigor. And then also finally in that world, in that future world, how can we build for it and um, just like enable more replicability and reproducibility of, of scientific research. Um, so I'll start with where potentially decentralized science is going. And I'm gonna start with LK99, the recent superconductor paper um, that if you're on Twitter, you probably, you definitely heard about this. Um, but I think LK99 was a really good glimpse into a potential future of decentralized science where the scientific process unfolded really quite differently than how it used to. And so for that reason, I think it's gonna be a really useful example to anchor some of the explanations that I'm gonna give. LK99 was in a sense, the first truly internet native science moment um, Amjad Massad, the CEO of Replit, had a really good tweet on this as well, um, where he pointed out that it, it was kind of like the first uh, true case where scientific research unfolded really quite differently. And it happened all online and in a very decentralized manner where the paper was published open by default, revisions were shipped on the fly. We had betting markets on the replicability of the research, live stream replications, and also random like internet nerds with like these anonymous profile pictures delivering pretty deep and valuable insights. And I think the other big observation is that it mostly all happened outside of the existing scientific complex of journals, peer review and prestige and citations. It was fully decentralized in the sense um, where I think 20 years ago, you probably would have published to journals, you would have waited for peer review to happen. Um, but instead, you just Today, you just post on archive and share on X. And um, so this journal distribution, in a sense, is, is almost getting disintermediated by, and decentralized by um, Twitter, X, and archive. And, and the important observation here, I think, is that 
science moved at the speed of the internet, not at the speed of the institution. So rather than waiting for months of peer review and um, waiting for like other authors to try to replicate work and then publish it in another paper, um, we were just able to establish le legitimacy within days slash weeks. Um, so rather than months to establish legitimacy, it moved really quite fast. And the other big observation too, is that it was really meritocratic and democratic in a sense, not very bureaucratic and oligarchic as a lot of the um, general industrial complex is kind of like today. There was no real bureaucracy telling you that you needed to be very prestigious or you needed to have a certain level of citations in order to contribute to the conversation. It was very open access, it was very transparent and very egalitarian in the sense that anybody with sufficient competence could weigh in on the scientific discourse and contribute to the conversation. And I think this is kind of the future of science that we do want to see as stewards of DSI. And I think it's definitely the direction that technology is also pushing us into. And the other the other observation that I point out too is that um, all peer review prestige and citations was ignored in the pursuit of replication. Uh, people kind of knew that no matter what peer review said about the paper, no matter how prestigious the authors were, and no matter how highly cited the previous work was, nothing really mattered if the paper didn't independently replicate. And I think this is this might be like what the future of science looks more like. Where we ignore these um, these old systems of doing things, these old markers of excellence and quality, and we just focus on establishing legitimacy through replicability. And the way that I would encapsulate this all is that technology is in a sense changing the nature of how research is published and verified. These technological forces that I kind of touched on slightly, um, with AI automation, the internet and crypto, um, they're very drastically like changing things. Um, and, uh, and I think they're also, they're becoming so strong today that um, we're almost reaching a tipping point where they can't really be contained within the um, existing academic research complex. And so we're seeing some inklings of them happening in a more like decentralized manner outside of that research complex. And I think we're really at just, just at the start of some massive potential tide shifts. And so I touched on how publication could potentially be changing, but I'm gonna focus most of this conversation on how verification, how scientific verification could potentially cha be changing in the face of these big technological changes. So I'll first start with the observation that a lot of scientific verification today um, is really just like proxies for quality. And by proxies, I mean that um, these, these ideas of peer review, prestige, and citations, they don't really like independently replicate or verify the research. They just approximate the legitimacy of, of, the, of the science that's published. And we've operated in this realm of proxies for a while. Um, like there's just so much research published and so many researchers publishing that we kind of need to rely on these proxies to establish legitimacy and, and just like scale um, the scientific research to the level that it is and the level that it did reach within the industrial age. Um, but also, I think a lot of people have become aware of the idea that these proxies are potentially failing us um, because there's been a lot of like flake, false, non-replicable research that has been published in the scientific record and peer review that was meant to be a check on the quality of the research that was published, it didn't really good, do a good job of catching it. It was more peer review, not peer replication. And so for that reason, it was sort of a weak check on the validity of the research. And even these like indicators of excellence that we use um, of citations, um, they don't really correlate as well, as strongly with correctness as they used to. There was a time where citations actually did correlate very strongly with high quality, high impact research. That was why Eugene Garfield initially pushed for their broad adoption in the 1950s. Um, but things have kind of changed now. Citations have been gamed almost. Um, and so for that reason, they're almost losing their credibility and weight. And there's some credible evidence that you can even correlate high citations with non-replicable research. And prestige as well, it no longer proxies quality as well as it used to. We've seen some very notable examples of prestige almost being abused for personal progression and self-preservation. And so for this reason, these sort of old markers of excellence that we've used for some time, are losing their weight and losing their trustworthiness as indicators of quality. And the net result that we're seeing is that a lot of our, a lot of a lot of the things that we had set up to verify research are 
failing in, in this world. And unfortunately, I think AI will probably make things a lot worse. It'll probably um, reduce the uh, credibility and the quality of these, of these indicators of quality quite drastically. And why is that? It's because AI can already fake realistic pictures and it'll probably soon fake realistic papers. Uh, the pace of progress that we're seeing with AI is really quite staggering today. Um, it's getting really good at generating deep fakes, fake images. And I think by extension, we'll soon see it get pretty good at faking research papers. I think we might see fake results, charts, images, code, data, pretty much everything. Um, it might just start with getting good at manipulating existing legit data um, as is already happening to some extent. Um, but ultimately the at, at the rate of progress that we're seeing, I think within a couple of years, it'll ultimately be able to fake pretty much everything. Um, people have been playing around with, with code interpreter to generate um, images, even like generating synthetic data as well too. Um, and we've been teaching AI to get pretty good at generating code as well. And I think, yeah, if, if you plot these further advances in AI, I think this is probably the way that things are going. And unfortunately, this will give enormous leverage to malicious actors to um, abuse this technology to commit fraud. Um, even just the concept of paper mills alone, which are just built to push out plausible but ultimately fake research, I think they'll get enormous leverage with AI to continue that abuse and to continue to publish um, fraudulent research. And we've also seen like decades of examples of even like malicious actors um, doing the results and manipulating the results in order to get published for self-career progression and preservation. And I think we might see that continue. I, I don't see any good reason why that won't continue. And I think the net effect is that um, we'll probably see a lot more fraud published within scientific literature. I mean, I, I have, I'm not the only one making this observation. We've seen some pretty credible people and some pretty respectable people making this observation, uh, observation as well. Um, but I think the net effect is that it's gonna be a lot harder to tell whether a published paper is fake and manipulated or not. And unfortunately, our existing um, research complex, our existing academic complex, is not very positioned um, well to adjust for this. Um, it may not adapt well to these like exponential changes in technology and in, in, in AI and like just technology more broadly that are coming. Um, and so I think it would be useful to focus our efforts on building tools at the technological frontier to help to alleviate some of these issues, um, which I'll get into like a little bit later. But Basically, it's in this future where AI erodes our ability to trust PDF papers, um, where peer review prestige and citations no longer correlate that well with correctness, that I see replication rising as the only way to really verify the legitimacy of research, where replication becomes the only thing that we can really trust and the only true test of scientific rigor. And this is kind of how I see all scientific verification becoming replication that as these old proxies for quality um, fail to really correlate with quality, um, we just focus a lot of our efforts on replicating research and establishing legitimacy through replicability. And this is kind of exactly what happened with LK992 with the superconductor paper, where we ignored the old ways of prestige peer review and citations and just focused on replication. And you might ask why replication? Well, it's because replication is in a sense a verification against ground truth. Um, it's a verification against reality. Reality is, in a sense, the ultimate source of truth. That's why we run our experiments against it. And it's, it's this verification against ground truth that is robust to AI. That no matter how much fake work is published, um, as long as we can verify that work against ground truth, we can tell whether it's legit or not. As long as we can replicate results, we can know if it's legit. But the other big thing that LK99 showed us is that we don't have a lot of good tools for replicability currently. We're not very well positioned for this future. Um, it was third-party platforms that ended up serving a lot of the demand for replicability and, and reproducibility. And so we currently don't have good ways to um, have an estimate, have a market determined estimate of how replicable research is. We don't have good ways of um, surfacing information on all of the replication attempts for a specific paper and just like listing all the results there for people to view. And it's also really expensive to replicate a lot of research. 
especially for research that involves a major physical world element, like a lot of wet lab research, for example. Um, and yeah, even with the LK99 superconductor paper, it was third party platforms like Manifold Markets and Wikipedia that ended up serving this demand for having information on replicability um, easily available. And we are in the age of exponential tech. So I think these changes with AI will probably come quite fast. And so if we do want to adjust well for this future, I think we should probably start building for it soon. Um, because these, these technological forces may come quite fast and they may uproot a lot of the old ways of doing things and a lot of these old markers of excellence. And so it would be useful to have a better order on the other side of that in order to preserve the integrity of science in this future. Um, so what are some potential things that we can do? Um, I think from my perspective, I see three potential solutions that have the um, that can have impact on alleviating some of these issues. Uh, one of them is on-chain publication. The other is replication markets. And then the third is minimizing the long-term cost to replicate. So I'll go through each of these solutions individually. So the first is on-chain publication. So I think I alluded to this a little bit before, but I think in the near future, PDFs won't really be, PDF papers won't be enough for us to determine whether research is legit or not. Um, what we'll need is more information. That means like code, data, even machine artifacts, things like that. Anything that can increase our confidence that the information is legit and not faked by AI will probably be quite useful in that world. And I've written about this extensively before um, on my Substack, which I'll have linked at the end of this presentation. But I think in the near future, if you're publishing your research, um, PDF papers probably won't be enough for people to trust its legitimacy, but they'll need more information to be able to like discern whether it's legit or not. And I think along with more information, we'll probably have to defend that information against manipulation as well too. And the defense against AI manipulation is on-chain attestation. So along with making your research artifacts open for people to audit, also like hashing them on chain. So onto blockchains like Ethereum and Bitcoin to personally certify their legitimacy in a sense. Like you're almost like staking your reputation that like this information is legit. And by having that hash on chain, it prevents it from being uh, manipulated or skewed by um, AI in the future. And uh, Balaji Srinivasan has also commented on this before. He has a bunch of threads on this as well, too. Um, but I think like in, in the near future, we might see um, that like publication may, may look more like um, openly sharing your artifacts and attesting them on chain so that other researchers will at least be able to see all your code and data. They'll be able to see all your research artifacts um, openly. They'll be able to computationally reproduce your results. But then also if they want to like trace back the on-chain information supply chain to see that you have certified and attested to the legitimacy of this information. And it's through this, and through being like as open as possible by publishing your research as open as possible um, that you kind of earn the trust that, that it is legit or not. And this is exactly what we're building at Scholar. Um, a way to publish your research in a way that is op as open and as transparent as possible and easy for other researchers to verify. So it's sort of like a verification layer for the code and data that you're publishing. And I'll show a quick demo of what we're working on here too. Um, if you just go onto our site, there's like a pretty straightforward button right there to hop into the demo that we have on our site. Um, but basically what we did is we took a pretty famous machine learning paper, uh, Deep Residual Learning for Image Recognition, and we created this like verification layer on top of it, where you can see all the latest results, but then you can also dig into reproduce results with one click. Oops, that kind of goes off screen, doesn't it? Um, where, yeah, where you can verify results with one click. In the future, we also want to, to, be, to be able to change some of the inputs and um, parameters to the research here too. So you can test the robustness of the results under different assumptions. Um, and then also see all the different like computational reproductions and replication of this research too. So be able to dig into what other people have reproduced under different assumptions and just see how robust these results um, are. So essentially a tool for verifying the legitimacy of research much more easily. And then the other thing that we're doing is we're also going to be putting this data on chain to just like certify and verify the legitimacy of it. 
but yeah, that's just like a quick demo of what we're working on. We're going to be working on improving it um, over like the next couple of months and years and whatnot. Um, but yeah, that's like a quick prototype of what we've got up so far. So yeah, the next piece that I'm going to be touching on is replication markets. This one is probably like a little bit easier to understand, um, but it's kind of like a crowd determined estimate of how replicable research is. We saw it happen with the LK99 superconductor paper. And this is not even like a new idea per se. Robin Hansen was perhaps the first on it and Vitalik Buterin has touched on it as well. But I think a new implementation may just be newly feasible with crypto. And I think replication markets will be especially useful when it's not feasible to fully replicate the research. Maybe it's too resource intensive or too cost intensive to fully replicate the research. So at least we can have an estimate on how replicable people think it is. Um, we could perhaps even weight it by experts within the field. Um, so it looks more of like a replication review than a peer review. And even just on-chain publication and replication markets themselves, I think are going to be quite useful in this future world where AI rolls our ability to determine and to discern the legitimacy of a lot of research. But I think there's also an, there's some there's some longer term trends in automation and um, energy costs that I think it would be useful to lean into to also minimize the long term cost to replicate research. So I'll first start with the observation that technology as a whole makes experimentation and replication cheaper. Um, by automating things, we reduce costs and um, it becomes cheaper as a whole to like experiment and replicate research. And I think this trend of automation will probably be quite pronounced over the next two decades um, because there's some big technological innovations that are just on the horizon. And, and the big one, the big technological innovation there is um, humanoid robots. Um, and there are some companies that are positioning themselves to reach quite massive levels of scale on the order of millions of robots a year. And uh, I think that will enable us to one, like substitute a lot of human labor with machine capital, but also it, it, it'll like more broadly um, reduce the cost to um, like do experiments and, and like do replications more broadly. And the other big trend too, is that we're probably gonna see over the next two decades is lower cost energy through the mass implementation of solar panels, but also through nuclear adoption as well too. And uh, increases in automation and low cost energy kind of feed into each other to dramatically reduce the cost um, of experimentation over, over the next like two decades or so. And I think the, the net result of that is that we're going to have a lot more resources to allocate towards experimentation and replication as well too. Like currently we're very resource constrained in science um, where everybody is mainly just focused on um, pushing out new publications, pushing out new novel publications. And so we don't have a lot of latent resources to allocate towards um, ensuring the replicability of existing research and ensuring the rig rigor of the research that, that is out there. And I think this increased abundance um, through um, lower cost energy and through more automation uh, will we'll alleviate some of those issues over, over the next two decades or so. We're gonna have much more capacity to potentially replicate research. And in theory, we could also use this increased bandwidth to even replicate important historical research. Um, so maybe research that's like highly cited, but very contentious and important to um, be able to know whether it's legit or not in our historical scientific record. Um, so I think we, we might have much more resources to go back and even like re-audit a lot of our scientific research as well too. And so this is sort of the vision, a potential vision for the future that I, I'd want to leave you with. And it's, and it's the vision of the future that I am personally trying to push towards and a future that I think will probably be needed in the face of these big technological changes, especially with AI. And so I'm independently either building, supporting, or evangelizing each one of these. Um, so if any of these interest you and you want to either like talk about it or help out, like please feel free to reach out. Um, you can find our company website there. You can check out our demo there as well. Um, if you're interested in like providing feedback on that as well, like feel free to reach out. Um, otherwise you can also find me at uh, manveer.xyz. Um, hopefully this was a, a little bit different and like unique potential perspective on where scientific research is going and what tools we can build um, for that future. Um, but yeah, otherwise like, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks so much, Mandy. That was that was awesome. Like a little glimpse into the future and and potentially where things are headed. 
Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in, in the Q&A, but um, I'll, I'll start this off. So um, so you mentioned a lot about LK99, and that was mm -hmm. a really crazy two-week sprint where, you know, everyone kind of rallied together in the scientific community, uh, mm -hmm. even outside the scientific community. And so the big push there was, will it replicate? You had a bunch of third parties coming in. Everyone was trying to replicate because... Presumably, the impact of that research was so high that people mm -hmm. felt inclined to want to reproduce it and replicate it of their own volition with their own resources, because the unlock that it would come would come of that would be vast for personally, probably for them, but also just generally. So mm -hmm. I guess my questions would be, so uh, that's like kind of a corner case, right? That's like the 0.0001%. So now you yeah, have exactly. all these publications that are coming out and a lot of them need to be reproduced, but there isn't that kind of guttural drive from different scientists to try to reproduce it because the impact isn't going to be this big stepwise increase in like how superconductors are made. So exactly, yeah. The idea on like how do you begin thinking about incentivizing the reproducibility of a, a bunch of things that might not have that big of an impact but are still impactful in some way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a definitely, it's a definitely a good question. And yeah, I do, I do think that it won't be realistic for us to just like replicate all new research that gets published. Um, one, like all new research just isn't potentially like even impactful enough to be able to allocate all those resources towards it. Um, it's, it's kind of the reason why I mentioned the other two alternatives of like both um, on-chain publication, but also replication markets too, where I think a lot of research, it won't make sense to allocate a lot of resources to fully replicate. Um, but at the very least, um, it would be useful for researchers to share their work in a much more open and transparent way so we can know whether it's legitimate or not. I might at least be able to like computationally reproduce results and like test the robustness of those, of those results, um, but also like have potentially like replication markets to guess and like um, to bet on the potential replicability of that research as well too. Um, yeah, and I, I know Research Hub is doing some stuff on shifting incentives as well too. So I won't like um, delve too deeply into that, but at least from my perspective, I think these are two like technological solutions that could be helpful for, for all the other cases that aren't that corner case. <laughs> yeah, I think definitely hand in hand between those two things you can, and, and I think some things that might build up into say like a lot of volume comes into a replication market you kind of get the inclination a lot of people are interested in it and maybe mm -hmm. like a, you know reproducibility experiment is warranted at that point oh yeah 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 exactly if there's if there's a lot of people like putting a lot of money towards betting on the reproducibility of some work then there's like a financial incentive to then replicate that work for sure yeah yeah absolutely and i think the replication replication markets can guide our um Kind of perception on what needs to be um kind of what what needs to be incentivized versus what's sufficient for just the reproducibility market or the replication market. oh yeah for sure yeah that's actually a good point yeah okay do we have any uh questions here from the audience or uh ricardo if you want to have anything you want to mention as well feel free to Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for um, you know, for the for the talk. It's been it's been amazing. I mean, we we talked about this uh, a bit already. So yeah. you know, <laughs> about you know reproducing reproducing studies. So I basically see the same challenges that you you went through. I'm actually really looking forward to to a solution. I don't know if we'll come out of uh, what you're building, what we're trying to do with you know incentivizing uh, this kind of behaviors. But I feel like this the, the overall way in this in, in which the scientific uh, space and the publishing space is changing could uh, lend us a helping hand in you know finding a way to also make science more reproducible in the future so uh, kind of like you know kind of like a wishful thinking for the future but mm -hmm. you know hopefully that's that's what we what we got in the end yeah that's what we're building for <laughs> all right awesome well thanks so much manvir um i think we're coming up close to the next talk here. So yeah, thank you again. And um, yeah, we're going to go ahead and move on to uh, James Heathers now. Um, so yeah, Thank we're part of it.
Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, hopefully the rest of the conference goes well. All right, bye. Uh, so yeah, um, so we'll bring up James Heathers uh, up here and give him host privileges to do the share screen. Um, James, we've had the, the privilege of, uh, of meeting James and uh, our first meeting was, uh, was uh, as you guys will all find out, gonna be an enjoyable one. Um, but uh, James was most recently the chief scientific officer at Cypherskin Inc. Uh, which is actually a wearable health company. Um, and James has been uh, researching uh, research integrity problems for over a decade um, and has also developed popular statistical techniques for finding different inconsistencies in published work. So uh, really kind of a focus here on some of the meta science and what's going wrong in the world of science right now, um, and then potential ways of alleviating those things. Um, so if Twitter follower account means anything. James has got 20,000 followers um, and he's followed by um, the likes of people like Mark Andreessen and some uh, open science um, kind of pioneers such as uh, Brian Nosek of OSF. Um, James is a self-proclaimed loud MFer, and uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm really excited and curious to hear his presentation on who the, uh, the most dangerous scientist in the world is. So uh, what I can guarantee will be the most fun talk of uh, this entire uh, session. So James, good to have you here and uh, let us know who's the most dangerous scientist. How are you, Jeff? You good? Yeah, doing great. All right. Hello to everyone else in the room. I'd recognize a couple of names. Thank you for reeling off how many people are on my twirtles. Um, to be quite honest, I have I have no idea. I treat that like I treat many other things in life. I open it, yell into it, and then disappear again. To me, it's kind of like a cupboard where I can't find something. So <clears throat> can you see that okay? Yep, 1984. Super. So this is a this is a talk that I'm planning on giving more when Jeff said you should definitely come and uh and tell us about this. I thought, oh what a super shit hot opportunity to actually start working through uh, some of these things from scratch as I'm presently planning on doing a little bit more of this and now here we are. Uh, to my lasting dissatisfaction, I like to write long titles for talks um, because they give me pleasure. So the most dangerous scientist in the world reflections of a vindictive little bastard on scientific integrity by me, Dr. James Heather's vindictive little bastard. So we're going to have to unpack that. Uh, to to a minor degree. Um, I should probably introduce myself to a minor degree. Yeah, I've done. I've been working in startups for the last five years, but before that, I was a research scientist. Before that, I was a postdoc. Before that, I was a PhD student. I've always been very interested in the question of whether or not science is accurate, and because I am of a certain uh, what I've come to accept is my piratical nature. Um, I'm most interested in times where it's actually gone wrong. And I was talking to people about this previous and said, so, well, you, you you go out into the world and then you uh, you look for things that are wrong or people give you tips on where to look for things that are wrong. And then you try and figure out how they're wrong with various computational methods. Uh, and then you sort of make trouble. Apparently that makes me a privateer and not a pirate. So same same difference, I'll take it. Probably comes with a nicer coat. But my PhD was in 2015, uh, conferred in 2015. And I've been, I've been doing this work sort of on and off from before that and on an ongoing basis and really still even now. So the approach to it has changed over time. And I feel like after 10 years, give or take, it's about time I delivered something approximating a retrospective, which is you're going to see is something of a work in progress. So let's talk about Vindictive Little Bastard. This is from an article in, uh, I think, about 2018 in the uh, uh, Chronicle of uh, Higher Education. So <clears throat> so you can see from these marvellous little quotes here, um, yes, the first one, perfectly accurate. Uh, Psychologists used to talk about their next clever study. Now they fret about whether their findings can withstand withering scrutiny. Um, also accurate, I think just uh, the place where I would disagree with other people is that I think that's an absolutely brilliant thing. Um, and other people, not so much. 
Um, you have no idea how many people are debating leaving the field because of these thugs. Uh, that's me. Uh, well, me and people like me. I'm going to say we from here on. A tenure psychologist, the one who called them human scum, told me. It's nice to be called human scum by someone with tenure. Um, it's uh, really, really gives you a warm feeling like you're doing something right. And then, of course, uh, didn't want me to use his name because he's afraid the data thugs will go after him. They're vindictive little bastards, he said. So that's my second favorite insult that's ever been published about me. Little's wrong. I'm like 280, 285. So I don't like the little part, which is vindictive. Big bastard doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, and us, the we that I talked about before, people who are interested in what we call forensic metascience, where you proactively investigate what goes wrong with science more broadly, have been called all sorts of names. Um, and there have been all sorts of opinions expressed about uh, the people who do this work. And this is my second favorite, vindictive little bastard. So a quick digression. If you're a whistleblower, there are some things that you need to be very, very well aware of. And this is why they always recommend that you talk to a lawyer uh, as soon as humanly possible who has experience in this uh, area of law, because there's a, a a kind of a confluence of interests between, say, a laboratory or a company or an organization that you work for and their rights and the rights of the public and the legal system to be able to prosecute a whistleblowing case. Right. So I've dealt with a lot of scientific whistleblowers, and I think there's three main pieces of advice that are the kind of the cut through that you should tell people who are in that situation. Number one, know your rights, as just explained. Number two is what I call shut up and hurry, which is don't talk to anyone. Don't give any outward uh, appearance that something is amiss. But at the same time, you don't know how you don't know how long your job is going to last. A lot of the time, you don't know how the environment that you're in is going to degrade over time professionally. Um, they may just start firing people left and right. Uh, they may figure out something is the problem uh, and terminate you. Uh, you may get put on a project that you don't want, et cetera. So you need to gather the information that you're going to gather in order to do uh, the service of uh, making sure that uh, the public is, is being well served, presumably by people who are either taking their money or defrauding them. And number three, document, document, document. And this one hits home for me because ignoring this is how I lost the best insult ever that I ever got. And now I have to go from memory. And this is really disappointing. And I hesitate to talk about it because I don't have documentary evidence for this. You're just going to have to trust me. So we're doing this work a few years ago. Uh, this is Nick Brown and myself, mostly him, but uh, you know, I helped. Uh, we were looking at the work of a social scientist from France who it seemed was incredibly prolific, wrote a whole bunch of sole author papers, and they're the, exactly the kind of, of papers that would probably make a DSI person reasonably suspicious. Uh, small, neat results about things that were kind of headline catching, but don't really matter. Um, never published with data, never published with sort of a broader, uh, bro a broader access to anything that's behind the, uh, the curtain, the veil of research. Um, so this is actually where some of the data techniques that Nick and I came up with and published, and there's papers on this, you can look them up some other time. Um, this is actually where they came from doing this work. So this is all these things that you see, all these different um, uh, different newspapers and websites and the rest of it, um, about 2017 to 2018. So we're doing this work. And I gave some particularly inflammatory interview, which I don't remember where it was, um, which basically said, well, we don't know how common this behavior is and we need to change scientific culture because having closed elements of it is terrible. And once everything is rigidly opened up, then um, maybe we'll just start to see how many people are fraudulent and should be thrown down a flight of stairs. Um, you know, something glib and Australian that doesn't really fit. So all of this is happening. It's getting plenty of press and someone writes to me and I wish I could remember who this was. All I remember is that they was a dude and they were Dutch. They had a, a .nl address. Um, 
and they wrote because I mean, the Dutch people are, I, I love Dutch people. They're incredibly forthright. They'll look you right in the eye and tell you everything that you've done is terrible. Um, it makes it very easy to get through the day when you know where people stand. Um, so what you're doing is destructive and dangerous and um, you're, you're literally undermining the scientific enterprise. You should stop. Now, when people write bollocks to me on the internet, I have very mature responses. So I said, I think I probably did in fact send this exact Pingu meme on the basis that I am not particularly interested in your opinion. And they came back at me with the epic, if you continue doing this work, I think you were the most dangerous scientist in the world, which is so unnecessarily butch. Um, because it's very much not the case. It's a very David Brent thing to say. But imagine what, what does the background of the scientific enterprise have to be when you are volunteering your time to find elements of it that are legitimately wrong, that are either they're wildly inaccurate to the point where they shouldn't exist or they're actively fraudulent. And often you can't tell the difference between the two. It's one or the other, but it doesn't change the eventual accuracy of it. You're doing that work and someone thinks that's such a terrible idea that out of all the scientists in the world, including the ones who presumably work on weapons programs, that I'm the dangerous one. And that's obviously very much not the case. But that's the environment that we've built for ourselves in this enterprise where someone can say that to me in good conscience and not feel ridiculous. I'm not sure how that's possible. And I'm going to spend the next 20 ish minutes trying to convince you that there are some very, very big problems in the scientific enterprise. And I will also be including why I think the people who are on this particular conference call are part of the solution. So let's get away from the memes. I've said we before, who is we? We is anyone in this case who works in forensic meta science. And we have to call it something. So both of these words are probably words that people will be familiar with. Forensic, obviously. Meta science, um, just for the record, the systematic study of the scientific enterprise using scientific methods. And you can see what forensic would imply in that particular point in time, because what you're doing is going into elements of published papers or the, the metadata that surrounds the individual publications taken en masse, so kind of scientometric methods, uh, the numerical elements of any given paper, and of course the words themselves, and looking in them for problems within the publication. So I split these into four categories that cross over to a certain degree. Um, obviously. Really, really quick, Jack, trying to share screen on anything by any chance? Yes. Okay, because there hasn't been a share screen. Um, well, that's very, that's very bad. Yeah, we enjoyed the monologue, but um, we'll get... <laughs> <laughs> oh dear me and i can't see when the thing is on okay is that behaving itself better yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, oh dear me okay i wish you'd said previously well to talk about this is uh, there's probably a replication joke in here but now i'm burning my time so let's do this real fast watch this okay so blah 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 vindictive me, vindictive little bastard. Uh, advice to whistleblowers, know your rights, shut up and hurry, document. I didn't document. I lost a copy of my best insult ever. Uh, I was doing some meta scientific work. It was going very well. Someone wrote to me to tell me it was a terrible idea. I was a child about it because I thought they were being ridiculous. They called me the most dangerous scientist in the world. I think that is unnecessarily butch and hairy chested and ridiculous. Um, and now we're on a slide about how all the different areas of forensic medicine work together to detect problems in scientific culture and papers more broadly. Recap over. Let me tell you why it matters. Presumably you can see this now. Yes. Super. Okay, let's talk about the plague. 
So this is the hydroxychloroquine story. Um, everyone's probably familiar with this to at least a moderate degree because it was very loud for a while, wasn't it? Um, there was a, an initial preprint right at the start of the plague that said it's good fun to uh, it's good fun to treat uh, people who are sick in hospital and recovering from COVID nineteen. This is the original strain, the OG, uh, the original Coke COVID. Um, this this works. Uh, it's endorsed in South America. They fire the Brazilian health minister because he does, doesn't want to give it out to people. Um, various political leaders uh, endorse it. Um, they test it. Uh, this is during which the, the FDA has a, issued an emergency use order so you can actually get it. Um, eventually that stops because they're running a big trial called Solidarity that shows it doesn't work at all. Um, the, the 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 partial results of that showed that it was terrible the eventual results of that uh showed that it was um it, it just it just wasn't working at all um and after the first year the who in about a year the who issues a strong recommendation against actually using it and at that particular point in time there's a particular online pharmacy called ravku uh who were rolled up with one of the uh charming groups of doctors who were advocating for the use of this particular drug without what we would consider to be good evidence etc cetera, etc cetera. continuing all the way to the present day to some degree here's the question when did we know this research couldn't be trusted and the answer is there and i'm really annoyed with that arrow because i can't get it two days from the publication of that with the pixels on the screen i'm going to need a bigger screen to get the damn thing closer now what do i mean by that i mean that when that original paper was published all of the people who are in the sort of community that are interested in scientific accuracy all showed up to look through how the pieces of that study worked. And they left a wonderful thread on Pub Peer that is now really interesting historical reading, where there were some really glaring and obvious data and process problems within that particular study. It should have been the start of nothing. It should have, it should never have been the 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 paper that launched a thousand scripts. I just thought of that. Oh, that's that's fun. I'm keeping that. That should never have happened. It was it was very bad. I'm not going to read all of these things out. Uh, I promise you, you can go and have a good time looking on the pub peer record of this one for yourself. Everything was going very very badly for that particular team of researchers, and yet all of this happened anyway, and we knew there. As in, we were quite certain that there was absolutely no reason to assume that a paper that was just poorly performed and potentially dishonest because it was described in two different uh, two different ways in two different sources at an absolute minimum, uh, something that's this important probably should have the same sample size regardless of where it's being presented uh, and the data handling should be completely explicit. Neither of those things were true in a way where you would be very upset with an undergraduate who presented you with a preliminary and then an eventual piece of research where they, the pieces didn't match up properly. So that was tremendously problematic and we knew Again, I'm going back to the sort of collective we of the people, the people who are interested in forensic medicine science as an area. We knew two days afterwards. And then we had everything that we had after that. But let's not stop there and sort of talk about the issue of important. Let's continue to go through another drug in our particular, of the fun that we had during COVID with these things. This is a... Uh, this is a meta-analysis of uh, randomized trials for the treatment of ivermectin. Um, significant effect on viral clearance, borderline significant effect on duration of hospitalization. Probably two very good things on the way through. Um, only minor problem uh, is that a wide variety of these, of these trials, I think we, we stopped really counting when we got to, I think, five uh of the trials that were internal to that particular matter analysis were not well conducted and some of them were sufficiently fraudulent to the extent where one of them had patients who died before the trial started um this was sort of an environment of accuracy uh that was well reproduced in some of these other papers to say the least so the people who did this meta analysis redid it and published this wonderful figure 
where if we look at the uh, improvement of survival on the y-axis here, and then we remove the potentially fraudulent studies, and then we remove the high-risk studies, and then we remove the occasionally concerning studies, we go from a significant p-value to a really wildly non-significant p-value. Um, and you might have noticed the titles changed a little bit here as well. Uh, it's gone from this is a meta-analysis to this is a meta-analysis where we ad address potential bias and medical fraud. Not great really not great. Um, and both of these eventually turned out to be expressions of a third thing, which I call the cuckoo bird problem. Now, cuckoos are really interesting, and they're not the only breed that do this, but they're certainly the most famous one. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds, and then other birds raise those chicks with the rest of their brood. And you can see that's a cowbird that's done it there on the left, minor difference in the egg. And then eventually, as you can see on the right-hand side, minor, minor difference in the size between the mother on the right-hand side and the baby cuckoo that's on the left. So there's a, there's a metaphor here. There is a, a big, unusual, and highly unlike its peers, contribution to uh, a kind of basket. And in this case, I'm talking about a basket of scientific studies. So let's take that metaphor and use it. This is a paper from 2014 uh, from Daryl France, uh, Francis Research Group, Buri et al. This is an absolutely marvelous paper. It's about whether or not people who have a heart condition should take perioperative beta blockers. Now, they decrease work that happens to the heart, which is good if you've got a cardiac problem, but at the same time, they increase the risk of stroke. So which is more dangerous on aggregate determines what our eventual uh, decision about the recommendation of the drug should be. Now, if you look carefully on the top there, where I've got the little fly catcher on the left-hand side, and look at the bottom of the risk ratio, you can see that the conclusion without the problematic studies that we're about to see um, is that in general these these beta blockers that seem to be uh, seem to be dangerous and they seem to be contributing to something problematic here. But if we include these two decreased trials, and these are very famous in meta scientific circles for having all sorts of problems, and uh, came out of a, uh, a lab in the Netherlands about a, a decade and a bit ago, and there were several of them over time, and you can see that. Uh, the risk ratio is completely the wrong way around. So what it essentially amounts to is if we're taking a meta-analysis and we parcel up a whole series of studies that have one conclusion, and then we include a fake or a problematic or a wildly inaccurate one that has a different conclusion, and we mash them all together, they end up changing the eventual outcome. And that's a cuckoo bird problem. And this happened most likely for hydroxychloroquine in some sense, and it very definitely happened in ivermectin. And it, this is also, I mean, I have, I have other examples of this as well, but this is, I've been working on limited time here. Now, when it comes to danger, I think we can retire the whole idea of the dangerous scientist thing. This is very silly. If we're going to talk about danger, I think this is the most dangerous research integrity problem that's going around. Not the most common because we have regular garden variety, pea hacking and harking and data forgetting and all sorts of other things that are common and problematic, yet not particularly dangerous. It's certainly not the one that's worse for the sort of collective public perception of science, but this very definitely is the one that's most likely to kill people. So the most dangerous scientist in the world, I think this is the most dangerous problem in the world. The idea that there is simply not enough scrutiny on individual studies to be able to avoid adding them on aggregate to big bags of other studies where they will ruin their conclusions. And the problem with this, the reason that it's the most dangerous, and why that's the, the, the operative word here, is very simple, and it's because a lot of the time these eventual conclusions are things like society guidelines for should we do a therapy, should we do a drug, uh, should 
should we behave in this particular way during the recovery of some person who's actually ill? Obviously, I'm talking about medical research at this point in time. It's very hard to kill people with bad archaeology research. Someone's probably tried. It didn't work out. This is where the party is. So that being the case, this whole pantheon of problems, and obviously I've, I've, I've skipped around a lot in the last half hour to try and get to this point. How all the pieces of this fit together individually are all directly affected by problems that decentralized science involves, which is something that I'm very interested in until incredibly recently, simply have not had the time and uh, opportunity and bandwidth to become more familiar with. I'm very much looking forward to doing that. Um, but what specifically are the problems that I'm talking about? Siloed data and the lack of patient level data. Um, the unbearable slowness of the publication system, especially when I, mean, I could tell you some marvelous stories about those ivermectin papers or when a paper was published and you write to the editors within 72 hours and it takes them three months to correct the paper. But at that point in time, you've seen a uh, South American government has made the decision to start handing the drug out like M&Ms uh, because there was extra clinical evidence that it worked. Well, there wouldn't be if people could uh, update their journals more quickly because we're not talking about a nice federated universe of interconnected nodes where uh, researchers are empowered to make changes for themselves. We're talking about something that's gated by someone who doesn't want to talk to someone like me. Obviously, your way is better, gang. Like, no one's going to argue about that. And I wish you every success in building it because citizen science is presently not empowered with this ecosystem to participate in the big narratives. If it was, we would never have had the problems that we did with hydroxychloroquine to start with. That was simply, a, it, was, it was a bad idea. The research on it was terrible and there was not a megaphone or a system big enough to make that point as the issue became more broadly discussed. I'm not sufficiently cynical that I think that, uh, well, no one can be reached. People are gonna make up their mind and conspiratorial ideation will do the rest. No, or at least not to the same degree. We have figures of authority that we all accept for a reason. I think the easiest way for them to have authority is, is for it to be legitimately derived from a system where everyone is an equal participant. So if you're all out there in a very different way to me, but in, in many respects similar in the fact that you are trying to empower the individual pieces within the kind of network of the scientific commons to be able to point out things that are wrong, expurgate the information that is available and make sure that the funding and the attention is democratized, then um, I'm very happy to meet everyone. Now, I think we've got a couple of minutes left and I'm out of shit. <clears throat> so how about it? Uh, that was awesome, James. Um, and like a, a very like, I think enjoyable way of uh, pressing and pushing on uh, a tender spot in science. Um, one question I had was, um, and you, you brought this up at the end and I really liked the way you framed it, which is um, the megaphone. So right now the megaphone is placed on a lot of like the prestige in some of the high-end journals. Um, and it seems like the people who often have some pretty knowledgeable insight um, often get muffled um, in, I don't know, the communication route to be able to portray what they're thinking about. So how do we, what's, so, okay, we know the, the big problem here. Um, so how do we readjust where that megaphone is to be able to give attention to people who are saying the right things? And then what cost does that come with in, because nothing's perfect. So your megaphone might, mm. some people who might not need a megaphone nope. It's a, good, it's, a good, it's a good question. There's a short-term and a long-term answer to that. The short-term answer is we don't have anyone who does the sort of work that me and mine do, who is really empowered, who has a public position where they're allowed to talk about these things. There are things that are close. The Science, me the science Media Centre in the UK comes immediately to mind. But again, we're talking about people who are sort of claiming the mantle of authority. Eventually, 
eventually what we have is something that it looks a lot like a re replication market where there's an aggregate measure of something. Yeah. And not just a matter of, I mean, even, even the idea that 10,000 people who were fully informed could actually be voting on something and would themselves be uh, extremely well informed. You think about what would happen if you, for any given pub peer thread, if there was a replication market on the outcome of what eventually was going to happen, happen to that in the first place. The vast majority of the time, the, the, the dial would either be at 100% or zero. Because a lot of problems with an individual piece of science are binary. Yeah? If I, if I add it all up wrong, and the methodology that I've used is flawed past a certain point, I haven't actually established anything. I haven't gone from zero to one. Uh, and it's not a question of going from zero to a half. We've just gone nowhere. You just basically put words and numbers in order to the achievement of nothing at all. So the, the eventual ability to put that in public is powered somehow by a, a commonality of people who are able to understand it, right? Who would you rather have? At least say, at least say there's a new novel virus and we have the ability to ask 10,000 virologists who are all intimately involved with the understanding of, of uh, uh, its, its uh, structure, uh, the problems that it causes, function, uh, transmissibility, et cetera. They have literally all of that information and it's appropriately structured and it's in front of them. And then they're asked to make uh, a decision by some mechanism. The, the problem with getting there, and the reason that I say this is like a, a singular authority in the short term, is that what we do, the whole idea of let's take a piece of science and then kick its tires, is not something that's ever really done in peer review. It is a, a little, a little bit by specific individuals, but it's not what people are trained to do. It's certainly not part of the culture of what peer review is supposed to mean. Peer review is not for that. A lot of people think it is. That's a very naive thing to think. And I can understand why people do, because it sounds like it should be. But look, mate, I have published plenty of papers with accompanying data, because I think that's what you're supposed to do. And in two of those occasions, I have had a code and data repository where I realized I haven't made the code and data repository public. I just forgot to click the button. I'm the sort of person who forgets to click buttons. And what that means is both of those papers sailed right the way through peer review, and no one even thought to open the code that would run on the data that I sent to be able to do the peer review in the first place. And that, as a kind of a cultural item, is the thing that really, the mentality and the tools and the environment that leads you there is the center of what really has to change. Yeah, very well said. Um, we're going to do, we'll do a quick one for the next minute or two, uh, and then we've got to move on to the next panel, but this one's from the audience. Um, so is DSI, and maybe um, since you're just getting into it, this might be uh, kind of a little bit of hand-waving here for you, but is DSI doing a good job at explaining its goals and scope to a general scientific research audience? It seems like these problems are obvious and potential solutions are identified, but maybe that's not commonly understood outside of the field. Okay, I think if I said yes to that, you'd probably take it too seriously. And what I mean by that is, all of these things are long games. Every single thing within, within the entire milieu, problems that I think about, the problems that you think about, the problems you're probably involved in at work, they're all long games and we're all impatient. I get that, I'm wildly impatient. I have to fight it as an active cognitive process. My frontal lobes get a lot of work teaching me how to not be impatient about things. So, so far, has it resonated well? Not really. Is that a problem in the short term? Also, not really. Yeah, there's that it does it does seem obvious to me, but I'm the silly gonad who spent the last ten years staying up until two in the morning because I just want to see what the uh, what the covariate structure of some paper that was published looked like because I'm just curious and difficult person. So it makes sense to me. And has it traveled more broadly? Well, it's very hard for things to travel more broadly. Let's have the kind of patience that's implied by doing what doing the like the change in the landscape here is going to eventually uh is going to eventually provide 
I think what more than anything else, like if I think of things like this when it comes to sort of cultural terms, a little bit like startups. In the fact that people want to start and then, you know, they think, well, you know, it's May. I think by about October, I'll be Jeff Bezos. No, you won't. You won't. That's not going to happen. You won't. You're going to, the first 18 months is going to make you want to throw yourself off the white cliffs of Dover into the sea. You want to, want to, <laughs> it's, it's going to be really, really, really difficult. What you, I, I honestly think that one of the single best things that you can do, if, you're, if that's something that concerns you, is you want to pick these, that there's going to be a confluence of circumstances and problems where a solution that you offer works way better than anything else where there aren't any structural barriers for people who, who, who want to participate in it, where there's actually a need. And especially in an environment like this, where people have the ability, where they are empowered to get away from the traditional academic cultural answer to something, right? So don't worry about, does everyone get it? Eventually, like that's going to be how it is. Find the tribe of people for whom you really solve a problem who are going to be your psychotic adopters, the people who are really going to care and make them happy. And then do that again, and then do that again, and then start to think about network effects. Yeah? Or, you know, hire a, hire a team of ghostwriters and uh, just start filling the internet. Or maybe maybe, maybe you could use ChatGPT these days, you know, a large language model about all the problems with scientific culture. Um, and you know, have some have some fun. Fill the internet with more rancid garbage. It'll be a laugh. That's yeah, sarcastic. I didn't mean any of that. Okay, no one do that. All right, we're done. We'll all get our burner phones as recommended by James. Um, yeah. Uh, no, thank you so much, James. That was a, a real special treat. Uh, appreciate it so much. We're uh, gonna have to just to stay on track. Bounce over to the next panelist, which stop, starts in the next minute. So. Uh, very nice to meet you all. I'm extremely easy to find. If you want to talk about anything like this, I promise you, I'm a, I'm a Google search away. We don't have business cards anymore because it isn't 1985. Find me if you need me. I'll see you all later. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll pass it over to you, Ricardo, for um, the next steps here. Yeah, let me reclaim host privileges. And I'll bring in the panelists. I see them all here. Hello, hello. James, Jason, Adam, how are you doing? Fantastic. Hey, you doing? Great. I just coached my daughter's six year old soccer team. So that's why my, that's why I got the, Oh, the shirt. Oh. <laughs> so we're still waiting for uh, Joseph. We can maybe um, wait a few minutes. Uh, I'll start by giving a little intro so that we can wait in the, at the same time. So yeah, um, everyone. Hello, Mel. Welcome to our Investing in DSI panel. This is our second and last panel for the day. Uh, two more panels will come tomorrow. One about AI and research and the other one about BioDAOs. So today we're happy to have uh, Joseph, waiting for him, uh, Adam Draper from Boost VC, Jason Fang from Sora Ventures, and James Brody for, from ID Theory. Uh, thank you all for coming to speak at SciCon 2023. I see some new faces. I see some familiar faces as well. So it's really a pleasure to have you here. I'll let you guys introduce yourself in a minute uh, so that you can tell us a bit more about what you do. Um, but first, let me make a little uh, disclaimer here. So everything that will be said today does not constitute legal or financial advice. You should always do your own research and due diligence. And the panelists today uh, will be expressing their own opinions. Also, this panel has been designed to be uh, interactive. So uh, for the audience, we'll have like, you know, 10, 15 minutes at the end for, you know, questions for the panelists and, you know, um, for you guys, I'll be asking questions. Uh, questions are directed to you all, so feel free to jump in if, if there's anything that uh, you want to say. Uh, so that said, let me double check if we have Joseph here. Uh, or I guess, yes, here he is. Here he is. Fantastic. Awesome, awesome. 
Hi, Joseph. Can you hey. can? You... Yep. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for coming to speak at SciCon. My pleasure. So I was just getting started uh, with introductions. So I would say at this this point, you you can start. Uh, tell us a bit about you know a bit more about yourself, and then you know uh, James, Adam, uh, Jason uh, can do the same. Cool. Um, Joseph Jacks. I started uh, OSS Capital five years ago. We're the uh, only fund exclusively investing in open source startups. Um, we've done a couple of Web3 crypto investments, um, one of them being the uh, seed of Research Hub um, a few years in after Brian Armstrong was uh, you know, kind of funding it himself and building a team. And um, I think we announced that investment uh, fairly recently. We've also invested in Parallel, which is a sci-fi card game. Um, and they're they're doing pretty well, but in general, my um, focus tends to be more on finding exciting open source projects on GitHub and uh, building sort of B two B software companies around them. So yeah, that's my intro. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Hi there. Yeah, uh, I'm James Brody. Um, I spent ten years doing drug discovery uh, for a British biotech company. Um, I'm a geneticist by training. It was halfway through that journey that I discovered Bitcoin in 2013 and the wonders of decentralization and really recognized what the technology could do for not only my industry, but, but many other industries. Um, I launched ID Theory with my co-founder, Graham Stanton, in 2019. And we're a crypto native fund uh, investing primarily in crypto assets and DAOs. Um, and I also summoned Beaker DAO, which is a, a DeSci focused investment DAO. Great. Is it my turn? Sorry. Your, your turn, Evan. Yeah. Um, my name is Adam Draper. I'm the founder and managing director of uh, Boost VC. We write 500K checks into pre seed deep tech deals. My journey to DeSci was probably through crypto. Uh, I was the first, I was the first investor in Coinbase and a uh, hundred other crypto related startups. I realized that uh, with the waves of cryptocurrency adoption came from different creator classes. The last one was NFTs and, and uh, entertainment. And I am making a pretty large bet on the fact that uh, the next wave will be an underserved creator class that doesn't have a good business model, which is scientists. And so we've backed, uh, we're part of the round that Joseph led of the research hub. And then we've also backed Molecule and a couple others. So we're, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a venture capitalist. So like, you know, not a scientist. So uh, don't um, expect science things from me. Not be asking a lot of science questions, Jason. Yeah, so uh, I'm Jason Fang. I'm the founder of Sora Ventures. Um, we're a pure 100% crypto fund. Um, recently moved to Taiwan. Um, my background is I, I was one of the first guys at Finbushi Capital. I joined uh, late 2015 at Finbushi, um, and then moved to Shanghai in 2016 to help expand Ethereum, working very closely with Vitalik and the early developers for Ethereum Foundation. Um, and then kind of like the rise of ICO caught my first attention. Obviously, um, the things didn't, that we had a bit of uh, ups and downs, but in the process, I've learned a couple of things. Um, and, and that is, um, I think what we see in DeSci today has a lot of similarities to what we saw in, in, in ICO, where we backed a lot of incredibly smart people it just turns out that a lot of the first uh <clears throat> people we back are mostly from you know our dev developers right and so as met, as adam mentioned there's you know nfts and DeFi and then gaming that really popped um and you know we're we're, we're venture capitalists ourselves as, too, as well so we tend to look at things like three four years down the road and one of them is the side the other one that we've been extremely um bullish on is um Bitcoin utility, so ordinals and BRC20. But obviously very excited about DSI. Uh, we've, we've invested um, in three DSI bio DAOs now um, and um, also an investor in Research Hub as well. Awesome. I, I also want to say thank you for Research Hub for inviting me on this. And then, uh, and Jason was one of the first investors who told me that I need to buy Ethereum. So I should probably thank Jason also 
uh, on this. Probably thank him, yeah. Thank and it's a pleasure, honestly. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This is this is really a pleasure. Adam, we had you last year for the first edition of Psycon. So happy to have you for the second one as well. Yeah, now you now you just can't get rid of me. I'm just gonna Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So let's start by just like asking, a, I would say, a simple question, uh, but can have a lot of facets. Um, why are you investing in DeSci? What gets you excited about, about DeSci in general? So, um, yeah, Adam, start. <laughs> yeah, D <laughs> the decentralization of science in a lot of ways is really a, like, obvious to me uh, and is a lot of, in, in another way, it's really counterintuitive. It's like, they're just oh if you think about academia there's obviously just more people outside of academia and thus just the number of people there should be more scientists outside of academia um and that's the bet is like that if we give them the tools they need to be able to be uh non incentive driven by academia scientists we will have more breakthroughs uh and accelerating the rate of breakthroughs i believe is important to the world now, why am I? Um, my mission is to accelerate the sci-fi future. I think when you have scientific breakthroughs accelerating, that ends up building a better world for everyone, uh, whatever that might be. So I, I'm, you know, also, why aren't the scientists who invented all of the things the richest people on the planet? Like that that's also fundamentally the thing like why 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 you know watson and crick the you know all these scientists throughout time they never no one figured out they figured out how to create value and not capture it and fundamentally what DeSci is all about is figuring out how to uh capture your value while also creating the value so i think yeah that's not my thing but also just smart people like lots of smart people like even just these three people on the on the screen right now, like super smart. So I just follow smart people. Yeah, I agree. I mean, talent density in, in, in this size is pretty is pretty high. I would say, you know, probably, you know, one of the highest that I've, that I've seen around. So uh, any of you have any other opinion, like when you have any particular opinion, like why you're investing in the space, apart from, you know, everything that Adam said till now? Yeah, I'll add yeah. to um, what, what Adam <clears throat> said, you know, disruption of academia is one thing. I think the pharmaceutical industry is ripe for disruption too. You know, we need to move away from a model where shareholders are making decisions and into a model where those decisions are made by stakeholders. Decentralization is like the perfect kind of mechanism for collaboration and specifically really bio DAOs, where you can group together all of these stakeholders, align incentives and really push forward the development of medicines. Um, Within these DAOs, they're not only good for capital formation, but also contribution. And so you can start awarding people equity in the form of tokens of these DAOs for you know, inputs and uh, contributions beyond just that capital. So like, for example, um, you could have a registry of, of patients, a database, and by you know, them participating in clinical trials, they can earn equity too. So it really flattens the, the landscape for, for people to, you know, kind of benefit. And it's not just academics, but, but everybody, right? Patients, um, advocacy groups, manufacturers and suppliers of medicines, all of these people can come together and they can take equity stakes in these entities. Yeah. I mean, I agree 100%. I mean, me, myself, um, developing biomedical devices. So I completely feel you like I would love to, you know, include what, you know, could potentially be the patients, like use my devices and be rewarded for actually participating in the trials, which also is kind of hard to do. Like recruiting all the patients is hard to do. So like if you can financially reward them to do so, it's kind of like a win-win situation for both. <clears throat> so 100%, I feel like, you know, that's another pretty important area within this set and quite excited about. Jason, you, you were saying something. Yeah, so actually before kind of DSI became a term, um, you know, uh, Web3 funds were already investing in um, enterprise companies and blockchain um, that had to do with, you know, science, basically in general science. And a, a couple of examples, and actually, you know, the early days of, of, of Bitcoin, of, of Bitcoin, after Bitcoin was Bitcoin equity, which is mostly popular in 2018, uh, 2013, 2014, 2015, 
And in, in 2015, 2016, um, it was mostly blockchain enterprise. And, and most of the blockchain enterprise back then was actually these companies, um, there was biotech, there was IoT, there was a bunch of stuff, but most of them revolved around general science um, with maybe 10% or 15% blockchain utility and the remaining is more like the, kind of the regular web too. Um, the problem with, with a lot of these companies is <clears throat> I think the industry back then was way too early, right? The timing was wrong. Um, and and the, the audience around, you know, using Web3 basically at the time was really, uh, that didn't fit into place, right? And so with the rise of like gaming and entertainment of that being taken in place, I think that sets for like a, a, a entry point for the next, you know, vertical that gets into Web3. And as, I, like, as Adam mentioned, I do think that science will be obviously a no brainer because one, we have been investing in this sector as early as 2015, 2016. And now with the infrastructure and the audience uh, learning, there's a lot more in place. I do people will be much more, um, much more open to adopting Web3 um, technology and in, in, in a lot of the, the research they do. Um, and not just research too, and just like beyond that type category of file DAOs that we see today. Um, and you look at this like gaming industry versus the science industry, um, and you just look at all the PE ratio and everything from traditional Web2 models. You'll notice like obviously pharmaceutical companies and science companies in general are much larger as a, as a category than gaming companies. And so for that reason, I'm willing to bet into DSI, and I think that's going to be things for at least like the next five to eight years. Yeah, I mean, some of these companies have already made their bet. Uh, thinking about Pfizer, you know, that also, you know, invested in beta DAO. So it seems like some people are getting, you know, in, in, you know, within the stakeholders at least are getting also this feeling that is kind of like a match made in heaven. And it's just like needs to, uh, there be the time for this to happen. So I feel like, it's, it's more about how long it will take until, you know, we get all of these stakeholders, you know, including the scientists, which are probably the hardest category to actually get this and get on with the tools that we have already there uh, for them. I, I hadn't thought about it, Jason, that way. Uh, it's smart to think about it as uh, pharma is bigger than gaming. It's uh, I, just like logically, you're just like, hey, if we're going dis to disrupt something, do we need web? Is Web3 gaming going to be as big as Web3 pharma? Probably not, right? Like the, so just making those bets as an investor is sort of fascinating. I hadn't thought about it that way. So it's really smart. But I'm going to offer some thoughts on why I invested in research up. I agree with everything Adam and Jason and, and James were saying uh, generally. Um, I would just point back to, um, so it's pretty awesome that Brian Armstrong is the founder of um, Research Hub and someone who's just created immeasurable uh, um, opportunities and value for the world through Coinbase and democratizing access to crypto in general. But um, I just pasted the, um, the blog post that Brian wrote in February 2019, which is almost five years ago, five, five years coming up next, next February, on the impetus for the ideas that led to Research Hub and his partnership with Patrick and kind of building out the system. And that's really what um, caught my interest and made me most excited about it. And I, I kind of sent Patrick a message a year, year and a half ago uh, and change and, 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 you know, sort of expressed um, uh, support and interest in what they were doing and I had, had no um, uh, assumption or expectation that we'd ever end up investing. I just assumed that Brian would be funding this company forever because Brian Brian's pretty wealthy and he's passionate about this. Uh, but yeah, we ultimately ended up um, being fortunate to to fund um, fund the company. But I think this blog post really describes the original motivations and the thesis really well and kind of like says current scientific process is really broken on a lot of levels. Um, there's there's a lack of prioritization. Reproducibility is a huge problem. Um, we talked about the market incentives, like the, the sort of fundamental capitalism aspects are not built into the kind of the process of creating discoveries and inventions. And then obviously this, you know, creates really weird perverse incentives around the citation based system and sort of like, you know, peer review, um, slowing down a lot of the, of the, the potential progress that people can make. So it's, it's not like Research Hub is a fundamentally brand new, completely um, from scratch contribution, but it's something like that never really existed. And I think with all of the AI papers we've seen coming out, we've seen like archive be like super popular and under the under the spotlight around like where are all these artifacts and um, research papers actually getting published. But the problem with archive is it's kind of like if you looked at what GitHub was uh, without the sort of social network aspect or without a way of uh, allowing people to collaborate and communicate with each other, 
and kind of create metadata around the research artifacts. It's like if we if we had Git, GitHub, but just with a sort of Git workflow and uh, you know very basic file versioning, and that's it. Like if you didn't have any of the social features, um, obviously GitHub doesn't have um, incentivization features or sort of monetization features built in. But um, that's that's the thing I think that makes me really excited about Research Hub is kind of like I think one of you was saying like expanding the the size of uh, the market for people who can contribute to the scientific process and creating a venue for that, creating a place. That's actually super exciting. And I really don't know for sure ultimately what the you know business model or monetizations are uh, for this kind of thing long term. Um, there's obviously lots of exciting things that you can do with crypto uh, tokens and with uh, you know enterprise subscriptions and that kind of thing. But uh, right now it's more of a long term for me like bet on um, this movement actually being successful. And obviously there's a lot of companies driving a lot of interesting contributions on the infrastructure side and sort of domain specific areas of science and things like that are more bio-focused or things that are more um, targeted in other particular areas of the, of the science and research communities. Um, but yeah, that's generally why I get really excited about it. And sort of the, the concise thing is, is like trying to make science more like open source, more democratized and, and opening up access for sort of anyone to kind of contribute to that process and also connecting in like an, an, an inherent um, uh, incentive system so people can actually have mechanisms that connect their inventions like Adam was saying to being able to capture some value um, and I totally agree like I, you know I think history has given us so many examples of like whether it's Tesla or you know the the, the guys that discovered the DNA helix or like what you know whatever uh, fundamental inventions and then you had entrepreneurs or sort of not not so genius brilliant people decades years later um, kind of synthesize those inventions into products and services and kind of that's, I think that's, that's the modern understanding of, you know, market-driven capitalism. Uh, there are very few examples of, you know, people like Elon kind of, uh, who are brilliant in their own right, also taking other ideas, maybe incorporating and building on them. And I don't think there's anything really wrong with that at all. Both approaches are awesome. But um, what I do in my fund really aligns with the ethos and the vision for Research Hub, which is trying to actually connect the people who, who themselves made the scientific inventions um, also participate in the value capture process and give them tools that uh, make that possible um, in, in ways that weren't before. Yeah, I mean, we we have that uh, that blog post. We have it on our website. We call it the, the origin story because you know that's exactly how you know research came to life. So I, I also love that blog post. Uh, something that also Brian says, just like uh, taking what you were saying before, um, he wants to, research up to basically function more like open source software. Uh, with like very good, you know, very um, remarkable successes that we had. Do you see any similarity? What kind of similarities do you see, you know, between open science, open so open source software, and you know, this decentralized science movement that is, you know, just it's just like spinning up these days? Is there anything that you, you know the, the similar the similarities that you think that you and that you think are really relevant in between the three movements? I think there can be. So I mean, I'll just offer some thoughts, like open source software is sort of slightly different in the in the sense that the artifact for producing progress is uh sort of a common denominator across all the different ways in which uh, you know open source gets produced which is that you're, you're talking about a source code file a computer program that encodes you know some programming language in a, in a file whether it's a dot cpp file if you're writing c plus plus or you know if it's a uh uh, you know, a jar file, if you're writing Java, what have you, right? So like the code is the common denominator. I think in the scientific world, we don't have that common denominator, but you can potentially have like some similarities in terms of the way um, anyone could potentially contribute. Um, and any, any, any sort of individual on earth could sort of come up with an idea and make, make, make a contribution. Um, the challenge in, in the scientific community, which is I think fundamentally what Research Hub is looking to address is trying to create common artifact uh, primitives and a sort of atomic units of contribution so that we can start to try to get closer to how open source actually works. So open source, as invented by Richard Stallman, is specifically relegated to the world of software source code, right? Like you write a piece of software, you give it an open source license, and then that thing is open source. I think what we've seen in the last decade, which makes this movement kind of hard, but but al but also somewhat useful, but I think more, more largely difficult for actually making progress is there is not a common industry appreciation for what open source actually means. And so, um, you know, you have a lot of things that are called open source, but they're not actually open source. Like a good example is the llama weights. 
in the Llama model from, from Meta. This is not an open source piece of technology on a couple levels. One is it's not technically actually using an open source license, um, but two, um, you know, AI, you know, model weights and, and parameters are not equivalent to source code. So you can't exactly MIT license them. Um, the, 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 the licensing primitives don't carry over properly. So um, I think that there's some work to do around terminology, you know, iteration, but fundamentally probably the only thing that's like preventing scientific research from being more open sourcey or, you know, kind of equivalent to the way open source software works um, is in the scientific community, we just don't have a, a common denominator primitive. Like it's not all software. Sometimes it's, you know, um, molecule synthesis. Sometimes it's mathematical formulas. Sometimes it's, you know, uh, you know, very different primitives that uh, perhaps can be boiled down to some equations or something that looks like source code, but isn't quite source code. I think there's all those kinds of challenges, but structurally, I think that you can make the ethos of open source basically possible with science, but there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done to make that possible. So the, um, you know, I got a tour of a famous lab, like a, a science lab, and they were showing me all this cool cellular regeneration stuff. And the scientists were like, well, you can't take pictures. You can't, uh, you, you can't tell anyone. Here's in six NDAs you have to sign before you leave the building. Um, and I was like, well, this is poorly done. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and I was, I was like, you know, there's going to be, so my, I mean, my thought process around open source is more just openness and like the, uh, one of our companies, it's a company called Radiant Nuclear. They are making a nuclear fission reactor and which is a very physical thing, uh, in the realm of the world. And basically they are, they've just started to like share that like that's their thesis is like hey we're going to be fastest and if you're going to be fastest if you're going to be the best it's not about secrets anymore it's about being the best and like so if you're going to run it's going to run you're running fast so my i think culturally the the classic academia is not going to be running as fast as the decentralization and openness of what the new science is going to reign um, and I think that's sort of an exciting opportunity uh, where there's sort of chains in classic. And I don't mean to make classic academia like big pharma, whatever, like we need alternatives to these processes. And that's really all I'm trying to gun for. Like, I just want, I think classic academia is still going to be around. I think big pharma is still going to be around, but I think there's going to be an opportunity to choose one way or the other. And that's exciting. I think just like with crypto, I have a choice to do traditional finance and sometimes I vote the other way. Um, and like, I think the same things about that. So I, I really, Joseph, I really appreciated your, uh, your thought process around the differences between developers and scientists. I also think cultural is like the, one of the things that I think needs to change the most from that process, which is so expensive education and culture, crazy expensive to change. So yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I, and, and I think like it's kind of funny, open source sort of went through a similar phase and period of just kind of trying to be more philosophically palatable for people um, that, that, you know, as, as all things are, and we know this as investors, I think pretty well, like pretty much everything's invented by a human somewhere. So like the open source was invented by a guy like in MIT in the 80s named Richard Stallman, and it wasn't called open source, then it was called free software. And Richard was a hardcore maxi ideologue and thought that proprietary software wasn't just a different way. He thought it was fucking evil, right? And he was like, no, this is evil. And I'm going to use the opposite of the copyright system to fight this. He came up with this thing called not copyright, copy left, right? And that was his contribution. So uh, it took 15 years for a bunch of people to go and say, Richard's a genius and amazing, but we need to rebrand this so that this is more palatable for people philosophically, like you were just I saying. I did not know this, and I absolutely love this. Yeah, so I mean, I, I I basically do what I do and dedicate my life to after learning this stuff because it's it's pretty fascinating once you learn it. But it's a group in the late '90s, Tim O'Reilly, a uh, handful of others, that basically said, "Look, we need to take Richard's hardcore ideological ideas." and make them more palatable for, for industry and make them more um, pragmatic and acceptable. They literally did a marketing rebrand from um, saying, look, it's no longer free software, let's call it open source. And let's create some licenses that implement Richard's ideas, uh, the four freedoms, right? The freedom to see, run, execute, and modify the code. 
And uh, now we have a set of licenses that implement those freedoms, MIT, Apache, BSL, MPL, many others. And um, that lucky timing shift also coincided with the rise of the internet over the following you know, years, late 90s, early 2000s. But what, what I think is absolutely fascinating is we've seen this kind of repeat with crypto where the initial wave was very ideologically driven. And I think we're going through maybe a, tr- a, a, a sort of a, a, a phase shift or a trend now where there's like tools and systems built that are actually reliable and practical to where you, you don't necessarily have to buy all the way into the philosophy, but just like Adam was saying, like, I'm, ch- I, I have another choice. I have an option that gives me these, these features that are actually super compelling. Um, but I don't necessarily need to buy into, you know, like a super hardcore maxi philosophy. And that's really what unlocks a hundred X, a thousand X more growth of the primitives and, and the ideas um, in industry, where I think if you, you if you talk to a hundred developers and everyone uses open source, we, we wouldn't exist without open source. And you ask them if they knew the history that I just articulated, maybe five out of a hundred would know the history that I just described, right? I mean, this is like deep kind of like nuanced history. People just take for granted that these things exist and they're just like, oh wait, open source, wasn't it always that way? Actually, no, it wasn't. Like a guy had to stand up and invent these ideas and uh, give people tools in which to actually adopt them. Like the good new uh, public license was the, the first open source free software mm-hmm. license for GPL. And then uh, Richard also wrote a manifesto. He also wrote some tools, uh, one of them being specifically Emacs, uh, which is a, a, you know one of the original text editors for writing software. And um, uh, obviously created this, this foundation, the Free Software Foundation, which was this, this kind of this organization that promoted the ideas. But um, it is really interesting to see all other industries, industries kind of wake up to these ideas. The scientific community, like you were just saying, Adam, is probably the most high friction resistant to openness. Uh, for so many reasons. And it's probably one of the areas of humanity that's like holding back progress for that reason. It's because people are so protective of their ideas and their inventions. And we should actually be doing the exact opposite to make them, to make the most progress. I kind of feel like it's like for science, it's like the opposite of crypto. Like in crypto, we started with the, the ideology. So it all started with the, you know, people uh, thinking about ideas, believing in the ideas. And then we kind of like are now building the tools to make these uh, those ideas like into reality. With science, it's kind of like the opposite for this, like that kind of like my feeling. We have the tools to change things, but it's more like the mentality of so many people within academia and the scientific world is stuck in the past. That is like you kind of have to convince them and like, you know, you know take them hand by hand and, and bring them into the, this new space. So I feel like that's why the friction is so high. It's kind of like a hand end combat. You cannot really like go to the university and be like, hey, put up, put up a manifesto about design. Like this is the new, the new reality. People will think you're crazy, but like, you know, little by little, we can get in there. So kind of like related to this, um, we talked about these of DSI. There's, there's many in many fields of DSI, subfields of DSI, call them as you want. What do you think are, apart from this uh, friction, the risks associated with this uh, domain when you compare it with like other domains i know you know um you're investing in other uh, projects other areas other domains so what makes dsi different from other fields like some specific risks that are you know tied to to dsi um <clears throat> there's there's regulatory hurdles here right um you know we I mean, this isn't just about medicine development, but that's the the angle I come out from just because of my previous kind of experience and career. Um, there are technical hiccups as well. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with smart contracts. These can be exploited. Uh, UX barriers, you know, people are using crypto assets and, and transacting in crypto assets. We still haven't, as an industry, as a in, within blockchain, like figured out all of those things. And I think, you know, with all of the incumbents, they're going to be very resistant to change. Um, They're going to be reluctant to embracing these new models. And I I think we'll talk about some of the new models in a bit. Um, So really just kind of adoptional challenges around UX and and pushback. Um, And the regulatory ones, like a huge one, not only do we have like financial regulators, we've got drug regulators as well. So it's like a two pronged attack we really have to protect ourselves against. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the the obvious one is the ones that James mentioned. For, for us, I think our risk is is time. Um, and what I mean by that is there's there's so many things that we can invest as crypto investors, and 
generally for crypto investments, the turnover rate is relatively short compared to traditional debt venture. Um, and so um, obviously we're spending a lot of time in, 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 in building and investing in D-side, which is an entirely new category. The question is, okay, it's going to be impactful, but if it's going to be 20 years from now, or is it going to be 10 years from now, or is it going to be five years from now? And I think that what we need to do as, as even, you know, when we invest in this, in this sector is identify what is from the weakness around the sector and kind of like look at what are some, some, some things that worked in the past. Um, and I, I think right now it's, you know, a, a very obvious challenge is that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people in this industry who obviously feel that these will be big, but there's not enough web three people who are, who has a strong, um, um, skill set around BD that will be able to kind of like go from, um, a researcher perspective into the business development perspective. The only you, you're able to unlock that, that, that barrier where you'd be able to unlock things like exchanges, like, you know, like centralized exchanges, the top exchanges around, around, around web three, um, <clears throat> and all the, all the core infrastructure that will support these side. Um, so generally the, I think that the way to look at this is, um, once you have one really, really, you know, good case study where, you know, a token gets listed on Binance and it, it, it hits a hundred X, the people will start coming in. It's always like that in crypto. Um, and obviously there's going to be, um, people who disagree with this opinion and be like, okay, well, we got to focus more on getting the right scientists to get rewarded. But, you know, going back to what Joseph said, you know, Richard Stallman had, is a very extremist, right? You know, he, 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 a lot of this, a lot of these things that he's done end up being kind of like people used it and then they built their own kind of like their own company that end up being billion, like billion dollar companies. Um, but he himself, like he didn't take the monetary credit that he deserved. Like he's not like rich or anything like that. In fact, he's kind of still very kind of like close minded and he, he still have his own opinions on things. And so what, what I've realized is like, yes, when we went, when we're investing in, in a lot of these companies, you know, we, we also need to be very, very honest about like the weaknesses around there. And, and it's okay that, you know, every company, I think at the end of the day, um, people are, are passionate about what they're doing. And so obviously they're doing and build and trying to build and this is what they do, right? This is, they, they build products and, and we're investing, we're supporting them. But at the same time, like as investors, we actually need to be a lot more hands on because the D side narrative is so early. And then we just like invest and then not do anything. It might, the time might be like, you know, 10 years from now, or maybe like 20 years from now. And it'd be like investment is like over time, like if, even if you make like, a, like, you know, 10X, but it's like 20 years, then it's, it's pretty much a, a failed investment, you know, because the opportunity cost is so high. And so from our perspective is, we're going to try to get that maybe to like less than five years. I think if we can see these side pop in less than five years, I think we've completely basically done pretty, pretty well for ourselves. Um, but like, like everyone is saying, right? I think a lot of people like there, there's still a lot of challenges involved. Rug was regulatory challenge versus the BD challenge. I think the thing is, you know, we're based in Asia. And so we actually know all the exchanges, much of the exchanges today are still, uh, speculation is still happening in Asia. That is still a very big market. And so we're also playing our role. So for example, like we're, we're doing a, a conference end of this year in Taiwan, and it, it will be the first um, DSI centric um, conference where we're promoting about DSI and we're translating a lot of that stuff in Chinese. Um, and we're obviously um, inviting a lot of people from the DSI community into Taiwan to speak. And Taiwan's actually a very, very solid, safe place. It's the closest place to China without being China. So it's like, if you're in Hong Kong, then you can potentially even get in issues in terms of what you can say and what you cannot say. And Taiwan is like, you can say whatever you want um, about Web3 and you'll be perfectly like safe. And so we also want to be able, able to kind of introduce, you know, opportunities for, for, for speakers to kind of like this, I do want to eventually move to Asia. It's not always just Singapore. There's places like Taiwan as well. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's a great perspective. And uh, something uh, just kind of like going back to what you were saying about BD in, in, in DSI, you know, transitioning from like a, you know, scientist position to like a more like a BD. I feel like the, the Venn diagram when you take like scientists and people that know about crypto is like very, very like the intersection is like almost like invisible. And so that's why when I think about what we're doing at Research Hub, it's kind of like a devil challenge. We're trying to get someone out of the ivory tower and try something new. And at the same time, we're also trying to board them on crypto. It's kind of like two mountains. When we're done with one, there's another one next to, to that other to uh, get to the top. So uh, yeah, definitely, definitely the challenges are there. Um, something that I um, kind of like hear a lot about DC is like, um, you know, DC should be like a public good. 
how do you, uh, or at least like, you know, partially the one of the core tenets of, you know, DCI as being like a public good, how do you balance being a public good and, you know, profit for investors in DCI? Because it could be like a provocative question, but uh, one that I really want to hear your perspective on. I think capitalism is a public good and everyone should be involved in capitalism. And there is a good video that uh, Elon did as an interview with Chris Anderson at TED, I think earlier this year, maybe last year, where um, he breaks down the etymology of the word philanthropy, which is uh, a love for life or a love for humanity, <laughs> philanthropy. And uh, you, you know, he described Tesla as philanthropy and SpaceX as philanthropy and Neuralink as philanthropy. And I think the most uh, fundamentally transformative and important companies are all philanthropy and they can create huge profits and create many billionaires and return a lot of capital back to society and investors. And they should be celebrated and respected at the same level of basically traditional philanthropic efforts. You know, uh, the people who always want things to be a public good uh, or like a philanthropy type situation are the ones who have bad business models in their industry. So artists didn't have a good business model until NFTs. Scientists will argue that it should be a, for public good because they haven't had the chance to become wealthy and create more impact because of the industry that they're in. So I think once we show, once we have, I call it the Beeple moment. Uh, so in, in crypto, there was a Beeple yeah. moment with NFTs where no people don't give them enough credit, honestly. Like, that when that when that NFT sold for sixty nine million dollars, like my my phone was ringing off the hook with artists who I didn't know, who were just calling saying I'm a better artist than people, uh, and saying how do I do this and make money, and so suddenly there was this new business model. So my my thesis that like my my thesis is like the people who say that they've just been conditioned to believe that you need to do things for the public good. Because the industry has been the capturers of value have have not been historically whoever they are. So right now, if we're talking about scientists, they have not historically been able to capture the value that big pharma or healthcare or academia like Stanford or universities have been able to capture. And uh, I think that it's time that they can. That's sort of my thesis. Yeah, we're breaking down the silos here. You know, we're, we're kind of overcoming all those like geographical institutional barriers that, that exist at the moment. Um, ultimately, the public is best served by accelerating innovation. And these open, transparent models, um, you know, they disintermediate rent seekers and bad actors and incompetence. And so, you know, if you kind of take a step back, it is actually a public good for that reason. And you know, putting on my kind of investor hat, adoption is going to equal value. And so like our returns are going to be increased through just kind of, you know, broad public benefit generally across the spectrum. Um, you're talking about NFTs. I think one of the best innovations in this space at the moment by the folks over at Molecule are IP NFTs. You know, these are balancing open knowledge with fair compensation to the innovators, right? You know, the, the guys who found the double helix or whatever. Um, these guys are now getting rewarded for their intellect. And um, we're just creating a much fairer system and a system that's a meritocracy. You know, you don't need a PhD to come and work in these DAOs. You can contribute with whatever qualifications you've got, just with the hard grit and determination. And so just generally, I, I think these, because of blockchain technology, these things are so well suited for, for public goods. We've also got, you know, hyper certs, this kind of retrospective funding. So we're able to use these technological innovations to really progress research in a way that's not done before because of those silos that existed before, because there wasn't cross-contamination between research groups, because you couldn't find the right people to do the right things um, traditionally. Yeah, I mean, I, I I feel like for me, I, I personally went through this a lot more because I, I stayed in Shanghai during COVID where I actually went through like three, four months of like real lockdown and you can't actually even leave your own unit, which is pretty crazy. Um, and so like at that time, obviously, um, you know, people, what I've learned is that even though there were solutions around, um, you know, even though there was a lot of solutions around um, potentially what's, uh, you know, uh, what could, you know, battle against COVID, 
and, and all the all the other viruses that was going on that was evolving over time. I think like fundamentally one of the things is that you need to have a community that backs what you're doing. Um, like, I think the, the good example is that you, you can be really, really smart or you can have like, you can argue that you have a bet, bet better, you're, you're a better artist than, than, than a lot of the people who launch NFT, which a lot of times it is true because a lot of the real artists don't want to be associated with NFT artists because they don't think they're real artists. Um, <clears throat> and so, but then you realize that it's, it's the NFT artist that makes the most money, right? And, and so um, at the end of the day, it's, it's, not, it's not about like, it's not about like who has a better product or who's better or worse. It's about there, there needs to be an element of BB play in there. Whereas like, oh, there's, maybe there's someone who's curating your art better than other people. Um, maybe there's a community behind it, right? And, and so for, for, for us, it's, it's like if, if there's a community around what you're building today, not just from, from, a, from a funding perspective, which we've seen in, in, in a lot of biodows today, uh, beyond that, which is like, you know, getting the, the, right, the right minds to come, like the, the, the resources to come and help you. I think what we're going to see is that, you know, traditional where we'll, traditional like um, healthcare, where, where we see like a lot of the time frame for, for all these profit to be like, you know, around like the 10 year plus investment mark, that, that might actually shrink to, to a lot shorter than that, maybe to like two to three years. Right. And I, I think that's very powerful. Right. We've, we've actually, I think, I think Jim could probably share a bit more on, on that because, you know, uh, mo mo <clears throat> molecules actually doing a lot of that stuff right, right now where they're, they're, they're really removing a lot of the, the bottlenecks and and they're through a BD play and community play and getting a lot of the the resources um it, you know properly and more efficiently um they, they actually shrunk a lot of their, their 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 delays which you know uh we're talking about like you know uh you know well over 50 percent of the entire lifespan uh of the research so we're seeing that and then after we scale that i think that's going to be where like things really blow up um, and, and that's, that's, a, that's like, before that, we're trying to do us a, a, a must like basically a robust infrastructure for, for, for the industry to scale. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And tomorrow there will be a, a panel, a BioDAO panel. So we'll be talking a lot about, you know, uh, this, this concept of IP NFT innovation for, um, for BioDAOs. So before taking questions from the audience, I just wanted to, uh, kind of like close the loop and, you know, looking ahead. Um, you know, let's say, you know, DSI succeeds, achieves critical mass. First of all, what do you think could be like a um, catalyst, like a moment, like a people moment, as Adam said, uh, for DSI, where people actually realize this and something happens, something breaks and DSI takes off. And if that happens, how do you think, how do, how do you think the, the future looks like? Paint me, you know, like a future where DSI has succeeded. And tell me why I succeeded. You know what happened. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll take that one. I think we need to see some kind of killer 10x, 100x applications that people are using. Um, whether that's kind of you know wearables linked to blockchain and they're uploading their data and, and kind of benefiting from from the co collective you know data repositories. Um, what what would be my dream is an end-to-end -end development of a medicine within a DAO. The, the industry has kind of reached a state where even big pharma companies barely do any of the stuff themselves. And all of these contract research organizations and contract manufacturing organizations have popped up to service the needs of these pharma companies. They don't do any of the research in-house now. They just like, you know, come in and, 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 and buy out kind of biotech. So the infrastructure is actually there already for BioDAOs to leverage. And I, I do believe we, we still have a lot of problems around governance and around coordination and things. But I, I do believe there's a, a future in the kind of medium term where we are going to see the progression of some asset through a BioDAO into human clinical trials. That's the most important thing, actually getting human data uh, within one of these DAOs and, and maybe it will be out licensed to, um, to a pharma company, but maybe not. And, you know, we've seen some interesting stuff in hair DAO at the moment, and you're going to be speaking to Andy and Andy tomorrow. These guys are great. Uh, they're absolutely killing it. So, yeah, I, I think if, if a DAO can be responsible for the, the development, maybe not the commercialization, but certainly the development of a, a new medical, um, asset, then that's just going to be awesome. 
Totally agree with James. I would add one story that emphasizes the example that James was pointing to around end-to-end -end drug development uh, by pointing to uh, a case study that I actually learned about by reading about bootstrap companies and, you know, what are the biggest bootstrap companies in the world? Um, so there's a company in India called the Serum Institute of India, SII. They're a biotech biopharma company. They're the largest manufacturer of vaccines in the world and um, specifically basically deliver all the vaccines to um, Indians, so for all kinds of um, vac vac vaccines, uh, tuberculosis, swine flu, and COVID and everything, billions of vaccines per year, uh, multi-billion revenue company with a 50% net profit margin, so extremely profitable. And um, I was reading the origin story of this company on the blog uh, called The Long Game uh, of Zoho, which is a Salesforce competitor, fully bootstrapped, owned by the founder. And I'll paste this blog in the chat for everyone to read, which is really fascinating. How did Serum Institute of India get their initial funding? By selling horses. <laughs> so the Punawala family uh, literally was like, gosh, we should build a vaccine company. I don't know what gave them that idea. Hired some doctors, raised some capital by selling some horses because they were horse, uh, you know, horse uh, 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 equestrian people or they like had a bunch of horses or whatever on their farm. And fast forward, whatever, 30, 40 years, they're the largest vaccine uh, producer in India. So I think like the origin story of a lot of the, even the biggest um, pharma companies that we know of was even more obscure and less kind of gate kept and credentialed than a lot of people imagine. It's like literally some founder entrepreneur standing up with zero pharma expertise and going and saying, look, we need this as a solution. Let's hire the experts and make this happen. And that's kind of how capitalism works. And I think we all know as investors, like that's kind of the easy part. Like the hard part is like making the fucking, like the technical invention and making the breakthrough happen and like getting those people as part of the capitalist process uh, with easier tools and mechanisms, I think is kind of what um, DSA is fundamentally all about. And um, like, that's what gets me excited about it. But I just thought pointing to the this uh, Serum Institute of India example is interesting because it's, you know, it's one of these huge companies that not many people know about the, the origin story behind. Still owned by the Punawal family as well as of today. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing in the chat for everyone yet. So also the audience will be able to, to read the blog post. I think that the, uh, I think we, it works when like my daughter who's six or eight has an idea and can present that idea to a community of people. And she would be able to be rewarded based off of her addition to the, the system it, with an incentive. And then if it becomes a really big deal, it continues to be a reward. And so it's like, a, if, if, like if it's an enduring concept, if, it, if they cure cancer and like Big Pharma buys the concept and ends up doing it or discovers a new planet and that ends up unlocking new territory. Um, I think it's when it's, in our home that's basically when we win it's just like if it's in our home and like we're like hey this is the logical thing you have an idea go logically go over to research hub or go over to you know do something simple and i uh i think it's exciting I, I think that's an exciting world but what you're asking is like when's that moment when we get mass awareness and the mass awareness piece is that people moment which is I think that one of these things, whether it's from Hair Dow or Beaker Dow or whatever, one of the DAOs is going to build up a concept that gets bought by Big Pharma or uh, gets to gets to critical mass, and that IP NFT all of a sudden is worth real money, and that's going to be insane. That is my bet. Yeah, I, I, I think from my side, it's more is something that's a bit more practical, which is <clears throat> historically, I think if, if you see speculation coming in, um, whether it's from investors or from retailers, then it, it usually means you, you hit some really, really big. Um, I mean, if you look at <clears throat> you look at the early days on NFTs when we were investing um, uh, in, in child, like early 2018, um, OpenSea just started <clears throat> and there were there weren't a lot of uh, uh, volume there. In, in fact, there were a lot more volume on um, on security exchanges than um, NFT exchanges at that time. Because after ICO, there was like this this thing called STO, secure token offering, um, and then they were they were trading a lot more than basically NFTs. And so at one point, like people even thought like you know people even thought like NFT was was going to be a fad, right? Um, at that time, it was called seven twenty one. You see seven twenty one. It's like um, 
So I, I, so I, I do think that what really obviously got people super excited about NFT is like they realized that re retailers came in and realized they can 100x this thing in like two months, right? And then the ones the story is out, especially with, you know, these kids at, you know, university kids who are selling their own art for like, you know, 200K, half a million and some of the crazy stories are out. That's when the people start to realize it's like, wait, wait, this is like a real thing. And you can actually turn, you know, like, you know, art into regardless of every age into, into real money, right? So like, as Adam mentioned, right? But before that, then obviously I think there is, there need a very practical approach. It's like, are crypto exchanges even going to list anything in, in DSI, right? And so far we haven't seen any. So it's like, I guess my, my goal also in the next couple months is to kind of start working, educating with exchanges and like sharing the idea that, hey, DSI will actually attract a lot of people in, 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 into, into the exchange business. And so you should definitely start looking at DSI. Um, and here are some of the really good ones to list potentially. <clears throat> so that, that's kind of like my role. And then I, I do feel like once you get involved with some of the top exchanges, then you're, you're able to basically turn in the, the button where it's like, you have basically no funding to a lot of funding um, to the point that you might, if it's very successful, then a lot of these companies will get listed on top exchanges. They never need to go through funding from VCs or PE funds anymore, right? And we have so much money to spend, they can use that to do um, the, the, the the goals they want to do, right? Whether that's like funding additional researchers, whether doing DAOs, or running funds or whatever, but it solves one of the most, one of the, the key issues that I think a lot of people are facing right now, which is like the funding, like where who's paying for the money, who's willing to give in the money, right? Um, and yes, VCs can only give it a bunch, but at the end of the day, you, you do need like to unlock the, the the real industry, which is like getting on exchange and have a lot of bunch of volume and where that that's where a lot of most companies go from like, you know, zero to a hundred X in crypto. Yeah, hundred percent, a hundred percent. Let me take a few questions from the audience because um, we have five minutes left. So um, let's start with this one. So what do you think could be the role of, uh, if any, traditional media, like film, TV, video games in helping decide? Do you think they could play any role in helping with, you know, this, uh, you know, movement reach critical mass? No is also an answer. <clears throat> um, uh, you, I guess, like, we, we invest in a couple of media companies ourselves. Um, so... So we're investors like Bitcoin Magazine, we invest in Crypto Slave. So I mean, obviously, like I think education is really important. So if you're, if you're, um, especially regional education too, right? Because not everyone reads English, and so <clears throat> if you're doing a lot of that yourself, then obviously you're you're you're, you're building impact for for DSI. Um, but but I think in terms of like films and all this stuff, I think that's that's a bit early, um, unless you're really going to angle where you're you're <clears throat> you're you know there's already case studies where a Web two company, um turns into a Web3 company um, and basically they tokenize, you know, some of their stuff that they already have in, in, in the field of science. And we've actually seen that actually in, 2000, um, um, in, in 2015, um, you know, when the first one I worked at, a Kauffman Bushi, they invested in a company called VeChain, which did basically did like, you know, supply chain um, provenance and just making sure that the companies that the, the products that, that ship into China, that they're real. And then there's, there's, there's a very simple use case for, for blockchain. And then during the hype of ICL, they launched a token and, you know, they, they made a bunch of money and then they raised a bunch of money and, and, and now they're able to kind of publish and really get in more in depth um, with, with utilizing blockchain utility. Um, and obviously because a big part of that is because our industry has grown so much, but at the same time, it's like this example where you're, you're taking something that's happened in the past, like, you know, VeChain, for example, where it went from web two and then went to web three and now they're doing a lot you know, in, in terms of what they're building. No, no, I'm going to change my answer on the last question and to tie it into this answer. Uh, I think that first off, media always plays a role in the adoption and education of industry, especially from like I wa was able to watch as Coindesk went from nothing to like a huge industry defining category. And every industry sort of does this. They launch one in space and VR and like every industry has sort of a media publication. That helps tell the story. But my answer to the last question is we need a Beeple moment and then we're going to need a Mount Gox moment. And like the and both will will happen uh, where classic academia is going to have to try to dunk in a bad way on the decentralization of science and uh, be upset about it. And then but it will keep going 
I think I think things go through these like micro bubbles, rise and fall, and it's sort of uh, we we were able to watch it with crypto if you were in that industry for long enough. But uh, so I will say like, hey, you know what it's going to be? It's going to be something like, hey, uh, cancer cure gets bought by big pharma, some AI cancer cure drug, and then it's going to be uh, like kid experiments on other student with like a cloning drug and then it's like oh my god like we can't we need to regulate this so it's going to be the worst it's going to be like that type of thing it's going to be a something that's like means everything to decide but also obviously there's regulatory boundaries we're hitting um and so it's going to be a I'm excited for it. I think it's going to be really, it's going to be an interesting world where people are able to really participate in science from everywhere. Yeah, as, as a kind of adjacency to Adam's point, you know, on the regulatory side, that there, there will be issues, there always are. Um, but it's really important for us in this movement to engage regulators early, you know, I, I was saying we're having a two-pronged attack. I mean, the regulators I, are not our enemies. I, I, I would argue the opposite, but continue. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as it stands, unfortunately, they're the gate, gatekeepers to approving medicines. But, you know, I, I, in my last job, I was developing medicines from cannabis, and we were doing it in kids, right? Refractory epilepsy. These are kids who have catastrophic conditions, 300 seizures a day. So imagine trying to put weed into kids, there were regulatory hurdles, but these guys embraced us with open arms. And, you know, we, we developed the medicine to, to the tough and strict pharmaceutical standards. I think with these bio DAOs, we're going to be, you know, I, I've talked, well, I haven't talked about, I've answered a question about Vita DAO. You can't get medicine approved for longevity because the trials are going to be too long. You know, ha, ha, did someone live longer and way too expensive? We need new regulatory pathways. We need them to kind of open up to the idea of pre-approvals where we can start testing what we know to be really safe medicines on people before approvals. So I think we have an opportunity here to open up new ways of doing things, whether, um, you know, TV and media and, and video games can be part of that. I don't know, but I, I would encourage people to not look at regulators too much like the bad guys. I, on the other side in crypto, especially in the US, it feels like they are the bad guys right now. I think on the medicine side, we might have a better audience there. I think TV, movie, entertainment media can play a massive role actually in making this um, really popular, which is just you know creating things that society resonates with. And you know we've seen advertising be really useful for that. We've seen movies and pop culture be really useful. We've seen you know social media campaigns and things that just take off virally on TikTok or whatever, you know, the social media platform du jour is. So like, uh, I think connecting a lot of these concepts with something that could take off massively in the public sphere at a societal level, especially with like, you know, cross cutting across all the demographics would be um, actually really powerful. I don't really know what that would look like, um, but I think the, the the geeks in this Zoom and the people who are like really bought into this understand the technical aspects and they understand all the philosophical pieces we need to demystify and simplify all that stuff for society by orders of magnitude. If we want to like bring people into this movement and, and see, you know, examples like Adam was saying around like some child or some young person coming up with an awesome idea and contributing something. Yeah, I think yeah. mimetics are a powerful thing, uh, right? You, you should check out the hair down memes. They're awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think we should re really be hitting on the general public because if you think about it, DSI has already been covered by journals just kind of crazy like you know kind of funny actually like no nature published on uh news about you know uh DSI, the decide movement so i feel like what we really need is the general public to see uh what decide can do and you know potentially support uh this movement while we're building you know the tools to actually make it happen i'll take this other question uh which i have an answer myself uh but how can you we as scientists change the incentive structure for academics so that publishing in high impact uh factor journals isn't anymore the only north star uh or measure for promotion so um i will leave it you know open this up uh, to you guys i think you know one way could be actually introducing financial incentives 
This is what we're trying to do with, uh, you know, Research Hub and the paid peer review initiative. We're basically seeing that if you take out the financial incentive, people will find other incentives that those are basically citations. And so we'll gain the system to get more of that. So that could be one way to, to do it. Uh, do you have any other opinion on this? Yeah, I think I think tokenization is, is really important, right? So, um, you know, I, I think if, if you look at how people build their Twitter accounts today, um, you, you realize that it's, it's actually quite simple. It's like, um, you just need to give out like ex your own token or you're giving out an NFT, you're giving out some, uh, you know, if you're launching a, a, a blockchain company, then you obviously you have your own token and you're giving out your own tokens and people come and actually do the work you ask them to do, right? Um, and we've seen that work um, in, 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 in Twitter where like people are able to build their account up to like 100K or 200K uh, with real accounts. And, and we've seen that with a lot of products as well. And so... Um, like like the the, the the to to earn model is is you know in, in theory like like <clears throat> you know people it's all about psychology it's all about like knowing people what what people want and at the end of the day people want to make money and so they're playing games to make money um they're doing whatever to make money they're running to make money right and so um here is uh building a, a ecosystem with a consensus mechanism that actually makes sense uh, to reward uh, researchers um, or to contribute uh, to to reward um, contributors, and that's something that I think will will obviously enhance the the process, um, and and that's something that I think will will take time because that's not something that a VC, as VC investors can give an answer to, and that's also not something that researchers themselves can give an answer to. It's like you basically have to work together as a group in order to find that balance, and we, we've seen that kind of like in in the early days of Ethereum too, where like people basically know that this needs to be built but then it's so hard to like define and to build the the the, the 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 consensus mechanism around it because people generally have their bias or their, their they have their own train of thoughts um and so like at the end of the day it's it's, it's all about finding that balance so i i think one of the undervalued things that a lot of people have ignored in a lot of these markets um is who the star is um and, and so i would say like on the the currency side um yeah it's great we should it's add incentives to everything that's how people do things i have a very hard belief that people do things for money that's uh it's tough to argue against um and for me to me not other maybe other people debate this uh but i think one of the things that yeah, often gets ignored is that the scientist is the star uh, they're the they're the shining star that makes all these things tick, and so it really starts to pump and hum when there is someone who I can reference. Um, like George Church is a really big name in science, right? I would grapple other like if you asked me to list five scientists' names, I would have difficulty. Okay, like and they would not be related, and they would not be in a category. Um, and maybe I would have backed them or maybe I've already backed enough where I can say, say list off a few, but it would be difficult for me to do that. I think one of the most important things that we can do in DSI is remind everyone that the scientist is the star and that they're doing very, very important work. And that without the scientists, there is no science <laughs> in this world, right? And just being able to reward them, but also sort of honor the fact that they're doing good work. I think, you know, everyone wants a Nobel prize. Everyone wants all these things. It's like, I don't know, really, they just want to pat on the back that they worked on something important. I, I believe people want to be useful. And I think yeah. uh, getting it to the mass market that like you can be useful is a good thing. So yes, I think the reward and the incentive makes sense. But once you start to really honor the fact that the scientist is the hero, I think everything falls into place. And uh, yeah, and the, the, those things can be enabled through, you know, reputation systems and credential systems. And I know the folks at Research Hub have been thinking about this really, really deeply. It just allows for novel value exchanges and actually um, kind of it unlocks a market around specific kind of scientific skill sets. So now scientists aren't just, you know, publishing, but they're also 
you know, refereeing and reviewing published literature and, and getting awarded to do that competently and building up a reputation. And then that's giving them or granting them access to uh, functions uh, and capabilities within these DAOs. Yeah, we should make them SARS. We should make more people want to be scientists. I mean, doing a PhD myself, so I kind of believe in that too. Okay. Um, if you don't have any other thoughts, I think uh, we've been a bit uh, over time. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'd like to really, really thank you a lot for coming here today. It's been it's been a pleasure to have you all. And um, yeah, we're doing we're doing our part. I think at Research Hub, I'm trying to push this uh this you know this field forward you're also doing your part so hopefully we see that uh people moment coming uh sooner rather than later thank you all okay. thank you thank so you very much. much thanks for thanks. having us thanks for having us you guys are awesome okay next up i think we have patrick joining us let me see if it's in in the backstage. Hey, Pat. Hey, how's it going? Good. We had a really nice panel dis discussion, I would say. You enjoyed yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> really, it's, it's funny where it's like, you know, you're doing something well when you become the dumbest guy in the room. <laughs> and <laughs> we're just... The speakers that we've had today are off the charts, like learned so much. So yeah, you guys are killing it. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll leave it up to you. I know if you have anything to, to share, let me make you a host. I think you have something to share for our public. Yeah, so I have a, a quick deck and a couple demos, but also, uh, Ricardo, feel free to to stay on the call if anybody has any questions like happy to sort of do this a little interactive as well if people um you know want to want to ask questions if that's okay with you ricardo here i blocked off the night so i'm here <laughs> okay. awesome cool so let me uh share screen and i'll start uh doing this presentation So as it seems, uh, everybody knows we're Research Hub. Uh, our mission is to accelerate the pace of scientific research. Um, and the point of this presentation today, there are a lot of things currently happening at Research Hub, but to highlight two specific things that I personally am very excited about. The first is a lot of the work that the Research Hub Foundation is doing around peer review bounties and how this could potentially like fit into the greater scientific ecosystem. And then the second is a feature that we're beta testing at the moment, which is a reference manager, which uh, we think will actually complement these peer review bounties uh, extremely well. So uh, first, talking about peer review bounties, um, to kind of set the stage here a little bit, there's this sort of like big picture economic thing happening in science where kind of as Ludo mentioned, Europe is actually leading the way, but um, governments are starting to understand that taxpayers want access to the research that they help to fund. And so uh, this memo uh, released on August 25th of last year um, from the Office of Science and Technology Policy for the White House, essentially says that starting in 2026, December 31st, 2025, um, every uh, piece of research that's funded by a U.S. government agency, which has a budget above $100 million, will need to be one, open access, and two, have open data associated with it. So this is really, really cool. This is sort of like the culmination of a lot of work that's been done in the open science movement to help to, I think, like open access to the scientific knowledge that's funded by taxpayer money. Um, so generally, this is an amazing thing because the business model of uh, paywalled research is probably going to become a thing of the past due to the fact that grant givers are making this a priority. Um, there are traditional companies in this space that have uh, made a lot of money over the past couple of decades by gating access to scientific knowledge, even when they're the ones who didn't necessarily fund or do the work behind the research. So um, about six months ago, uh, some of these journals are starting to understand that the business model around gating access to scientific content really won't be super feasible in the future when you can't gate access to government funded research. 
And so they're trying to adapt, which I think is an absolutely admirable thing. Um, unfortunately, the way they're doing it is not the best. Um, for example, the sort of do or dominant model when it comes to making money within open access publishing is the idea of an article processing charge. This is uh, more colloquially known as an APC. Um, as a scientist, when I submit my manuscript to an open access publisher, I can pay for peer review and distribution. So these APC charges range from around $1,500. Uh, I think eLife is about $2,000 to some open access nature journals that charge about $10,000. And so um, this is like a interesting thing because the people who do the work when it comes to like providing peer review and editorial services, they do it largely um, as volunteers. So the people who are facilitating a lot of this kind of business model don't see um, any like financial reward for doing so. And most of it goes to a corporation that's monetizing the process through an APC. Um, as I mentioned before, some of these kind of more traditional journals are clunkily adapting to this new normal that will exist starting in 2026. Um, for instance, the journal uh, Neuroimaging, um, they realized that they needed to be open access. They changed their business model from a subscription to an article processing charge, and they set the fee at about $3,500 per article. Um, this is a lot of money. <laughs> like I would love $3,500 right now uh, for every article that's published on Research Hub. Um, but really admirably, I think, the um, people who provide the free labor behind this journal, um, the editorial board, essentially uh, tried to communicate to this bigger publisher, we don't think it's appropriate to charge $3,500 for one article being published in this journal. And they actually requested that they would bring it down to around $2,000, um, something that eLife has demonstrated is manageable for a publisher to do. Um, the older journal disagreed. And so the editorial board actually stepped down and they decided to um, try and form their own journal somewhere where they'd be able to, uh, I think, operate in a manner that's more um, in aligned with their values. So this is uh, pretty exciting. I took this directly from the announcement itself. Feel free to click this uh, link down below if you want to read more about it. Um, and, and so this brings me to uh, kind of what we're hoping to fill here at Research Hub with our peer review bounties. Um, we believe that kind of the process of open peer review on top of preprints is a lot better than the current system of closed peer review and like paywalled access to content. And so we think something that we can do is help to um, put economic pressure on some of these more established journals to do more with their APCs. So um, for instance, like something as simple as compensating the people who are doing the work behind it. Um, to give an example of this, um, let me do a quick little demo here. So on Research Hub, uh, we have the ability to add peer reviews. Um, this is a fantastic one from Xander Hankala. If you can see, we have a star rating um, and some kind of like pre-prescribed categories that uh, users can use when sharing a peer review, overall score, a score for impact, uh, rating for the methods, and then the discussion. Um, if I were to create one myself, I could do it here, add my thoughts on the methodology, how many stars I thought, the discussion, and so be it. Um, and then post this in order to share a peer review. Um, th this is pretty cool. So having the ability to share a peer review in the open is nice. Having star ratings is nice, but this isn't anything new. Um, there are a couple websites that facilitate this kind of interaction. Um, as John mentioned uh, during our earlier panel on peer review and preprints, BioArchive actually has like a couple of tabs for both like traditional open peer review and community peer review. So um, a lot of people are starting to recognize the value that uh, like open access peer review can have for scientific literature. What I think we're doing a little bit different at Research Hub is the ability to place a bounty on a peer review. So kind of the, the use case here is like an author, when they're submitting to a journal, they pay an APC in order to have that journal facilitate the process of peer review and publication. Um, on Research Hub, you can share a preprint. Um, you can put a research coin bounty on your preprint 
for another user to come in and share a peer review. Just as like an example, I can scroll um, like the feed at Research Hub here. I see the top paper is a kind of nice paper that was shared by a bioinformaticist who's recently been contributing to our community, um, actually like prolifically, <laughs> I'm very excited about it. And so say I was excited, uh, you know, about this article and I wanted to have uh, someone else's opinion in order to better understand the content, I could create a bounty. So here's the bounty section. I could say, will someone please share a peer review of this article? Here's, um, say, uh, 10,000 research coin for whoever does this. I can add a bounty, put 10,000 research coin on it, uh, almost $200. So uh, hopefully some nice compensation uh, for someone's time who wants to like in depth read this article and share their opinion. I can place the bounty onto this post and then um, you know, put it in the oven and let it bake for 30 days and see what happens. So we'll have to we'll have to follow up here to see if we get any peer reviews, but kind of like any good cooking show, I have um, the the already finished version if you'd like to check it out. So um, here's a nice paper talking about how psilocybin um, desynchronizes brain networks. Uh, I think this is a preprint as well that was shared on Meta Archive. Um, and so what happened here, this is an interesting topic to a lot of people in our community. Um, I think it was me specifically interesting to me, but hopefully others as well. <laughs> um, so I put a peer review bounty of $150 in research coin at the time um, on this paper for someone to come in and share a peer review. Um, this has been increased to, to 20,000 in total, which is about $350. So kind of a, a, a very nice day's work for someone who wants to read this article and share their critical opinions. And so um, put this on the paper about 29 days ago, and we had some peer reviews. So uh, Dr. Christopher Lewis is a neuroscientist um, in Zurich. And so he saw this bounty for peer review um, and took the time to actually read the article and share like a very like a uh, critical uh, understanding of the paper itself. So this is kind of like a, a great example of like what could happen um, with Research Hub's peer review bounty feature in the future. Um, not just authors uh, basically trying to compete with uh, the APCs of traditional journals, but also um, anyone who's interested in incentivizing an expert to share their opinion on a scientific topic. Um, so this is something that we're very excited about. Um, the other thing that I think is uh, very new and for me, uh, very exciting, we have this concept of like going back to the conversation with Ludo and John, there are a lot of papers published every year. In a perfect world, these would all be preprints, open access, so that way anybody can read and learn from them. It's unrealistic to expect that every single preprint that's published will have a peer review. So there needs to be some kind of mechanism where um, scientists and the general public can indicate which preprints they're most excited about and believe need expert attention to provide like appropriate context for someone who's consuming the article. Um, and so something that we built and um, we're still working on, so, you know, like excuse any construction going on, um, is the idea of automated peer review bounties for preprints based on uh, basically public curation. So um, we've begun automatically pulling every single article that's published on BioArchive and placing it into a specific hub for BioArchive community reviews. And the idea here is that we will um, allow our community to um, aggregate and curate all of the BioArchive preprints in a way where the top X percentile will automatically receive a peer review bounty, kind of like what I just put on this uh, paper using Twitter to predict the United States uh, Senate election in 2020. Um, so the sort of big picture thing that we're hoping to help accomplish here is uh, curating preprints in a way that allows for like the efficient allocation of peer review attention to the most important preprints. 
And then, of course, making sure that the people who decide to spend their time and energy sharing that expert opinion um, also receive like appropriate compensation for doing so. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very excited about this. And um, another feature that we should ship here in the next two weeks is um, the ability to have a weighted upvote. So if we have a bioarchive preprint community review in immunology, Cole is an immunologist. And so his upvote would be worth more than mine, where I only have a master's degree in molecular biology. Um, and through this sort of like uh, weighted voting mechanism attached to some element of like real life reputation, the idea is hopefully we'd be able to like help to pinpoint exactly which articles um, both experts and lay people are most interested in, and then like make sure that we have uh, compensation for people to come in and share their opinions on these, um, you know, popular articles. So yeah, this is kind of the big picture for um, like compensated peer reviews and peer review bounties on Research Hub. Uh, if anybody like has any questions, you know, feel free to jump in. But um, in the meantime, I will continue on with the presentation. Um, the big picture issue that also comes to mind here, and hopefully, um, like you know, compensating peer reviewers will help to solve this problem. But just in the last like two or three years, um, there's been a dearth of peer reviewers. I think that, you know, pretty understandably, people are realizing that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to share like your very, you know, like the heavy investment that you made personally to have an expertise, like seven years in a PhD program. Um, it doesn't really make sense to share that expertise for free for a company that then will essentially monetize it without co compensating you. And so um, this sort of feeling, uh, it used to be almost like a professional responsibility, like people would guilt trip you into peer reviewing to a certain degree. Um, but now that's becoming, I think, less popular and people are more understanding of those who don't want to share their time for free and believe that they you know, should be compensated for sharing their expertise with a for-profit company. Um, and so there are less peer reviewers. It's taking longer uh, to get peer review done on an article. Um, you only need to just open up Twitter almost every single day and there's somebody complaining about how their article has been like awaiting review for four or five months and they're not sure what to do. Um, so like there's a lot of work out there for editors of journals to find these peer reviewers. I was speaking with an editor a couple months ago and they said it takes them like 40 or 50 cold emails in order to actually get someone to agree to do a peer review, which is like kind of grueling work uh, for someone to do for free. So there's kind of a problem that exists when it comes to like one, compensating peer reviewers, and then two, finding and facilitating peer reviewers, like someone who has the expertise to actually share a valued opinion on a piece of uh, like an article or preprint. Um, so at Research Hub, we're thinking, how can we build a tool to sort of help with this process? And um, this is kind of like a like a 2010 social media for good spin on things. But like one of the really powerful tools of the internet is that you can collect a lot of personal data. And you can use that personal data in order to um, target people with traditionally advertisements uh, in order to sell products. We think that a uh, reference manager, um, this is even kind of being done now to a certain degree with Mendeley, where um, user data in Mendeley is then fed into Altmetric, which is a product that um, a for-profit publisher uh, sells for <laughs> a very large subscription. I think it was going to be like $40,000 a year if we wanted to put into Research Hub. Um, so yeah, there's a significant amount of money within uh, users' uh, scientific, like, usage data within reference managers that is actually not being monetized by the people who are creating that valuable data. So what we want to do with Research Hub is build a free reference manager that's very easy to use and then um, allow people to interact with content on Research Hub using that reference manager via annotations. And then finally, use uh, people's reference manager data, um, what papers they're reading, what papers they're annotating, um, what papers they published in the past and use that to target users with earning opportunities. So this could range from a peer review bounty. Um, for instance, like 
Ricardo is an expert in wearables. And so if I publish a paper about how you can use saliva to detect COVID-19, Ricardo um, every day is saving papers about uh, like biomarkers and how to detect them and like easy like tools that can use uh, in order to like come up with this data. And so Ricardo will just be using his reference manager and then all of a sudden he'll get a ping in the top right corner that says, hey, Ricardo, we think you're the perfect person to share a peer review on this, uh, you know, salivary monitoring of COVID-19 paper. Um, there's a $200 bounty. Do you want to do it? And we believe that this sort of mechanism can be scaled to almost any earning opportunity. So the idea is like, maybe there's a grant for someone to develop like a um, device that can be used to monitor, um, you know, concentration of COVID-19 virus in saliva. Maybe that grant would ping Ricardo because he's, you know, one of the people who knows the most about it in the world. So this is sort of like the big picture of what we're thinking. And the reason that I wanted to mention it today is we've actually just started to beta test this tool. So um, if anyone's interested, 100% shill, and we'll share this, but there is a beta sign up form here for anyone who would like to play around with our reference manager. But I'll just uh, jump into it um, so that way you can see how it works. Um, here on the homepage for Research Hub, you click into the reference manager. Um, you have to be given access to this right now. So once you sign up um, on the Google form, you'll uh, have access to this tab. And within this tab, you can uh, go to the organization um, where you wanna keep your references. I have a, a demo right here. So say I have a PDF that like I wanna add to my reference manager, I could put it in here. It will, um, hopefully, the metadata will be extracted and um, you'll be able to uh, organize it into a variety of different folders. You can click into it, um, actually share commentary. So if I want to talk about IL6 on researchhub.com, I can leave a comment here. I love IL6. And I can post this. Oh, that's definitely spam. So that's working well right there. Um, I can share this either just with the people who are in my organization, or I can keep it to myself as an annotation, or I can share it to the whole uh, research hub community. And hopefully somebody will mark this as spam. So the idea is make it very easy for people to either share annotations uh, on a paper within their lab group or within the larger community as a whole at Research Hub. And then um, eventually, if people are interested in it, we'll use their activity to target them with earning opportunities. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the, the big picture that we hope to accomplish. And then um, I wanted to leave everybody here with this quote. It's kind of corny, but I think it's really important. Um, this is from Aaron Schwartz, who's one of the founders of Reddit, who later in his life decided to spend a lot of time trying to increase access to scientific literature. Um, and so he says, uh, you literally ought to be asking yourself all the time, what is the most important thing in the world that I could be working on right now? And if you're not working on that, why aren't you? And, you know, it's very corny, but like um, everyone in DSI acts like this. It's it's a very, very energizing community to be around because kind of like James Heather said, like, this is literally the most dangerous problem in the world. And like we now kind of have the tools to start addressing it. And so, yeah, just very excited to, to be a part of this. And um, yeah, we think like a combination of like user data for good, peer review bounties, preprints, um, open access data um, can help to make things a little bit better. And we can like, you know, take strides towards actually having a better understanding of what's true in the world. So yeah, this is kind of like the, the overall uh, presentation, I guess, if anybody has any like thoughts or questions, happy to answer. So there's a few questions actually, but uh, before that, I just wanted to leave a comment to what he just said, because uh, just just coming out of the of the panel, um, this like stuck in my mind when Adam was saying that we need to treat um, sci scientists more like you know content creators and heroes, and so I think in, in this in this you know idea and this overall idea where now scientists are not just you know um uh, writing papers because they need to get you know citations and they need to get their metrics up to um get to their job they're now content creators 
they are they're cool people want to follow them and now if there's someone that is cool that i want to follow i can use the reference manager i would be more than willing to you know pay to you know to follow that person and so i can do the same if i if i think my my research is cool what i'm doing is cool i'm good at communicating my research auto people will probably follow and I could be kind of like a content creator myself with what I do in a day-to-day basis. Cause I do the research and anyway, you know, I read papers anyway. So if there's a way for me that currently there isn't to, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say monetize that that's part of the equation, but it's more like I am creating a reputation for myself and, uh, you know, research up could be a tool that scientists can use via the reference manager to build that reputation. Because there, right now there's no way to do that apart from the traditional metrics. What you're trying to do at Research Hub is something different. And so hopefully that, you know, that helps. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you go and talk to like a, like a middle school class of 13 year olds, like, you know, do they want to be Marie Curie or do they want to be Jake Paul, right? And like, why is that? And like, hopefully, you know, in 20 years we can, you know, throw some scientists into the ring with famous boxers too and get some social media clicks there. So yeah, I think it's about like, um, you know, as lame as it is, like having rock star scientists would be a huge deal. Like we want to make it like socially like desirable to be a scientist. And I think that's something, you know, that money is unfortunately a part of and like building research hub, we understand that and can help to allocate in a way where like we create incentives for people to want to build shit, you know, that's actually useful for the world. So I think yeah, you said, it, you said it perfectly. Scientists are cool only for like other scientists, which, you know, would like, you know, get what you're doing. It's like, oh yeah, what you're doing is cool. But like for the general public, it's really difficult to like get this idea of like, hey, being a scientist is actually cool. Because as you said, you know, being rewarded is part of the equation. So hopefully we can change that. And that changes along with like the perception of the scientist in the future. Absolutely. Let me get to some of the questions. Um, any chance we'll be able to import any existing reference library specifically from Zotero into the research up tool? Yes, definitely. We'll make it very easy for that to happen. Um, it's uh, pretty easy to just export kind of a list of your references from Mendeley. Um, and then we'll make it very easy for you to bring that into Research Hub. And then I want to say, I don't know this 100%, but I think Zotero actually has an API. So we could um, even like allow people to earn rewards from using Zotero um, and not even like require them to use our tool. So yeah, I think there's a lot of ways we could do that. And, and realistically, like the value that I think is brought by this feature is the targeting of grant opportunities, you know, whether that's like a micro grant for a peer review bounty or something bigger. Um, and yeah, if you want to import like your previous annotations and paper saves from another tool, that's, you know, exactly what we need in order to target you with these opportunities. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, awesome. And then um, another question is about, um, is about content, the, the content that we have right now on research hub so this is probably a research hub user i noticed that on research hub most of the articles peer reviews and discussions are on medical related issues and um and, and topics why not other fields uh what do you think uh what, what do you think is the gap how can we fill it uh like there are dozens of other fields beside the medical sciences it's it's a great point and uh i think this kind of goes back to the last uh panel too where sort of the most success we've had with Research Hub is via hand-to-hand -hand combat. Like, um, like for instance, I met Ricardo two years ago. Um, you know, we had like an editor program and like I got on a phone call with him and hopefully, you know, like got him excited enough to want to contribute. And in my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, Ricardo, but I sort of feel like our bias towards like biomedicine is kind of an artifact of the fact that that's my expertise. And so like, it's very hard for me to impress a physicist, <laughs> but you know, I could talk about cancer. <laughs> so um, I, I sort of think it's a, a, you know, artifact of that. And then like kind of um, another big picture thing is like physics and math, and this might not be what the question asker is referring to, but they're, they've got it figured out a lot better than biomedical research does. So like, you know, as John mentioned, literally everyone in physics and math uses archive and nobody really cares about the paper that comes afterward. It's sort of just like a, you know, a plaque to put on your wall kind of. 
Um, but in biomedicine, that doesn't happen. I think there's a lot of reasons why, like you can monetize findings a lot easier. Um, there's like a little bit more competition, like within actual grad school, like, you know, more people, less professorships. So that's, I, I, I think like, there's more need for it um, from a like top-down perspective in biomedicine. But whoever this question asker is, if you're excited about another field and like you'd like to help like build a community around that within Research Hub, feel free to reach out to me or Ricardo or anybody else from the Research Hub Foundation. And like, we would love that. So we'll try as hard as we can to empower you to, to accomplish that. So yeah, please feel free to reach out. Yeah, another thing that I would add on top of that is that uh, maybe two two other reasons that could be adding on to what he just said. Um, one is that the DSI space. So um, I would I would think, you know, uh, many research job users are aware of the whole, you know, DSI space. And we've seen that in the DSI space, the biotech field has been, you know, flourishing a lot uh, when, you com when compared to others. Also, the, the biotech space has a lot of problems, I would say, systemic problems. So there's also like a lot of, um, you know, rebellion, People want to change things, and so they're more willing to try out other stuff, and so that's why we found we find more of the biomedical um, people, you know, potentially posting on on research up. So I just think when we get to that critical mass, when we get to you know ten x the users, we'll see more and more um, you know hubs being populated, topics being discussed on research up. Because I feel there's other topics that are also been discussed. Definitely, you know, medicine is one of the the biggest forum for discussion. There's also not a lot of AI. There's some legal discussions going on. So uh, several topics for sure. The biomedicine is the, you know, the biggest one for now, but um, I would reevaluate this once we get more people and we expand basically the scope of the discussion uh, as, you know, the many more people come in. Okay. Well, that was, um, that was it. That was the last question that we got from our uh, audience. So if there's anything else, anything else that you want to share with, with our public? I, I think it's just like a, a little bit of like a, you know, a pinch me kind of moment where it seems like we're building something that like a lot of the people that I respect the most in the world appreciate. And so, yeah, I, I think we're onto something and like very grateful for like everybody who's kind of come together today to, to celebrate that to a certain degree, because I think the next couple of years are going to be fun. We're going to be starting to make a dent in the real world. I, I guess, Ricardo, like something that comes up a lot to me um, that Shadi mentioned too, is like the definition of success. Like what, what is that actually, like when do we know that we've actually like done something with Research Hub? I, I always like want to um, keep things contextualized where like, if you guys noticed like Dr. John Inglis this morning, he said like on a good day, BioArchive and MedArchive has 10% of biomedical literature. Like that's no joke. That's it's a lot. huge, huge, huge impact. Yeah. And, and 10% is 10%, you know, there's a lot more left to get. And so like, um, in my estimation, DSI, like theoretically we've done great work. Like, um, James Heathers mentioned, you know, like this seems like a solution, but we're very, 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 very far away from having 10% of all science like participating in DSI. So, so like um what what to you would be like the first sign of like we're getting there, you know, like we're we're actually making a tangible dent in the world. I would say once um that's a great question. Uh I would say because it's it, it's easy to lose the context and think about your own niche. And I think, okay, when, you know, these people within my niche start adopting this, but that's not really the case. In my opinion, it's when the institutions realize the potential of what we're doing. And I'm, I'm not talking about the for-profit players that will probably most be against us, at least, you know, in the beginning, that will probably join forces, but at least like in the beginning and trying to fight us. I'm talking about universities. They are basically working for, you know, the, the students they are trying to provide, you know, good education for the students. And so when they they will realize, when they will be able to onboard university and make them realize the potential of what we're doing, you know, making this better, creating this, uh, you know, creating workshops at a university, educating. So it's a problem of, of education. Um, if I go into my lab and I tell uh, my lab mates, hey, you, sh you should check out this tool, they will probably check it out, tell me what they think. 
and maybe you know if they like it it will stick but it's it i'm not i'm not gonna have the time to like educate them and so this is something that universities should not should do we should have workshops at the universities and when that happens when it gets institutionalized as you as you saw uh you know the the polytechnical um you know team of of, of people um uh, that are discussing science they decided to come to research up because i went there i i did a lecture they they realized the potential they liked it they have a little club and they're onboarding people to research up we need to start more scale a small scale with these clubs and then we get to universities and then when we get the universities on board and then at that point you will see we made a dent because now it's in the educa it's in the education now we're changing minds we're not just like asking people to try out another tool it's about changing the mind of people that are you know working at you know in science working at a university does that make sense yeah totally it makes a lot of sense um yeah in my estimation kind of the thing that i think about is like uh like you can have impacts past um, just what's occurring on your own platform, like going back to the bioarchive 10% thing, like 10% is a lot, you know, but it's 90% left to get, but all of the established players in the industry are now like pivoting to open access publishing. So, so like bioarchive has like, um, you know, along with a number of other players, I think like sparked this um, kind of like economic shift in general towards this like much improved landscape for scientific publishing and so like um you know we're in the very early days of like compensating peer reviewers right but like if you told me that an established journal like an established for-profit journal started to compensate peer reviewers after we've started to do it that would feel like we're starting to make a debt you know like the the impacts of research are are extending beyond research hub and so to me, that's like the the first sign where like, you know, you'll be able to be like, you know, Pat, what you've been working on, it's it's getting somewhere. Like we're doing something here. So yeah, that's even journals, even journals noticing, even journals noticing what we're doing and trying to like, you know, look at, you know, our model and like what it could take from that and then, you know, potentially trying to replicate what we're doing. Uh, but already like noticing and trying to like start to learn about that, it's already a sign that we're probably in the right direction. And then that's probably happening already, like, you know, behind the scenes, maybe we don't know, but maybe they're observing already what we're doing. I guess one other thing that I want to say to you, just while we have a little bit of time is like the importance of open source software. So like this to me is a huge, huge deal where like, um, you know, companies all the times they kind of like establish business models and then like try and optimize that business model. And oftentimes that can um, be at the cost of the user who's actually generating the value. Um, like you see this time and time again of like bigger companies where they, you know, have to start to monetize their user base. And so like to me, um, one of the most important things that you can do is to have like governance guardrails for the company where if they decide to start to monetize their user base in a way that's like not in the interest of the user base, um, the user base can exit and reduce the value of the company. So essentially make it um, not profitable to monetize your user base. And the way you do that is through open source software, because if the user base wants to spin up their own version of the tool that's being used, they can do that with very low barriers. And so that requires sort of the operators of the initial company to do right by their user base um, or else the user base will exit. And there are a lot of really good examples of this like actually happening within crypto. Um, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but like the transition of Steam to Hive, I think some is like a case study of like one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in the world. So um, yeah, just like while I have everyone's attention, like I think open source software is the key to building like a sustainable, productive world. And like, I feel very lucky to be um, working with a bunch of people that recognize that and have helped to make that a reality for Research Hub. So yeah, I think I feel very um, safe in that like, the work that we're putting in now, it will be honored uh, towards the initial mission of Research Hub into perpetuity. So it's something that's very important to me and I'm very glad that we have. Yeah, and I think like you you have now with like a team of, you know, people uh, along with you within this mission that are all, you know, kind of like believing in the same mission, uh, especially like talking to, to Joseph before about open source, kind of like, I feel like 
there's more than one person that uh, firmly believes in this, uh, you know, in this belief of like uh, open source. And I feel like science should try to be more open source in the strict term of like actually getting out, you know, the data more, more than an actual publication. We'll have a talk tomorrow about um, open data with, with Luca. And, uh, and we'll, we'll probably, you know, I hope, you know, the audience will realize how much, uh, how important it is to have the data to be open source so that other people can, you know, process the, the, the same data and come to different conclusions so that we're not biased in our, in our judgments in the way that we make papers. So hopefully, I mean, you're definitely in the right direction with research job. Hopefully uh, science follows uh, through and also takes the same direction where we're going to have, you know, more open source tools, uh, more open source papers where we can do versioning, where we can do uh, a lot more stuff with open data. So what can I say? I just just to plug this, uh, osf.io, um, everyone should go to Open Science Framework. They are working on something like this that's going to be super exciting. So um, yeah, I, I think like there are people who are actively working to solve this problem. And I feel uh, very confident that there's going to be like some big transitions here over the next couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. And while, while we were talking, uh, we got another question. So we're probably people started uh, thinking about what we're talking about. So what do you think? Uh, Research Hub is a competitor um, of journals, which take, you know, thousands of dollars for publishing or subscription-based publications, which are not accessible. Um, wait a second. What do you think Research Hub is? Uh, oh yeah. What do you think Research Hub is? A competitor of journals, uh, which take thousands of dollars for publishing or subscription-based publications, which are not accessible. And on the other hand, uh, RH is promoting DSI. Um, so I'd say probably the essence of the question is what do you think, uh, research hub is a competitor of journals or not? Cause journals, you know, take, uh, uh, thousands of dollars for publishing. Um, and so, and research hub on the other hand is promoting D side, which is kind of like a different, uh, business model. Do you think, you know, research hub is a competitor or, or not can actually, you know, work, uh, alongside journals? Oh, yeah. So that's a great question. Um, so I, I think like, the issue that journals have is not Research Hub or any startup that's going to come disrupt them. It's uh, it's the requirements that funders are putting on, like the science that they fund. So, like just the business model of a subscription won't work if the people who are funding the research say you can't have a subscription on this. And and so I think there's like kind of just like big picture economic changes that are coming to journals. And when you think about journals, like what is the value they actually bring? There's like this famous Time Magazine cover from like the early 2000s that's like, hey, the internet exists. Like we won't need academic journals anymore, <laughs> you know, but like somehow they managed to like just become stronger even though the internet exists. And so like, what is that value prop that they're bringing? And in my mind, it's curation, right? Like you want a nature paper because there's like, a, you know, prestige around it. And like to to be respectful to the organizations that they've built, like there are a lot of really, really smart people who give their time to these big publishers, um, you know, to to share peer review and to like basically use it as like a platform to help elevate their own fields. And so I think that like um, quality, uh, like a signal of quality is what journals do currently. Like that's the value prop that they have that like can't, you know, really be beaten. And um, I spoke with someone yesterday who assured me that like um, a lot of journals understand this and they want to plug in uh, as a measure of quality. So like as a measure of quality, I think they'd, you know, be an incredible partner. Um, I think like the, the biggest thing, like from our perspective is that we think like hiding information, it isn't good for anyone. Like you want everybody to be able to read and learn and participate and again, like the best way to get good ideas is to take lots and lots of ideas and throw away the bad ones. So yeah, I don't, I don't really think they're competitors. I think they're like big organizations that are optimized to make money and there'll be new opportunities to make money in new ways and they'll optimize to them. They'll definitely find a way. I'm sure they'll find a way. Okay, well, um, I guess that... You know, I, I guess that's all. Um, if you don't have anything else to share, we have now the other side. 
uh, the Research Hub Foundation coming up. So uh, let me bring up Tyler because now we've uh, taken a look. I mean, you 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 went through uh, peer review, you went through the reference reference manager. So I feel like it's um, it's it's the right moment to introduce something that we're doing on the research hub side, uh, talking about peer review, but I am not the host, so I cannot bring anyone. Let me reclaim my privilege. Uh, hey, Tyler. Tyler. Hey, man. How's it going? Hey, good. This has been awesome. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're fantastic. Let yeah, me... so I guess like, um, yeah, I was just gonna say this next session will build like really nicely off of what Patch has talked about. Yeah, I think it's a perfect transition. So I just made you a host. Let me know if you have any troubles in sharing okay. screen. So you should see full screen now presentation. Give me a second. Can you see it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Take it away. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So like Ricardo said, we did the whole research hub incorporated side, and now we'll move over to the foundation side. Basically just going to try and give some updates, you know, about what we've been doing, maybe why we're doing it, what's to come and where we could use your help. So let's see. Yeah. So if you don't know me, I'm Tyler Diorio. I'm the community lead. I do a lot of things to interface between the users of actual research hub, the platform, and then the people building the platform and everything in between. So just kind of tagging in, trying to fill the cracks between making sure what you guys want out of the platform is actually being heard by the team. And they're super responsive, so it's been a great job. Aside from that, you know, on the side, or if you're my advisor and you're listening, I mean, full-time, <laughs> I'm a PhD student in my final year, hoping to graduate this fall. And I would do a couple different projects. Like up top, you're seeing a computational modeling work that I do. I have a buddy who grows some neurons on a plate and hits them with a pendulum to try and mimic like a football injury or, you know, you could figure a blast injury if you're in the army. And so I model it and try and tell him all about the forces on the neurons and feeling. And then also what I do is I have a project on Alzheimer's disease where we're trying to look at the motion of the brain over, you know, a given time period and try to quantify what the brain actually looks like in terms of stress and strain and what it's feeling to predict some of the outcomes. So that's who I am. And then to get into the good stuff, what the foundation is doing is we have a couple different initiatives running right now. The big one is our peer review initiative. And so I'll provide like a little bit of context about how this started. And I guess to kick it off, I'll just tell you how peer review traditionally works. So if you're in academia, this is where it's most relevant, but it starts with an author submitting a manuscript, which is like a full description of research all the way through from describing the problem statement, all the way through to how you did it, what you found and why it's relevant. They'll submit this manuscript to a journal and it'll go through a couple rounds of screening, the first of which is just for very basic formatting. And this is just to make sure, you know, you haven't submitted like a totally random document that doesn't actually match the criteria. And then once it passes this very basic check, it moves on to be screened for scope and rigor. So for example, if you're going to talk about archaeology in a biomedical engineering journal, it's like, you know, not a perfect fit. <laughs> so they want to make sure that they're curating, as Pat said, like a proper scope for their journal. And so you could be rejected at this point in the process in which you've paid no money. All you've lost is maybe you know a couple of weeks or, or less, depending on how long it took them to do this initial review. And the amount of times they do this initial scope and rigor review really depends on the journal. But this is like kind of like a first pass peer review where it's not recorded. It's just an internal kind of thing. So if you pass this, then what happens is one of the editors, usually associates, will go through their list of contacts and reach out to, you know, dozens, hundreds, could be an N number of peer reviewers in hopes that they'll find some experts in the field who are willing and able to peer review this. And so like Pat said, this can be, you know, 40 to 50 peer reviewers cold get cold emailed, and you really don't know like who's going to respond, what they're going to say, or if they don't have time, because they're usually professors or postdocs or even higher. So if you get lucky enough and you get some peer reviews completed, what happens is the peer reviewers will pass those back to the journal and then pass them back to the author. Then you, the author, have to add that really tangential topic that reviewer number two suggested, even if it means turning your computational paper into a machine learning paper, you know, you got to make that change. It's not really up to you whether you can choose to accept it or not. There's some debating that can happen, but traditionally, you really have to kind of abide by their suggestions and address them, at least textually. 
And so once you've made these changes and you've kind of addressed all of these big concerns, there's two possible outcomes. Number one is you can actually still be rejected. Your manuscript can be de decided to not meet the rigor uh, for this journal. And this can happen, for example, if you disagree with the peer reviewer, you didn't make the changes sufficiently, or if it's just dragged on for possibly too long. And usually what happens is it'll be accepted for publication. So once you get accepted, this is when you know things get kind of strange, is that you have to pay up to, in some cases, uh, $11,700, which is the sample number for Nature currently. And this is money that comes out of the research bu budget, typically of the PI. And it's after the three to 12 month process of peer review that you just underwent. And I've certainly heard numbers on the higher or higher end of that range. And then the peer reviewers who spent all this time kind of you know, making your science better and contributing to the body of literature don't really get anything out of this. They get zero dollars and they've given six plus hours. Usually it takes longer of you know, several days or weeks at a time where they're putting in these really hard focus hours trying to make sure you know, you've done the science, you've read the prior literature, and you're up to date on what the field has done, and you're also pushing it forward. So it's a big ask for these peer reviewers. Now, you might be thinking, like, is this even a problem? Like, do we have to pay scientists? Are they rich? Like, do they have just, you know, oodles of money coming in where it, it really shouldn't matter? The answer, in my opinion, is no. And in my experience, no. So if you look at the left, this is the amount of scientific funding that comes into research through the NSF and the NIH each year, 2022 numbers. And it comes out to about $40 billion. This is money you can think about entering scientific research. And then if you take the global cumulative scientific publishing revenue, so this includes many funders outside of these scientific funders, but just to give you a sample of the order of magnitude, they bring in about $19 billion per year in revenue. So it's, it's a very non-trivial amount of money that leaves academic research and is a toll tax on scientific funding that gets passed to these publishers, never making it back to peer reviewers when it probably could. So just to like kind of give you the broad view about what does traditional peer review stand for? Well, right now it has minimal accreditation to the peer reviewer. So you don't really get published in most cases, the peer reviews don't get published alongside the manuscript. You don't always know who the peer reviewer was, you know, for better or worse. And you don't get to see kind of behind the scenes about how this manuscript became its final form. So it obviously goes through multiple stages, but that's not usually shown. Secondly, Publication, once it gets submitted to a journal, is sort of the decision is kind of outside of the hands of the author. It's really up to the peer reviewers in the journal to decide when this publication is ready to actually, you know, hit the button, put it online, show to everybody. Also, peer reviewers are volunteer. So there's many reasons why they do peer review currently, and we know it is getting done. But what's happening is um, essentially they're contributing to the scientific record. They've had people do this for them before. Um, I see a couple people raising hands. Ricardo, do you want to let me know if I have to pause for a second? Uh, I don't see any hands. Okay, it could have just been a, an accident. I just wanted to make sure you could still hear my audio. I'll keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see. I can see it. Yeah, I can. I can hear. Sorry. Cool. Yeah. So essentially, they've done it because people have volunteered to give them peer review in the past. Um, so they're kind of being altruistic in the sense of contributing to science. And then also it contributes to if they want to pursue like a tenure track faculty or they want to progress in academia, this is sort of taken into account. So what this leads to is a lot of delays to publication and people think it's either because there's poorly aligned incentives, you know, there's not really a great it like offer for the peer reviewers to come in and do this really high ask, high technical expertise task. And it's also very difficult to find these peer reviewers in the first place. So there are alternatives and people are working on better ways to do this. You know, we're not the first ones to think critically about it. And to give you like a really notable, awesome example that I personally look up to is eLife. They publish their peer reviews alongside the manuscript. And the way in which this looks is essentially when your peer reviews get submitted, they're public. You can know who the peer reviewer is in most cases. And those peer reviewers get passed back to the author who can choose whether or not to accept the peer reviews, which peer reviews to accept, and then also when to publish. So they can go through any amount of iterations on these peer reviews that they think are helpful. So if they don't disagree, they have the choice if they want to go ahead and just push their paper through, they can do that. And what, it get, what happens is those peer reviews get posted alongside the actual article and the manuscript. And you can sort of see how this idea evolved over time and see the suggestions that were made or not made. So this is great because it addresses two of those main facets I talked about earlier, because now you accredit the peer reviewer, you give a glimpse into the process, and you've also given control back to the author. But there's still two big problems. Number one being the incentives and the delays. 
So what we're hoping to do at the foundation in our pilot program is to address these in kind of individual steps. The first of which being the alignment of incentives. So we got two grants from Gitcoin in which we were wanting to actually try and pay peer reviewers to evaluate mainly like, you know, can we get peer reviews solicited and paid for? Will they be of good quality? And will they take too much time, the same time or less time? So that was kind of like our goal to evaluate. We put out a couple articles about it, the Medium article, or sorry, the uh, Mirror article on the right there. It gives a lot of really great detail written by Jeff. But we had a great turnout. So I'll flip through a couple examples here just very quickly so you can see. But the gist of it is that we were offering around $150 in research coin on the platform to complete peer review of a couple different hand-selected preprints that we thought were really interesting. So this first one has to do with some um, cancer stuff. And so we had an awesome user, Alex, come in, complete this review. We awarded the bounty. We also had another one on motor tasks, so involving some MRI expertise. And one of our users, Levy, who's an excellent open source developer as well, contributed, gave you know, a full, thorough work down of it. And we had this across around five peer reviews. So totally new users, such as Umer, came on, contributed to the science in this open public manner, and really showed uh, what can be done to improve these preprints. Same thing with Rabia and also Pedro. Totally new users coming on and really getting a feel for the platform and doing this peer review in public. So to summarize what this looks like too, is they didn't take too long either. So you have to think about, you know, we solicited these peer reviews and the time to review ended up being on average like two weeks, plus or minus, you know, eight and a half days, significantly faster than traditional peer review. This could have been like, you know, stroke of luck because it's a very small sample size. It could also be because we had some incentive. We paid on average around $154 plus minus $29 to each of these peer reviewers. The reason why that varies is A, because the token price changes and B, because other users really appreciate the stuff that's happening. And so they'll go on to independently tip these peer reviewers for their contributions. And what's cool is it wasn't just in one small area. We actually spread these over a couple of different expertise. So it's over, we have neuroscience, immunology, oncology, and molecular biology. And peer reviews and all of these kind of happened in this initial pilot program. So we were really happy with the turnout and kind of surprised, to be honest, at how well it seemed to be accepted and, and completed. So what we want to do next is try and take this uh, like, you know, one step farther and see what peer review looks like if you can do public inline commenting peer review. So Research Hub recently put out this feature of inline commenting. And so what better way to test it than to go through these PDFs, these preprints line by line and say what's good about it, what's bad about it, what lines are really important, understated and all this stuff. And so that's something we want to try and move forward with the next part of the initiative and really try and get more of these inline peer reviews. Also, Pat mentioned the reference manager. We're really curious about how if we link this all together, so we have curation of articles, we have, for example, commenting publicly, you can write these up in posts or in, you know, with the word plugin, and how this, this whole social ecosystem is starting to be built out, and you can have these peer reviews really interchange with all these different aspects of science. So we're really curious about how this all kind of fits into the overall picture of doing peer review in the public. And so we think we can partially address like an early iteration of, you know, incentivizing them and showing that it does cause, at least in a small sample size, uh, less delays to publication, or in our case, completion of peer review. So there's still the issue of, you know, it was very difficult to find these individuals who are experts in the area, would were willing to contribute, and then also, you know, had the time to do it. So that kind of comes down to quantifying reputation in research, which is a very non-trivial task. Reputation could be, you know, like, it, it could span across N different parameters, but the whole gist of it is saying, like, are you qualified to do the task in research that I'm asking you to? And so in this case, it might be peer review this really specific niche document. So there's the traditional way that reputation is like at least quantified in research is through citations, but there's plenty of studies and discussions and individuals who will tell you that citations don't necessarily correlate to reputation or quality. And if they do correlate, sometimes it actually be anti-correlated, meaning it's not representative of good quality, but could actually be representative of bad quality. There's a really nice law. I think it's called Goodhart's law. It says when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And the gist of this is basically saying that when people know how the system is built and it's basically they can game it, they can, you know, figure out what ways to get higher uh, citations because these citations are kind of correlated with funding as well. When you go to uh, apply for a grant to actually do research, the grant committees will look at your publication record. So number of citations, number of publications, and they'll take that into account to determine whether or not you can do this research effectively. But it's kind of a skewed metric, right? Because how can you get publications if you don't have funding to do research? So it's, it's like this really highly intertwined 
system that doesn't necessarily make a ton of sense. And Ricardo did a great job at illustrating this with this kind of web of connections where the researcher at the center there takes his research and he wants to publish it in one of these journals. And so he'll, his incentive to do that is to, in order to increase his research metrics. So his citations, impact factor, maybe it'll help him get awards. These will help him progress his career at institutions. But in order to do all this, he has to get funding. In order to get funding, you have to have these metrics and have these credentials. So you can kind of see the problem statement being presented here is that like maybe we're not using the right research metrics to quantify reputation. And maybe that's also potentially causing some bad downstream effects too. Yeah, and this one does a great job too. It's saying like, you know, they can be gamed. The other problem too is if you're at different uh, tier institutions, it can also affect your grant chances and also your citation chances. So, you know, a really good institution, you might be likely to do a little better than someone who's not at a well-known institution. And whether that's true or not, probably up for debate. Another thing is reproducibility is really not taken into account in any current reputation metrics. And this may be because it's a really difficult thing to quantify, or maybe it's because no one is trying to quantify it. So no one's incentivizing it. So trying to get towards these things, maybe we think we could try and help the system a little bit. And it has been shown like a couple of times, especially in the past year, about some of the downstream effects that can happen when you have these poorly aligned incentive structures, people do things or get, you know, get thrown into things they may not have done otherwise. And so this is one, for example, talking about uh, research that may have been fabricated at a very prominent lab. And it's all too common a story lately. And, um, you know, we think reputation could be part of the reason why this is happening. So what we're thinking about with Research Hub, at least from the foundation side, like, you know, things that are important to us is we'll have many different user types of people who could come onto the platform and contribute to science. One of them, for example, on the left, maybe a, a Research Hub user, maybe they're a domain expert in their spare time. They go in, they're totally up to date on the literature. They know the field, but maybe they don't have any academic credentials. Well, they deserve some reputation because they've demonstrated it and we can prove it on the platform. Whereas there may be a traditional researcher who hasn't done anything on the platform or any kind of online activity, but they have a lot of publication. And so they also need to have their reputation quantified. And then you may have like, you know, the super user who's got the best of everything. So kind of spreading out these tiers of different people that to anticipate, we can get an idea of like what's important and what we need to quantify. But real reputation is super, super complex in research. And this is like my best attempt at just throwing up all the parameters I could think of. So breaking them into groups, for example, is one way we can start to pick out like, you know, for different tasks at research, you really don't need someone to be an expert in everything. But if you know a lot about their individuals, then you can kind of pick and choose them. So for example, if you got a ton of publications, maybe a little bit minimal peer review, you know, maybe you're not the best peer reviewer, but you're a great person to collaborate with or, you know, something along those lines. And then you can get more in depth. If we start tracking these peer reviews in public, we can see how many times you've done a peer review, how good the peer reviews have been, how much you publish in open science, or if you're more involved in like public engagement, we can see, you know, public talks that you've done, if you've been influenced policy, if people on Twitter are digesting your literature, or if, you know, it's misinforming stuff. And then what I think is personally the coolest one is you can quantify your expertise across given sub areas. So if things, um, if you tag, for example, research of, across like, you know, all the seven levels of depth that it can go. So, so for example, like engineering, bioengineering, neurodegeneration, like all the way down the ladder, you can get an idea from someone's public publications and online activity based on what they're an expert in. So for me, this is like an example. Um, I'm very good at image-based modeling. I've done a, like a ton, a ton of MRI work, but I'm not really excellent in neuroscience. Well, I, you know, I kind of am, but this is an exaggerated example. Like I haven't, I don't have a ton of anatomy experience and like all this other stuff. So I may be really good at one aspect of neuroscience, but am I the perfect peer reviewer for like a really hardcore neuroscience uh, publication? Maybe not, but maybe I'm really good at determining whether their methods were correct or if their outcomes match literature, or if they're saying something controversial. So getting like a really good look at this uh, from a granular view, maybe we could start to incentivize people to act in a very transparent way where they're not overstating and you know we can really evaluate them. The cool thing too, is if we have this really in-depth look, then we can start to maybe pull peer reviewers that are really good at specific things. Maybe this is a really imaging heavy paper, pull an imaging person. Maybe it's hardcore signal processing, pull a signal processing person. And so if you start to take this more granular view, and then you're also paying them, you know, maybe we think this could contribute. So what kind of progress have we made on this? We spent a lot of time over the summer and the spring just expanding on a really in-depth plan of action. And so this includes like steps to bring a researcher onto the platform, import all of their previous publication history, 
grab their papers, understand the context of where they've been to conferences, where they're at university, and then start to do things on top of that, like calculate their citation metrics, see what fields they're in, and you know, start to blow out all these individual little parameters. And we have been really lucky to have an awesome open source developer working on it. So far, it's been Levy, who's one of our main contributors, who's been blowing out these, um, these functions. And we've also have another open source developer, Matt, who's going to be coming on board and trying to work with us as well. And what's cool is we cover right now Web2 and academic research. So we're really good at like this initial implementation, at least, you know, building the functions to see how it'll work in this sort of pilot test environment. But we do need a lot of things from the community as well. The number one is like feedback, what you guys think is important in research. We have a survey that's pinned on the front page of Research Hub. It's been up there for a while, but it lists all the reputation metrics in research. And we want you guys to like go on and rank them if you can and tell us what you think is important. We also could use contributors, like people on the platform actually going through, you know, talking about peer reviews, talking about publications and telling us like, you know, how it's working. And then we could use eventually, we want to do things a little more on chain, a little more Web3. So eventually we'll need some Web3 development help too. So if you're a Web3 developer, you know, make sure you reach out to us over Discord. And personally, one of the opinions I think we're missing is opinions outside of academia. So a lot of us are academics, but we may not represent, you know, private researchers or industry researchers who might have like a really different way of looking at things that we haven't accounted for. So if these match like your criteria, reach out to us. We would love to chat and understand like what's important to you guys. So this is like my closing slide. I think I have like some QR codes after this, but just wanted to recognize the team. You're probably familiar with most of them. Founders being Brian and Patrick, lead developers, Kobe and Pat Liu. And then on the foundation side, we've grown quite a bit since the last time we've talked in public, but we have Ricardo leading operations, Jeff in business, myself in community and open source dev, Ivan doing growth and marketing, Edwin legal and governance, Johnny doing a ton of work in science communication, and Ted in video production, keeping us looking really uh, professional. So aside from like the formal Research Hub Foundation team, we also have 12 editors on the platform who are going through and making content day to day, soliciting peer reviews, and just keeping the platform kind of alive and buzzing. And a lot of contributors as well who are on the science communication team who are all been, you know, contributing to the tweets you're seeing and like the increased social activity, trying to get the word out there about the stuff we're doing and how we're trying to help science. So with that, I'll kind of close it on this slide. This is how you can reach out to us and how you can get in contact. One thing we're specifically looking for is people who are interested in doing peer reviews. So if you have domain expertise and you're interested in hearing more targeted opportunities, you can scan this QR code, document your info, and we'll reach out to you if we have any opportunities that align really well with your expertise. Um, you can always do a peer review without filling out this form, but this just lets us um, kind of tell you which ones are specifically really relevant for you. So I think we probably have some time left. That's all I have. So happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. That was great, Tyler. And um, yeah, now looking at all the faces, uh, you know, on the team, you kind of like realize how much we've grown since since last year. It's amazing. It's actually amazing totally. because this all happened organically. We had all these people joining and they just they were just like passionate about, you know, our mission and trying to accelerate science with us. Uh, so yeah, it's just like really amazing to see it. Um, I don't yeah, have any- about DSI. Yeah, it's just something about these side that keeps people really engaged. I think it, it's the feeling that you're solving like a real problem in a really important area. And there's like, you know, there's very obvious problems in your face and people trying to solve them. So I think it's good overlap. Yeah, yeah. M most of it, it's probably like a lot of uh, disillusioned scientists that went, <laughs> uh, you know, the same, the same kind of like, you know, challenges that we that we face day to day and wanted to uh, kind of like give a helping hand and uh, and help know what we're doing so for sure yeah. so there's no questions in the q a i guess uh you were too clear and so <laughs> don't have any questions uh but apart from that um i would say um please join like if you're interested in um you know peer reviewing or just like joining the community as that is said um we are pretty friendly i would say so just like join our discord um join directly on research hub if there's someone new will definitely that is doing something we'll definitely notice and probably reach out to you. And um, if you're passionate about peer reviews and you're doing peer reviews already, we would really love to talk to you. Even if there's no peer review, like if there's even if the, uh, even if there's not like preprints available, we'll find one for you if that matches your expertise and, and put up a bounty so that you can um you can fulfill it. That I would say um closes um closes the day. 
I think. Uh, so I really wanted to, uh, we really want to, to, to close the day with a few updates from, from us. Uh, so you saw what are the, some of the updates from the research hub team. You saw some of the work that we're doing at the research hub foundation. Hope that sparked a little bit of uh, interest in, in you. Um, and, um, and so tomorrow we'll have another day of uh, talks and panels will actually be even more talks than today. So I hope you didn't get bored because tomorrow is going to be even more. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen because I was not able to do that before. Oh yeah, I need to get the host privilege back. Okay. No, yeah, that's what I thought. Oh no, tells me to, to quit and reopen. So that, I should probably update that. Okay, so I think I'll do the same as I did before. This doesn't, this doesn't work. Let's see if I can share. Oh yeah, I can, amazing. Okay, so this was the agenda for today and um, this is gonna be the agenda for uh, tomorrow. So tomorrow we will start 9 a.m. PST, I will open as I did today. Um, today, we're going to have um, a panel as the first thing in the day. We're going to have a panel about BioDAOs. You probably heard um, during the investing in DSI panel how, um, you know, the, the concept of DAOs and, you know, the end to end pipeline, you know, DAOs getting funded to actually, you know, solve problems in, in medicine. We're, we're going to, we're going to be focusing on BioDAOs tomorrow. So we'll see some examples of like what, what have people done already? in the space that could, you know, potentially motivate other people to join um, in the future. Then after that, we'll have uh, Nicholas from LabDAO, who will show us um, a bit about uh, Plex, their tool that they that they developed. So I'm quite, um, I'm quite curious to see how that works. And you'll see that too. Uh, after that, there's going to be Omar, uh, who will talk about uh, distributed storage and um, give an overview of the work that they're doing at WeaveChain. And after that, we'll have Nassim from um, AI Labs talking about on-chain peer review. We talked about peer review quite a lot today. I feel like it's a hot topic in general, in science, in DSI, and so on. And so we'll see um, the solution that Nassim came up with uh, to try to put peer review on-chain. After that, we have our second um, panel for the day and last for the event. It's going to be AI and research. So... Everyone's talking about AI now. What can AI do for researchers? How can we use AI tools to make our life better, easier, and so on? So, uh, our guests will, you know, shed some insights, shed some light into, like, you know, the tips and tricks, um, what you can do, some insight into um, using AI in research. After that, we'll have three more talks. Uh, we'll have Luca from Sage Bio Networks uh, talking about open data. I, I stress today the importance of open data, uh, not only, you know, making the the articles open and uh, openly accessible, but also the data so that other people can draw conclusions from the same uh, data sets. Then we'll have Jessica Polka from Aza Bio talking about preprints and quality assessment. Again, this is a topic that came up today a lot. So we're going to have a lot another talk tomorrow. So hopefully, you know, if some of your questions didn't get answered today, we'll get answered tomorrow. And uh, we will close the day with Eric from DSI Labs talking about on-chain publishing and credentials and, you know, showing us a bit of what are doing at DSI Labs, what are doing with nodes and so on. I will close the day and, um, and again, you know, take any questions that you might have um, at the end of the event. And then I will see you um, again next week, September 29, for our five side chat with Ryan, but we'll talk about this more tomorrow. So with that said, I would like to thank you all for coming to um, coming to, to SciCon today. It's been really a pleasure to host this first day of event. And I hope you come uh, with even more questions tomorrow. And, uh, you know, hopefully you learn something new and you learn something, um, some more things tomorrow at our second day. Thank you all. And you have a uh, great rest of the day or, you know, good night, depending on your time zone.
see you all tomorrow.